What has gone before? Tristan Kendrick, Prince of Corwell, stood upon the brink of manhood when the beast Kasgaroth emerged from its fetid pool to savage the land. The insidious monster, often disguised in the flesh of a man, engaged the help of Firbolg giants and savage Northmen to attack the folk of Corwell. The prince came of age during this, the Dark Walker War. He returned a lost artifact, the sword of Simra Q, to his people. He led them to ultimate victory against the beast. And he found his life's love in the person of Robin, a maiden who had been raised with him as the king's ward. Also during the war, Robin discovered her own deep powers as a druid, harnessing the forces of the earth to work magic and miracles. She loved the prince, but faced a deeper calling after the war. She journeyed to pastoral Mirlock Vale to study the ways of her order under the great druid of the Isles, Jenna Moonsinger. But there she found that the influence of Kasgaroth was not altogether banished. An unnatural army of corpses invaded the Vale, and Robin alone of the druids escaped. The others were imprisoned as stone statues around the scene of their last stand, and as Robin departed, the veil was turned into a wasteland behind her. His father murdered, Tristan journeyed to the neighboring island of Caladir to confront the high king of all the folk. Caught in a rebellion and finally joined by Robin, Tristan found himself once more victorious, receiving the royal crown of the Isles. He was crowned High King by the Fafolk, then prepared to return to Corwell. But still, the evil lurked in Mirlock Vale. Prelude The goddess Earth Mother wept, her wound a gaping slash across her flesh. The cut was deep, perhaps mortal, but there were none to know her suffering. She cried out in pain from the scar of black magic, where her body lay torn and ripped from the assault of evil. Though the last convulsion of her power had excised the rot, tearing it from herself and allowing the cool sea to wash the wound, still the pain continued. The goddess cried out for her servants, her devouted druids. These human caretakers were trapped in a prison of the mother's own invention. They stood frozen as stone statues around the blasted scene of their final defeat. The protection of the goddess had imprisoned them thus, saving them at least from death. One druid and one alone had escaped petrification. And the goddess wept for the Fafolk, her people. War ravaged their fair land relentlessly, striking each of the four kingdoms with cruel force. Many Fafolk died while resisting the attack of Northman or foul beast, but still peace eluded them. Now her grief manifested itself in the glowering clouds that hung low over the isles and the unnatural chill that sucked the summer's warmth from the land, and though the season was but early autumn, brought a winter-like frost. Her pain sent whirlwinds exploding from her soul, twisting funnels of violence that tore at the land unmindful of the hurt they caused. Yet the land was not altogether without hope. For the first time in many decades— the king of the Fafolk was a true hero, as was right and proper. And though one lone druid remained free, she was a druid of great faith and steadily growing might. But they were both very young, and the goddess was very old. She doubted that she could live long enough to see them prevail, or fail. Chapter 1 The Obscene 
heavy breakers assaulted the stone barrier protecting Llewellyn Harbor. They crashed against the rocky rampart, sending clouds of spray through the air, roaring in frustration as the eternal power of the sea dispersed against the fundamental strength of stone. A lone figure stood near the end of the breakwater. The man was heavily wrapped in oilskins and ignored the salty shower that doused him each time a fresh wave expended itself. If anything, he relished the bracing cold of the water. The man was young, but he was a king of many lands. He had bested creatures foul and wizards of might, yet he felt unsure of his own strength. He held the love of a strong woman in his heart, but still his future remained a muddled blur before him. Tristan Kendrick claimed as ancestors a long line of kings, but for two centuries the Kendricks ruled only the small, sparsely populated land of Corwell. Now, as High King of the Fafolk, King Kendrick accepted fealty also from Moray, Snowdown, and mighty Caladir. The king had recently won a war, the Darkwalker War, besting a supernatural beast and its human allies. He had claimed as allies the graceful warriors of the Luir and the doughty fighters of the Dwarven realms. His blade, the Sword of Simrakiu, girded him as ample proof of his heroism, for he had returned the weapon to the Fafolk after many decades of absence. Finally, the man turned from the sea, walking slowly along the rocky barrier toward the welcoming lights of Llewellyn Town. The sea had given him no answers. Nothing, it seemed, could give him the answers. And there were so many questions. The eagle soared slowly. Its eyes, dulled by fatigue, searched the barren landscape below, seeking any morsel of life-saving food. But the bird saw nothing. No trace of animal, small or large, appeared across the stretches of brown marsh. Even the trees of the once vast forests now resembled gaunt skeletons, barren of leaves and needles surrounded by heaps of rotting compost. The great bird swirled, confused. It sought a glimpse of the sea, or even the high coastal moor. But everywhere the view yielded scenes of rot and corruption. With a sharp squawk of despair, the eagle soared off in a new direction. A sudden movement caught the eagle's keen eye, and it swept into a diving circle to investigate. But it pulled up short, screeching its frustration at the shambling figure on the ground. Though the creature smelled of carrion, it moved. Though it moved, it was not alive. Growing desperate now, the eagle soared away in search of something, anything to eat. It came upon a region of utter desolation, a place that made the past reaches of barren land seem fertile. The predator flew north over a stagnant brown stream. It crossed a reach of dead, fallen timber. Finally, it came to a small pond. The water was surrounded by twenty stone statues, remarkably lifelike human figures in various poses of battle. The surface of the pond itself was an impenetrable black. But what was that? The eagle saw, or imagined, motion below that flat, lightless surface. It could have been a trout swimming complacently in the center of the pond. It could have been anything. The bird tucked its wings and plummeted toward the shadow. The water rushed up to meet it, and the true nature of the dark shape became visible. The eagle shrieked and struck outward with its wings, slowing but not halting its descent. One claw, still extended to clutch the imagined prey, touched the surface of the black water. A crackling hiss broke the silence, and for a moment 
the eagle froze, outlined in blue light. In another instant, the bird was gone, though no ripple disturbed the surface of the dark pond. A lone white feather caught by an errant breath of wind drifted upward and fluttered forlornly to settle upon the muddy shore of the dark well. Bahal, god of murder, relished the eagle's death. Though he still dwelt in his fiery beer upon the distant and hostile plain of Gehenna, the minor snuffing of life in a place unimaginably remote was power transmitted directly to his foul essence. Such was the power of the Dark Well, and such was the power of Bahal. The patron god of any who would slay another of his kind, Bahal found plentiful worshippers among the humans and other creatures of the many worlds. Foremost among them were the people of the Forgotten Realms. It was in the realms that the eagle flew and died, and it was in the realms that Bahal's most powerful minions had been fought and bested by these humans who called themselves the Fafok. Now Bahal focused his entire baneful nature on the land claimed by these humans. Now one servant, a cleric of great power and even greater evil, still remained to do his bidding. Slowly Bahal's vengeance took form. The humans who obsessed him would die, but only after everything they loved had died before them. He himself would see to that. No longer would he trust his revenge to the talents of his minions. To this end, Bahal fostered the dark well. A deep laugh rumbled in his cavernous breast as he pondered the history of the pool. Only a month before, it had been a crystalline symbol of hope and purity. A moon well, sacred shrine of the goddess Earth Mother. Her body was the earth itself, but her spirit resided primarily in pools such as this. Clear, unspoiled water, blessed with the benign enchantment of the goddess Earth Mother. This had been her most sacred well. But now the might of Behal, coupled with the deadly skills of his servant, the cleric Hobarth, had desecrated and polluted the water so that it no longer resembled its former state. Indeed, now it was a festering sore upon the land, spreading decay like a cancer through the rocks and clay and sand of the earth. The former soul of the goddess now gave Bahal a window into the world of man, and he liked what he saw. Slowly, the god of murder moved toward the dark well. He knew exactly what to do. The stag stumbled weakly against a rotten trunk. Its bedraggled flanks heaved with the effort of breathing. Its sweeping antlers swayed toward the ground, and the creature's dry, swollen tongue fell limply from its jaws. Unsteadily, the huge deer lumbered away from the dead tree, past many more, through the dead forest. Blinking in confusion and despair, the animal sought some sign of the Mirlock Vale it had known all its life. The broad valley of sun... The brilliant leaves of autumn, vast meadows of flowers swaying easily in the fresh breeze. All these things were gone. The stag's ribs showed clearly through its torn pelt, for it had not eaten in many days. Yet this was not the greatest of the animal's needs. The stag had to find water. It sensed that it could live no more than a few hours without it. The swollen tongue flopped loosely, and the wide eyes were obscured by an unnatural glaze. A feeble breath of wind stirred the dead wood, and with it came the smell of water. Not clean water, to be sure. The scent was well mixed with those of rot and decay. But it was the scent of water nonetheless. With renewed vigor, the stag trotted toward the promising sign. 
Soon, the great deer came upon a black pond. The stag ignored the unnatural stillness of the water. It paid scant notice to the twenty stone statues arrayed around the perimeter of the pool, except to ascertain that the human-like figures were indeed stone and not flesh. Even had they been living huntsmen, however, it is doubtful the deer could have turned from that compelling pond. Behal watched the stag approach, willing it closer and closer. The god remembered his flash of pleasure upon the death of the eagle, and Behal relished the thought of the much larger body that approached. The swollen tongue reached for the black surface. At the last moment, the stag sensed the wrongness of the water. It tried to pull back, to raise its broad antlers away from this awful thing, but it was too late. The neck bent, pulled by a force far greater than the stag's own muscles, and its muzzle struck the surface of the dark well. A crackling blaze of blue light illuminated the stag's body. Casting an intense glow across the pond for an instant, then the deer was gone. As with the eagle, its body had caused no ripple to mar the inky surface of the well. Only the skull remained, resting on the muddy bottom in several inches of water. Its empty eye sockets stared skyward, while overhead. Spread the massive rack of antlers like a ghastly tombstone. Robin of Gwynedd lay in the hold of the lunging ship, and prayed for a word from her goddess. The wooden timbers around her seemed to thrum softly with the power of her prayer, but that was all she sensed. She felt lonely and afraid, fearing for the Earth Mother more than for herself. In the darkness of the hold, she felt the touch of her spiritual mother, but it was faint and frail. She sensed a growing void between herself and her goddess, but she was at a loss to close it. Mother, hold me, help me, she whispered. But the unfeeling planks of the hull gave no comfort, and there was no reply. The source of her faith and her power was on the verge of extinction, and the druid could do little to help. Strangely, even as the presence of the Earth Mother faded, Robin felt her own Earth magic growing in potency. Within the confinement of the long sea voyage, her body grew stronger daily. Her muscles were hard and wiry. Her mind was sharp and alert. To the point that she could hardly sleep, and she could feel the power growing within her. But when she prayed, or on those rare nights when she slept deeply enough to dream, there was no word, barely the faintest image, to suggest that the mother was near. Robin knew of no other druid still walking free upon any of the moonshays. The most powerful of her order all stood frozen, locked in stone at the moment they had lost their most crucial battle. Only Robin had escaped, and she felt pitifully inadequate for the tasks arrayed before her. But she had no choice except to try. The fat cleric wiped a hand through his greasy hair, anxious now to reach his destination. For several days, he had explored the surrounding lands of Mirlock Vale, but his journey was nearly complete. The entirety of Mirlock Vale was now known to him. The vast valley in the center of the island of Gwynedd had long been a bastion of the goddess who had watched over these isles. Now, however, it had become a land of death. A monumental wasteland in testament to the awesome power of the cleric's god, and he had ventured to northern Gwynedd, beyond the Vale, and into the lands of the Northmen along the Fir Coast. These invaders had claimed the land 
from the native folk, establishing a number of villages and even one good-sized town, but had nothing resembling a separate state there. Bahal had wondered about these humans, and so the cleric had investigated. The southern land of Gwyneth, occupying nearly half the isle, was the kingdom of Corwell, of the people known as the Fafolk. This land the cleric had not visited, but that mattered little, for Corwell was already well known to the minions of Bahal. Now Hobarth, cleric of Bahal, returned to the dark well with good news for his foul master. Decay spread rapidly across the vale. Everywhere he went, Hobarth found death and rot, as whole forests died and placid lakes shriveled into festering swamps. The area around the well was particularly barren. The corpses of the many zombies he had raised from death were gone now, as Hobarth had ordered them into the well. Their presence, in fact, had been a prime source of the pollution that had so effectively corrupted the moon well. And the decay seemed to be spreading rapidly. Bahal, Hobarth knew, would be pleased. As he neared the dark well, he sensed a difference around him. It was not a difference in the land or even the air, but a subtle presence on a deeper level. Something was here that had not been here when he left. He saw the well before him, its slick black surface barely reflecting the white outlines of the statues. The dark well had, since its creation a month before, been a center of power for his god. But now, Hobarth sensed something mightier, more dynamic than the gate connecting his god's world to his own. In a flash of understanding, he understood, and as he understood, he dropped to his knees. Bahal was here. Hobarth shivered, a strange mixture of ecstasy and fear. He knelt, closed his eyes, and prayed with all his heart. O oh, mighty Bahal, reveler in blood, master of my destiny. The cleric moaned his prayer softly, wondering at the presence of his god. Was Bahal angry? Was he pleased? What was the purpose of this visitation? Approach the well. Hobarth froze for a moment as the god's command grasped his heart. He felt cold fingers engulf his soul, only to let it free again after a glimpse of something awesome and terrible. Numb, he stood and stepped slowly toward the dark well. The great druid. Hobarth understood the command instantly and stopped beside the great druid, or rather the statue that had been Jenna Moonsinger the mistress of Mirlock Vale and great druid of the Isles. Now she stood, frozen as a white stone sculpture, lifelike in every detail. Many times had Hobarth stood before her and cursed her defiant expression. He saw the challenge still lurking in her eyes and in the firm set of her jaw. Her wrinkled skin and tightly wrapped hair might have given her a grandmotherly look, but instead she looked more like a warrior. The heart. This command brought a glimmer of defiance, for just a brief moment to the cleric. Hobarth kept the heart of Kasgaroth in a pouch at his side, and he was most reluctant to remove it for anyone or anything. The stone was black shaped more like a lump of coal than a heart, but it was a talisman of great evil. In the cleric's hands, the heart of Kasgaroth had brought death and decay to the formerly pastoral vale. But Hobarth overcame his reluctance instantly and hastened to obey the word of his god. He removed the stone from its pouch and held it out before him. 
it seemed to absorb the rays of the sun, already dimmed by the pale haze. In its own shadow, the cleric reached forward to touch the heart against the cold stone of the statue. Bahal must be very near, Hobarth thought, for it seemed to the cleric that the god leered over his shoulder. Hobarth acted as if by instinct, performing a ritual he had never seen, yet one that he knew without question or doubt. He sensed that Bahal was pleased, and his god's pleasure was a thrill unlike any the cleric had ever known. The black surface of the heart touched the white stone of Jenna's breast. Yellow smoke hissed at contact, and trickles of clear liquid ran down the statue's stony robe. Where the stone was wet, it became a bright red, like freshly spilled blood. Hobart stared into the statue's eyes, and he saw the defiance that had been etched there begin to fade. He pressed his hand against her, and was gratified to feel the heart of Kasgaroth sink into the stone. More smoke spewed, nearly blinding him, but he kept his gaze fastened upon the statue's eyes. His own eyes watered. The statue grew soft and Hobart's hand, together with the black stone, passed directly into the cold body. Quickly he drew forth his hand empty, and the surface of the statue closed behind it. He looked again into those stone eyes. Only it was no longer a statue, and the eyes burned with a far-from-stone-like fire. The low green mass of Corwell loomed to starboard. To port, invisible in the gray haze of sea miles, lay the island of Moray. And below the keel of the sleek longship rolled the gray swells of the Strait of the Leviathan. But Grunark the Red knew that the Leviathan was dead. Had not the Red King played a role in its demise only a short year earlier— he found the memory vaguely disquieting. Now the ruler of the Northmen stood boldly on the deck of his ship, the Northwind, and stared into the distance. Not north, toward Norland and home, but east toward Corwell. Why did that land hold such fascination for him? The Red King himself did not know, though certainly the roots of the answer lay in the disastrous invasion and his army's subsequent defeat. Grunark had been fortunate to escape with half of his ships and men, while many of his allies had suffered worse. The men of Oman's Isle, of the Kingdom of Iron Hand, had been virtually annihilated. Now the North Wind accompanied by the slightly smaller longship Redfin, sailed past that land after a long summer of raiding shores far from the moonshays. In less than a ten-day they would be home, but even the prospective homecoming could not lighten the Red King's brooding sense of foreboding. True, the raiding had been highly successful. They had sailed south along the Sword Coast, plundering the towns of Am, and even northern Kalimshan. The north wind rode low in the water from the weight of silver stowed along her keel, together with golden chalices, mirrors, fine tapestries, and silks, and all manner of things treasured in the moonshays. And there was the scroll. Grunark wondered why that lone treasure, scribed in a symbology he could not read, should figure so prominently in his thoughts above the trove. The Lord Mayor of Lodi stood before him, outlined by the blazing framework of his blockhouse. The man met his gaze without fear, but Grunark could see defeat in his eyes. The Red King, his bloody axe in his hands, watched the Mayor with interest. "'I offer you our greatest treasure,' In return, I ask only that you spare the children. Grunark took the ivory tube, surprised at its lightness, 
He had expected the container to hold platinum or at least gold in quantity. Curious, he pulled the cap off and saw that it held but four small sheets of parchment. Treasure, he said menacingly. This is worthless. But the mayor did not flinch. You are wrong. You have probably never held such worth in your hands. Grunark paused. The man's plea meant little. Northmen did not slay children, so the town's youth had never been in danger. Truly the Red King had no use for a scroll. Yet as he held it, he began to sense that it was indeed an object of rare worth. A strange feeling came over him as he examined the exterior of the scroll case. He saw a picture of a beautiful young woman, sensual and rounded, and yet his reaction was a wish to protect her. Other pictures, a vast field of grain, a smooth lake and a cozy fire in a hearth of stone, all beckoned him with sensations of warmth and comfort. Disquieted, he took the scrolls gruffly. He turned on his heel and ordered his surprised crews back to their vessels, leaving Lodi almost unscathed. They took no other plunder, but instead put straight to sea under the harsh urging of the Red King. And so came the scrolls with him to the moonshays. This season of plunder had dragged on for Grunark, for he lacked the fiery battle lust that had once made him relish the strike of steel against steel, the striving of man against man. Now, battle was merely another tiresome task that faced him all too often. After the raid on Lodi, the Red King had lost heart for battle altogether. Rationalizing that the season was late, he had ordered the two ships homeward, ignoring the surprised reactions of his crew. After two ten days upon the trackless sea, they had returned once again to the moonshays. Now they slipped between two kingdoms of the Fafolk, headed toward his own lands to the north. And still that feeling of foreboding remained with him, perched upon his broad shoulders like some unnatural apparition. A great brown bear shuffled across the dead land pausing to turn over a log with his broad forepaw or to snuffle under a stump with his nose. Once again, the spore of even a tiny maggot or grub eluded him. Grunt huffed in frustration, too weak to take even a half-hearted swing at the offending stump. There was no food here. Grunt stumbled on, sensing that to stop was to die. Long gashes covered his shaggy flanks, now crusted with dried blood. One of the cuts lay freshly opened, a victim of some scrape against a looming trunk. Even in the depths of his fatigue, Grunt moved with pride and purpose. His head held high, his posture was a challenge to any lesser creature that might cross his path. But his footsteps were unsteady, and the great brown eyes grew dull. There were no creatures to cross his path and behold his prideful agony. This was land Grunt had known all of his life, yet he did not know it now. The grove of his mistress, Jenna Moonsinger, the great druid of the isle, now festered and decayed. Many were the animals that had lived here, amid a lush blanket of greenery, now there was no creature. Now there was nothing green. Grunt growled, the sound rumbling low in his chest. He blinked, peering around as if trying to clear the nightmare vision from his eyes. Then he lumbered on, resolutely plodding across the wasteland in search of food or water. Suddenly, the bear lifted his great head and froze. His only motion was the twitching of his broad nostrils as they searched the air. 
Whatever it was, a scent excited the bear like nothing else in many days. Grunt started forward faster now, breaking into a clumsy trot. He uttered one cough-like grunt, then another. Before him lay the former heart of the grove. Recently, the bear had somehow sensed that this was the center of its corruption and had thus avoided it. But even the suspicion of the exciting spore in the wind was enough to compel him there. Jenna? Hope swelled within the bear's breast. Was that not his mistress, standing there in the distance, staring at him? He sniffed at the air, lumbering closer. The scent was that of the great druid, he thought, but somehow different. Blinking in confusion, Grunt struggled to focus his dim eyesight. He saw the short, rounded body, recognized the gray hair pulled tightly back from the face. He saw no smile upon that face, and the human's posture seemed stiff and unnatural. Yet his eyes could not be wrong. He slowed as he reached the woman and grunted happily, leaning into her expectantly. The bear was surprised when she did not scratch his ears. What was wrong? Grunt looked at the round, wrinkled face curiously. And in an instant, he recoiled in fear. Cringing low, the bear looked up at her like a whipped puppy, puzzled and pained by the look in her eyes. She raised her arm, pointing, and Grunt obeyed. His huge body moved toward the black water, where once the crystalline moon well had reflected the blessing of the goddess. Quivering, he approached the water. The bear turned once to look back at his mistress, his eyes pleading. She pointed again, and he dropped his head obediently. His muzzle touched the surface of the dark well, and then his life was gone as he gave it unwittingly to Bahal. Chaunty, as a goddess, was close in spirit to the Earth Mother, though far removed in aspect. While the Great Mother's life lay in the Earth itself, in the hollowed ground of the Moonshays, Chaunty's being dwelled upon the joyous plain of Elysium, far removed from the world of mortals. The Earth Mother's followers were the Fafolk of the Moonshe Isles, led by their druids. Shanti's believers came from across the plains, and even in the Forgotten Realms were spread among the many nations of the world. The tenets of the Earth Mother's faith held that nature was sacred, and maintaining the balance of all things became the druidical creed. Followers of Chaunty held that the land should be farmed, that the growth provided by nature should be harnessed for the greater good of man. Yet, despite their differences, the goddesses both were beings of health and growth, cherishing the plants and animals, working to protect the humans who held to their faith. Now Chaunty sensed the power of the Earth Mother waning, she also felt the looming presence of Bahal. As that dark god moved into the power vacuum being created, Chanti also began to move. Though she lacked Bahal's awesome might and implacable evil, she was a being of great resource in her own right. Now those resources would be tested. Chapter 2 Long Live the King For the first time, the wind seemed to be against them. It blustered from this direction and that in capricious gusts. To all sides stretched the sea, a gray mass of rolling swells broken only by the foaming crests of the waves. The sky matched the water, a gray blanket of cold, pressing heavily from horizon to horizon. Overhead, the sail filled with air, spurring the ship across white caps and through deep troughs. 
Then the wind shifted, and the sail fell limp. The vessel slid crazily to the side, dropping between two rolling swells. A line drew taut as the boom swung across the stern. Two sailors dropped prone, while others hauled on a heavy rope until the sail once again billowed. The bow of the boat swung to port, angling across the waves on a slightly altered course. Tristan Kendrick, heir to the throne of Corwell, stood in the bow of the Defiant and relished the cool spray against his face. It ran through his beard and soaked his heavy wool cloak. His feet were planted in a wide stance, and he swayed evenly with the rolling deck beneath his feet. The ship lunged eagerly through the next swell and the one after that. Each wave brought him and his companions closer to Corwell Firth and the castle on the little knoll, Care Corwell. Home. Just a few short ten days ago, Tristan reflected. His first ocean voyage had carried him across the same water. Then he had embarked on a mission of politics to seek his coronation from the High King. Now he carried the crown of that same king, the crown of the Isles, and he returned in triumph to his home. He knew he should be feeling joy and anticipation, but he could not. He felt, rather than saw, a warm presence beside him and turned to see Robin. Though she had slept little and eaten less during the past ten days, she had never looked so vibrant and alive. Her black hair, long and falling loosely around her shoulders and back, glowed with an ebony sheen, and her green eyes flashed with vitality. Her beauty increased every day, or so thought the king. The druid joined him in the bow, but avoided his eyes. He wanted to reach out, to put his arm around her, but he feared her rebuff. We'll be there soon. No more than two days, three at the most. He tried to offer encouragement, sensing her despair. But what will we find when we get there? What if we're too late? We won't be, and whatever we find, we can best it. Together, with my sword and your faith, we can rid Gwyneth of any shade of evil. I hope so. Robin leaned against him, and he held her, sensing the deep and spiritual fear that haunted her. He felt a vague sense of guilt for the time they had remained on the island of Caladir. He had known that she wanted to leave immediately following the defeat of the High King. Robin feared deeply for the fate of her fellow druids, imprisoned as stone statues around the scene of their final battle. Yet he could not have left then, and she had chosen to remain with him rather than embark for home alone or with Lord Ponswain, who had taken the first available ship back to Corwell. I'm glad you stayed with me, he said. I can't imagine facing the kingship without you beside me. He thought of the many problems he had solved during his ten day in Caladir. He had settled an old dispute on fishing rights between the Cantrebs, Llewellyn, and Crithis. He had pardoned the bandits of Dernal Forest, good men and women who had been forced to become outlaws because of the injustices of the former king. He had disbanded the few remaining mercenaries of the king's private army, the Scarlet Guard. The battles of the Fafolk, he had declared, would from now on be fought by the Fafolk. With his ascension to the throne had come the discovery of the vast surplus in the High King's treasury, piles of silver coins and some gold, which he had been able to return to the overtaxed lords of the land. This act alone would have done much to assure his popularity with the lords, but his wisdom and good judgment in settling the other disputes 
had ensured their loyalty to his name. I'm glad I stayed, too, she sighed. I know it was important to you and to all the Isles. You will make a splendid king. But all the while, I could not help wondering about the Druids. Are they suffering? Are they dead? I wish I could have been both places at once. I know I cannot rest easily until I have seen evil excised from Mirlock Vale. Suddenly, Tristan stiffened, lifting himself to the balls of his feet to peer in the distance. He squinted against the spray and saw it again, a flash of crimson against the all-encompassing gray of sea and sky. Robin sensed his change in mood, and she followed his gaze, staring a few degrees to starboard of the bow. A foot shorter than the young king, she could not see what had alarmed him. Northmen, he grunted, pointing. She saw the flicker of color now. It could only be the square sail of a raiding longship, and it was facing them. Keep an eye on it. I'll inform the captain. Turning and sprinting like a seasoned sailor down the pitching deck, the new high king of the moonshays barked a warning to the laboring crewmen. Robin turned back to the south as the longship drew closer. She could now make out a second sail beside the first, veering to the side. The sleek vessels spread apart to block the defiance path at either side. Some voice inside her said that she should be afraid, that these were dangerous and bloodthirsty foes. But instead, she felt only a quiet anger as she faced another obstacle on the road to rescue Jenna Moonsinger, the great druid of all the moonshays. But this was an obstacle she could counter. By the time Tristan returned to the bow, she had unlashed her staff from its mount on the gunwale. Captain Dansforth, the taciturn master of the Defiant, regarded the approaching vessels through his long spying tube. The crew, two dozen steadfast for folk of Caladir, turned as a man to regard the raiders, but maintained the course and sail of the Defiant without a hitch. She was called the stoutest vessel, with the ablest crew, among the four kingdoms of the Fofolk. The proof had come when they sailed into the late stages of an autumn gale that would have kept any other vessel of the Fofolk in port. Racing through the Sea of Moonshay, around the northern tip of Gwyneth, the Defiant had coursed through the Strait of Oman. Now they sailed south toward Corwell itself. These Northmen were obviously returning home. It was already later than the usual raiding season, but they would doubtless welcome one last prize before making port for the winter. The standard of Norland, grunted Dansforth. That one, to starboard, would be the king's own vessel. Grunark the Red. I have fought him before, mused Tristan. So, the story say, and bested him. The captain looked at the king with just a hint of amusement in his gray eyes. Dansforth was not yet middle-aged, though his hair and beard had silvered until they matched his eyes. Yet he had an enigmatic manner of speaking that reminded Tristan of an old but very smug man. Can we alter course? asked Robin quickly. To there? She pointed straight toward one of the advancing longships. Why? Dansforth was mildly incredulous. They're cutting too wide. They underestimate our speed, I think. With a little luck, we can dash between them. We won't need luck if you can get close to one of those ships. Robin spoke quietly, but there was a hint of great power in her voice. Do as she says. 
said Tristan. Very well, Danforth said with a shrug. He stepped to the steersman, standing at the huge wheel amidships, and ordered the change in course. Then he hurried back to the bow as the defiant heeled over with the turn. The trio was joined by another pair. One was Tristan's friend, Dareth, the swarthy, handsome Kalashite, who had become the king's chief advisor. Now he carried his gleaming scimitar lightly in his hand, awaiting battle with a half-smile across his dark brown face. The other was the halfling, Paldo of Lowhill, a middle-aged adventurer whose wrinkled face and graying hair belied his vitality. "'What are you trying to do?' demanded Paldo incredulously. "'Let's make a run for it!' The diminutive con man had been a friend of the Prince of Corwell for even longer than Dareth, and he now took it upon himself to protect the young king from the influences of others of a similar moral caliber. "'I hope you know what you're doing,' grumbled Dansforth. "'My men will stand by to repel boarders, but the crew of that one ship alone outnumbers us two to one.' Robin did not turn to look at the captain. They'll not get near enough to throw a line. Still skeptical, the captain turned to his crew, while Dareth, Tristan, and Paldo stood protectively around the druid. She closed her eyes in concentration and calmly caressed the smooth wood of her staff. The others held their swords ready. Tristan's own blade gleamed in his hand. The legendary sword of Simmer Q was a symbol of the ancient glory of the Fafolk. The fact that Tristan had discovered the potent blade after it had been missing for centuries explained to a great extent why the lords of Caladir had been so willing to extend to him the kingship. The longships raced toward them with startling rapidity. One came head-on, closing rapidly. The other tried to veer in from downwind, battling the gusts too close with her intended victim. Soon they could make out ranks of axe-wielding northmen standing along the hulls, ready to leap into the defiant. Others stood ready with lines and grapples, though the closing speed of the two vessels would make a grappling attempt risky at best. The nearest longship veered slightly from its path, a hundred yards away, seventy, forty, closing fast. Robin held her staff over her head, spreading her hands as far apart as she could. She clenched her hands and strained, as if trying to bend the stout shaft. Silently, mouthing a prayer to her deity, the goddess Earth Mother. An inhuman creaking assailed their ears as the longship suddenly lurched and twisted in the water. Nails flew through the air as the sleek hull bent torturously. Boards snapped, the mast crumpled, and then came a harsh snap like the breaking of a bone. Suddenly, the longship buckled, her keel torn in two. Bow and stern rose into the air, while the center of the hull filled with foaming brine. The sail billowed gently into the water, belying the violence of the ship's demise, and forty men tumbled into the cold gray sea. Tristan understood what had happened, though the reality of it stunned him. Robin's power, the power of the earth, was keyed to all things wild all creatures of nature. The oak trees that had formed the keel of the raider were such creatures of nature, and the druid had called upon those trees to change their shape, warping them into something different, something that would not support the frame of the longship. He heard a thump on the deck beside him and turned to see Robin, pallid and motionless, lying on the deck. What happened? he cried, kneeling and cradling her head in his arms. 
Her eyes fluttered open, and a look of panic washed across her features. I, I fainted. The casting made me weak. Why, how could it do that? She groaned, but struggled to a sitting position. I think I'm all right now. The king sprang to his feet as the defiant cut through the wreck, and Tristan could see the faces of the Northmen who had been dumped so suddenly into the sea. He saw anger and hatred, but not fear. Even the display of ship-killing magic was not enough to quail the hearts of these fierce warriors. Suddenly, he saw a Northman's eyes widen in terror. The man's mouth opened to scream, but he disappeared under the water before a sound could emerge. Another, and another of the raiders, vanished with a desperate thrashing. Now the remaining men began to scream loudly, in mind-numbing panic. The gray sea turned green with the thrashing of scaly bodies, and red froth exploded from the torn shapes of sailors. Tristan saw the other longship heel toward them, and then suddenly lurch off course. Her sides became a seething mass of green scales as reptilian creatures climbed from the water over the smooth planks to fall upon the crew with sharp teeth and wicked, slashing claws. Sahuajin! gasped the king, recognizing the savage fishmen they had battled upon Kaladir. And then it was the defiant's turn to slow in the water, as the attackers grabbed her hull as well. Tristan saw a fish-like head bristling with spines above a snarling nightmare of a face, and he stabbed instinctively. The creature fell back into the water, but two more took its place. Their human-like hands, tipped with sharp claws and webbed between the fingers, grasped the hull as they pulled themselves upward. Tristan stared into their blank, emotionless eyes. He saw the bracelets of silver and gold, the cruel tridents, spears and daggers tucked into metal belts. The monsters tumbled onto the deck all around him as Danforth's crew put up their weapons against this new assault. The humans took sword and axe and crossbow and faced attack from the claws of the deep. These creatures, the Sahuajin, they knew to be cruel and implacable foes. Still, the fishermen rose from the sea, striking at the two ships while their brethren dealt a bloody end to the Northmen, still bobbing among the wreckage of the third. The dark well grew even blacker with each killing. Hobarth sat and studied the pool, praying and meditating, he had seen a panther and an owl, obliterated in the last day, joining the bear, eagle, and stag in giving their life spark to Bahal. Somehow, the gods summoned these wretched creatures from the surrounding wasteland. Hobarth did not know why. The fat cleric studied well the word of his god, and slowly he began to sense Bahal's plan. At least, he began to understand his own substantial role in that plan. He looked to Jenna Moonsinger, sitting upon one of the cross pieces that had fallen from the ruined druidic arches around the moon well. She stared listlessly, off into space, as if awaiting a command. The fat cleric wondered at the druid's docility. She looked like the same implacable enemy he had faced a short month ago. The statue had become a being of flesh and blood when he pressed the heart of Kazgaroth into it. She looked, sounded, and moved like the great druid of Gwyneth. Even the bare grunt had been taken in. But now she was unquestioningly obedient to the commands of Bahal, and thus Hobarth. For several days, this had been but a pleasant diversion for Hobarth. 
He had not been with a woman in months, and so he had taken advantage of her willingness to follow his orders. Though she displayed no revulsion, neither did she exhibit any other emotion. Hobarth had eventually realized that her lack of passion turned the whole experience into rather a bore. Then he commanded her to use her magic, wondering if that potent weapon had been lost upon her perversion to the will of Bahal. The cleric was delighted when she called forth an inferno of fire from the ground itself, surrounding them with greedy flames. However, he noted a difference from her previous castings of the firewall. Now, as the flames licked across the ground, they left the earth tortured, blackened and barren in their wake, whereas before the spell had made no mark whatsoever upon the land. This spell fascinated Hobarth particularly, for it was one that no cleric could perform. She had used it to telling effect when he had sent his army of undead against her, and now it was his to command. Yet if her body and mind remained that of the great druid, her soul was unquestionably altered. The heart beating within her breast was no longer her own. It was the foul organ of a black beast of chaos, and this was the thing that held her now in its thrall. The difference was visible mainly in her eyes. Where once they had sparkled with vitality and wisdom, they now glowered darkly. At times, Hobarth imagined, he saw a flash of red fire within them, not unlike the gaze of Kasgaroth itself. And her lack of emotion reminded him more of the zombies he had once commanded than of any human being he had known. Now, knowing the will of Bahal, he approached her. Druid! He barked, and she looked dully at him. He realized that he had forgotten to order her to clothe herself after his latest indulgence. Don your garments. He waited as she pulled her tattered cloak about her, watching with interest. Though she was well along in years, her body had not succumbed to the flab of middle age. She was stout, but her flesh had a firmness that he found strangely attractive. Shrugging, he told himself that it was merely the lack of any younger woman that caused him to desire her. Bahal has spoken. You are to go to Care Corwell. There you will perform a certain task he has planned for you. Upon its completion, you will return here. As he told her the plan, as Bahal had told it to him, he watched her for some sign of reaction. After all, he was asking her to betray the land and the people she had striven all her life to protect. Hers was not a mission of attack, but something far more insidious. Bahal faced two powerful human enemies on the island of Gwyneth. These humans were closely allied to each other. The mission of Jenna Moonsinger simply was to drive these two allies apart. I understand. And you will obey? I shall obey. Claws raked Robin's calf as she slipped on the blood-slick deck. She whirled toward the Sahuagin that had seized her, cracking her staff sharply against its spiny head. The creature dropped like a stone, its skull crushed. Forked tongues flicking from between rows of razor-sharp teeth, others scrambled across the deck as the defiant heeled sideways. Robin lurched against the rail, still dizzy and unbalanced, but the faintness seemed to be fading. Tristan slashed at a fishman, the sword of Simracu sliced through the air and as easily through the flesh of its victim. The Sahuagin leaped backward, clutching the stump of its arm. It opened its mouth wide, showing hundreds of teeth in the gaping maw, 
and then hissed its hatred. The king leaped forward, and the monster dived cleanly into the sea. Tristan stopped at the rail and stabbed another creature, just as it tried to scramble over the gunwale into the boat. It fell back into the water, dead, and he looked about the deck. He saw Dareth behead one of the monsters as it lunged toward Robin's back, and Paldo's keen dagger disemboweled another as the nimble halfling ducked beneath the monster's grasping claws. And then... As suddenly as it had begun, the killing ended. The bodies of a score of Sahuajin and several sailors lay in chaotic disorder across the deck. Red human blood and the pinkish froth from Sahuajin veins mingled on the planks. But there was not a moving Sahuajin to be seen. Captain Dansforth stood with a knot of his sailors amidships, while Dareth, Paldo, and Robin were near Tristan on the foredeck. Tristan's great moorhound, Campus, stood beside the druid. The dog's back was higher than her waist, and its shaggy brown muzzle was stained with Sahuajin blood. More than once this day, he had saved the lives of his master and mistress. They still fight, said Robin, pointing at the longship where the battle still raged. Tristan smiled grimly at the sight. He could see the Northman chief, Grunark the Red, poised before the mast of his graceful ship. His men stood with him in a circle, facing outward, while twice their number of Sahuajin slashed toward the kill. Make sail! cried Captain Dansforth, sending his men to line and beam. He nodded at the king. We can make a break for it before they finish him off. The Defiant had placed her port side to the wind as she drifted during the melee. In another second, the sail came taut, and the Defiant heeled sharply into the wind. As her nose passed the drifting longship, Tristan saw another Northman dragged into the mass of Sahuajin. Come alongside, he called, noting the shock in Dansforth's eyes. To the rescue! Your! The captain was about to call him mad, Tristan realized. The thought startled him, and he realized that his order must seem mad by most logical arguments. Why should they help the raiders, who had minutes earlier been bent on their destruction? Hurry, and send your bowmen forward, man. Dansforth only hesitated for a fraction of a second. Then he curtly gestured to four of his men, who held heavy crossbows. You heard the king. Move. The defiant crashed against the waves again, slicing a path that would take her just past the longship. The distance closed rapidly while the bowmen knelt at the rail and took aim. Oh, good! Tristan was startled by the shrill voice behind him. Come on, Yath! We didn't miss the whole battle. I'm scared, scared, but we better get below, answered another equally shrill voice. The bright orange shape of a tiny dragon, its butterfly wings fluttering excitedly, suddenly appeared beside the king, popping from invisibility as fairy dragons are fond of doing. The little serpent darted past the king to perch on the rail. Oh boy, Northmen, come on, let's get them. Nanute, don't. Stay back here with me, with me. Without turning around, Tristan pictured the tiny sprite Yazili Click, cautiously peering from the hatch to the hold, his antenna, no doubt, quivering anxiously. The two fairy creatures had spent most of the voyage below decks, but now the chaos of the battle had aroused them. Newt, why don't you keep watch on the waters off the stern? suggested the king. 
see that they don't sneak up on us from behind. And incidentally, he added silently, stay out of the way. Well, all right, the fairy dragon agreed with a suspicious look at Tristan. Quickly, Newt buzzed away, and Yaz popped out of the hatch to follow him. The sprite was a small human-like creature, about two feet tall and distinguished by a small pair of gossamer wings and two antennae that sprouted from his forehead. The young king turned his attention back to the battle to see that the longship was very close now. He could clearly make out several Northmen in desperate combat with the monsters, while other Sahuagin held back from the fight. "'Shoot those farthest from the humans,' said Tristan. "'Now!' The four bolts flew through the air, each finding a target in the mass of scaly bodies. The red-haired Northman in the center of the deck cried out a challenge, and his crewmen pressed the attack. The crossbowmen reloaded quickly and loosed a second volley as the Defiant started to turn, barely a hundred feet from the raider now. These bolts, too, found home in the slick bodies of the fishmen. The spined heads of the Sahuagin bristled as they turned to face the Defiant, hissing their rage and clashing their weapons. Dareth and Robin joined Tristan at the gunwale. The king climbed up on the rail, bracing himself with a hanging rope. The sword of Simmer-Q was like a feather in his hand. A thirsty, violent feather. He saw perhaps two dozen Northmen still standing, though the numbers of the Sahuagin had thinned as well. And the red-bearded captain still led his men boldly, striking to both sides with his broad-bladed axe. The two ships drifted closer as Danforth smoothly maneuvered his vessel through a sharp turn. Then the Defiant paused, parallel to the longship and barely twenty feet away. The rolling of the swell dropped the longship into a trough. Tristan looked down into the hull and saw a pile of bodies, white skin and green scales intermingled in death. At the same instant, he pushed away from the gunwale, swinging on the rope until he lost momentum. He hung poised over the long ship for a moment and then let go to land lightly among the bodies. He heard Dareth land easily behind him. On the deck of the Defiant, Robin chanted a prayer to her goddess, then waved her staff in the direction of the Sahuagin. Suddenly, the outline of fishmen bodies glowed white, outlined in cool, magical fire. The reptiles hissed their rage, though several cowered back in fear. They slapped and struck at the flames without success, though the fire did not appear to cause them harm. The red-bearded Northman bellowed a challenge of brute violence, cleaving a Sahuagin to the waist with his axe. His comrades let loose a shout and attacked. A great green Sahuagin lunged at the High King. Its toothy jaws gaped, and the spiny ridge along its backbone stood erect as sharp claws clutched at Tristan's throat. The white fire flickered and flared around the creature's ghastly shape, making a clear target. The vicious claws swept toward the king but the silver sword found the throat of the monster first. Pink blood sprayed Tristan as the reptilian attacker clutched the lethal wound, still staggering toward him as it died. The High King whirled toward the other Sahuagin, the sword of Simmer-Q, marking a gleaming arc through the air before him. The North Man-Leader crushed a green skull with his massive axe, and suddenly... The fishmen lost their heart for battle. In one motion, still outlined in eerie flame, the remaining attackers slipped over the side of the longship and disappeared beneath the waves. Tristan and Dareth stood poised for combat, watching the Northmen. They saw tall, proud seafarers. 
the one called Grunark, stepped forward. His red hair and beard flowed freely across his chest and shoulders, and his pale blue eyes stared warily back at the pair. His chest was broad, and strapping muscles rippled beneath the skin of his arms. The Northman wore only a short wool tunic of plain gray and high-laced leather sandals. He looked every inch the sailor, taking no note of the rolling deck beneath his feet as he advanced, studying his rescuers. Grunark the Red saw two men facing him, one fair and one swarthy. The fair one stood easily before him, holding that dazzling sword. He held himself proudly, like a ruler of men. His brown beard and hair were shorter than the Northman's, but still long and full as a man should be. Though leaner of muscle, the swordsman had a wiry, solid frame that appeared to conceal hidden reserves of strength. The other man, the swarthier of the pair, was clean-shaven. His skin was a rich brown, his hair as black as night. He carried a silver scimitar and stood balanced, cat-like, upon the balls of his feet. Grunark noticed that, while the swordsman stared him full in the face, the man with the scimitar looked everywhere else, as if watching for a threat to his liege. Then Grunark's eyes went to the ship, where a black-haired woman stood at the rail. She met his gaze boldly, with none of the shyness that would have characterized a woman of the North. For several moments he stared, distracted by her beauty, until he remembered his surroundings. The North man lowered his axe. He spoke heavily accented common speech. Greetings. I am Grunark the Red, King of Norland. I thank you for my life. I am Tristan Kendrick, High King of the Fafolk. The longship lurched slightly as Danforth's crew brought the two ships together, lashing the hulls side by side. Robin sprang into the longship to stand beside the two men. Grunark turned and spoke a command in his own tongue, and the surviving members of his crew began to tend to their wounded and hurl Sahuagin bodies overboard. Grunark's eyes turned unconsciously to the woman again. He saw the supple curves of her body, poorly concealed by her loose cloak. She stood easily in the rocking hull, moving like a fighter, with balance and grace. He saw that the muscles of her arms and neck were tight, but her strength could not conceal the womanliness of her appearance. And then he recognized her. He recalled a figure, high atop a tower of Care Corwell, black hair streaming in the wind. He saw her with her staff held over her head, and he remembered the lightning that had crashed and crackled into the ranks of his men. With the memory came the stench of burned, blackened flesh, and even the feeling of hopeless panic that had arisen within him. It was at that moment Grunark remembered that he had realized that the Northmen's campaign was doomed. He shook his head suddenly, turning back to the young king, who stood looking at him curiously, and he wondered at the oddity that brought the two of them sworn enemies a year ago, standing face to face over the dead Sahuagin. "'Why did you do this?' asked the Red King. Tristan thought before answering. "'Why, indeed?' At last he spoke. "'I'm not quite certain. "'Our first instinct was to sail away once we had secured our own ship.' Your people and mine have fought for centuries, and in truth it seemed we should fight for centuries to come. But must it be this way? You are Kendrick of Corwell, and of Freeman's Down? The same. We have fought 
ourselves scarce more than a year since. You have great skill and fortune. And you, lady, asked the Red King, turning to Robin. You too fought well. Your sorcery helped break the spell of evil that bound us. Mine is the magic of faith. Not sorcery. There is a great difference. She smiled at him faintly, her eyes inscrutable. He nodded, not understanding the distinction. Suddenly he remembered the scrolls and the promise they seemed to offer. He bent and retrieved the long tube from beneath the deck, offering it mutely to her. He was not sure why, but it seemed right that she should have. Perhaps it was a way of repaying the debt he owed these for folk for saving his life, though it was more than his sense of obligation that caused him to give the scroll to the beautiful druid. It was claimed as a thing of great value, he explained awkwardly. Is it of use to you? Robin took the ivory tube, barely stifling a gasp. She stroked the elaborate carvings reverently before looking at the Northman. His face was taut with tension, she saw, as if he desperately hoped that she would value the gift. She looked again at the runes. They were strange, not druidic in nature, but at the same time almost identical to a series of carvings her teacher had made along a short piece of wood, a rune stick that Jenna had given Robin as a gift. This was obviously a talisman of great power, sacred to some god not very different from her own. It's very precious, a thing of power. Where did you get it? From the look of sudden anguish on the fierce raider's face, she knew she had hurt him with her question. She guessed that the tube was the plunder of some raid, though why Grunark should be troubled by that fact, she couldn't begin to guess. Never mind, she added quickly. It is a thing of tremendous value. I thank you for giving it to me. It is a small reward for the gift of my life and my ship, replied Grunark solemnly. The Red King turned back to Tristan. Your actions are more puzzling. As you must know, I was with the army that would have put your home to the torch. How can you forgive one who has done you such evil? For one thing, you're no longer accompanied by your powerful ally, remarked Tristan. The vision of the beast, Kazgaroth, growing from the body of a man into a monster towering over a castle wall, came quickly into Tristan's mind. He remembered the terror and awe of that moment as if it had occurred yesterday. Grunark's face flushed. Ally, he spat. It was a thing of great evil. It slew one of our greatest kings and took his body for its own foul purposes. We were little more than mindless weapons in its hands. Perhaps that can explain why we aided you. Evil such as that still haunts the Moonshase. As long as we strive to destroy each other, we make the task of that evil so much easier. I ask you, Grunark, King of Norland, would we not do better to join forces to combat this evil? The Red King looked Tristan full in the face, then nodded slowly. You speak with the wisdom of a much older king. But what of this evil you speak of? It still threatens our lands. Where and how shall we fight it? Come with me to Corwell said the High King. We will talk of it there. The histories of lands, peoples, and nations are made of many tiny events. Most are insignificant, their impact gone with the moment of their passing. But some of these events have an impact extending far beyond their occurrence. 
These events are things that can shape and change history for countless years into the future. Grunark the Red extended his broad hand, and Tristan Kendrick took it in his firm clasp. Their eyes met, bold and frank. An event of the latter type had just occurred. The corruption of Jenna Moonsinger struck the goddess like a physical blow. It fell all the more heavily since the great druid had not even been granted the dignified defeat of death, but had instead become a tool of the very evil she had striven to defeat. The Earth Mother felt the presence of her servant's body, but could not reach out to her soul. Jenna had been freed from her prison of stone, only to be entrapped in a spiritual corruption more vile than any form of death. For a time it seemed as if the land itself would wither and die in sympathy with the mother's grief. Indeed, winter hastened its approach, reaching frosty fingers across the moonshades, eagerly striking the last leaves from those trees still carrying vestiges of foliage. And then, briefly, the goddess looked up from her misery, away from the dark depths of the earth to the world of sky and air and sun. She felt a small tingle of vitality, and with it came renewed hope. The Earth Mother knew that her lone druid, Robin of Gwyneth, still lived. Now she sensed that Robin had come into contact with a talisman of great power and faith, a vessel of wisdom that could invigorate and vitalize her. The scrolls of Arcanus were not of the Mother's own essence, but they were clerical scrolls of great antiquity, born of a faith not so different from her own. The clerics, like her druids, held that the balance of all things made the fulcrum of life. Two, the scrolls contained teachings of that balance and its fundamental principles that held keys to great power. They offered Robin some semblance of knowledge and might, even though the Earth Mother herself could no longer offer the same. Perhaps it was not much, but she could fasten her hopes to nothing else. Chapter 3 Seduction With a shrill cry, the vulture sensed the nearness of the sea. The bird hastened its flight, and soon the blue waters of Corwell Firth came into view to the west. The bulk of Care Corwell stood dominating the foreground, and soon the bird was flying over the castle. It circled above the stone keep, following the line of the wooden palisade that protected the compound. Care Corwell stood, perched upon its rocky knoll, commanding the ground around the compact fishing town, and its sheltered harbor. The surrounding moor had browned with the approach of winter, but the bright afternoon sun of this day gave the place a warm spring-like look, especially as it reflected the brilliant azure hue of the firth. The vulture, a dirty black bird with streaks of brown and gray across its wings, finally settled upon the parapet, of the highest tower of the castle. It was an oddly formed bird, with great misshapen claws and a twisted crooked neck, as if it were an imperfect rendering of the real thing. Now the bird perched there, staring intently at the activity on the waterfront. With human-like attention, it watched the progress of two vessels that approached the dock. To a human, the sight would have indeed seemed odd. Here was a sturdy, deep-drafted vessel of the Pafolk, its sails mostly furled as the gentle breeze pushed it toward the wharf. Beyond, just passing through the breakwater, came a sleek, low-hulled longship of the type sailed by the raiders of the north. Any human who understood the ways of the moonshays could not have helped but wonder why ships of two such bitter enemies would sail together into a peaceful harbor. Jenna Moonsinger, 
in the body of the vulture, felt no such curiosity about the unusual flotilla. She was on a mission from Bahal, concerned only with the location of her target. And he, she suspected, would be found upon one of those ships. She had made the flight from Mirlock to Corwell in two days. Her druidic ability to shift her body into the shape of an animal remained, despite her corruption by the heart of Kasgaroth. But the animal body she inhabited was distorted and malformed. Her motivation now had a single focus, to serve the will of Bahal. She soared from the parapet and glided into the courtyard, landing in a shadowed passage between several stables. Then the body of the vulture shifted, growing and bending into the shape of a young woman. Jenna, aided by the beast, adjusted the body to achieve the effect she desired. A brilliant tumble of red hair flowed loosely across her narrow shoulders, framing a perfect oval face. Her breasts grew large and firm, thrusting boldly forward so that only a man of wood or stone could have avoided taking notice of them. The woman who stepped from the passage into the afternoon light of the courtyard bore a little resemblance to the great druid of Gwyneth. Tall, smooth-skinned, and young, she moved with the supple grace of a cat. Gliding across the courtyard of Care Corwell, she slipped among the folk who had begun to gather at the castle in anticipation of the king's homecoming. She had not to do now, but wait for her victim to fall into her trap. The children of the goddess were her most potent allies in the struggle against Kasgaroth. The leviathan of the deep shattered our ships and scattered our fleet. But the power of the beast slayed the great fish in the end. The pack pursued the army of the Northmen over the land, howling madly with their woven voices and tearing flesh with their great fangs when they brought the army to bay. Hobarth paused in his narration, sensing Bahal's keen interest in the tale. In truth, the cleric was surprised at how little the god knew about their adversaries. But the pack, too, is gone, scattered to the far corners of the isle. The druid told me her goddess lacks the will or the might to summon it again. Jenna had indeed provided the cleric with a wealth of information. She apparently retained all the memories of her former life with none of the spiritual values that would have prevented her from disclosing them to one such as Hobarth. Now, he continued, only the unicorn Cameron remains of the children. He is strong. I have faced him myself, but his might is nothing in the face of your own. Of course the cleric did not speak out loud. Instead, he formulated the information in his mind, where his god claimed it for his own. This, too, is how Bahal spoke with his servant. These children you speak of, the children of a god, the thought of them brings me pleasure. Hobarth waited, confused. I, too, shall create children, the children of Bahal. They will stalk the land beside you and bring death to all the corners of the world. What form shall they take? asked the cleric nervously. His answer came in the form of a bubbling maelstrom forming in the center of the dark well. The black water foamed upward, releasing a stench of foul gas into the air. Then the froth moved across the surface as rings of ripples spread outward from the turbulence. The surface of the water parted in a soft eruption and a figure emerged. Oily water trickled off a broad, flat head, 
streaked across a feathered face, dripped from a short, blunt beak. Then the great brown body emerged, lumbering onto the shore and hulking over the cleric. Patches of shaggy hair, in places torn to reveal bare and scabrous skin, covered the creature's lower body. Hobarth looked up at a ghastly apparition, a nightmare thing that did not belong on this world. He recognized the shaggy body of Grunt the bear. The thing stood on its hind legs twice as tall as a man in the hunching pose of a great brown bear. But the face dispelled any notions of normalcy. It was flat and covered with feathers, with a short downward-pointing beak. A beak! It was the head of an owl, grown hugely out of proportion and placed upon the body of the bear. The words of Bahal came into the cleric's mind. My owl bear, you shall call him Thorax. Scarcely did Hobarth have a chance to register his shock, remembering a large owl that had died from the poisonous touch of the waters shortly after the bear's demise. Then he saw the water foaming and swirling a second time. This time... A pair of bizarre creatures splashed forth, pulling themselves into the air on the broad wings of eagles. They were followed by several more, and they all flew with the grace and power of that most regal of birds. But the heads of these hideous things were all like the head of a proud stag. A broad rack of antlers spread above each of them, only the mouths were unlike deer, as they parted in flight to reveal rows of sharp, wolf-like fangs. The Peritons. Witness the birth of my flock. Again, the waters of the dark well churned upward and away, and the cleric stared dumbfounded as the next creature came slinking from the muck and the slime. It rose from the water with a heart-numbing growl, its yellow eyes flashing hatred. Its black coat glistened, and its wicked eyes held Hobarth enthralled as the monster crept toward him. Shantu, king of my children. The beast resembled a huge black panther, nearly the size of a horse. Its coat dripping with the oily liquid, glistened with a hellish sheen. The gaping mouth displayed fangs as long as daggers, and it crouched menacingly, as if it would leap upon Hobarth himself. But this was no ordinary panther, even allowing for its size. From each of the black shoulders sprouted a long tentacle, covered all over with moist cups, like the limbs of an octopus. At the end of each tentacle curved a sharp, bony hook, ready to rip into flesh like a giant claw. Shantu growled again, and Hobarth felt the bile rise in his throat. Then the creature slinked past him, and he noticed something curious. Though the animal dripped steadily from the waters of the well, the ground beneath it did not grow wet. Indeed, the astounded cleric noticed, the ground was wet several paces to the side of the beast. As the creature moved away from the well, it made no tracks in the muddy ground, at least not beneath it. Instead, Hobarth saw tracks appear off to one side, though the creature looked and sounded as if it was directly before him. With awe, he witnessed the power of his god's creation. Here was a creature that seemed to be in one place, yet was actually somewhere else nearby. Thus is the displacer beast born to take his place before you. Glory to Behal and his magnificent children. 
murmured the cleric. They, together with my legions from the sea, and you, my servant, shall spread death across the isle. When you are finished, when my will has been done, there will be not a single living creature upon this land that is not beholden to me. This island shall become a monument to death. The flock of peritons swirled overhead, strangely silent. The owl bear, thorax, lumbered away from the well, clacking its huge beak awkwardly in the air. And the great cat-like displacer beast prowled the shore of the pond, as if waiting for a command that was not long in coming. And now, my children, go forth and hunt. Journey far and slay the enemies of Behal. The homecoming was all the young king could have desired. Ponswain had indeed carried word of his coronation to the Fafolk of Corwell, and they turned out to meet the defiant in huge numbers. Hours earlier, lookouts had spotted the vessels heading toward the harbor. Despite confusion and suspicion raised by the appearance of the longship, it was an eager crowd that moved toward the waterfront. The throng grew steadily until... By the time they docked, most of the town awaited them. As the defiant pulled alongside the pier, the Fafolk erupted in a spontaneous cheer. The king felt a warm glow of gratitude and a rush of pleasure to again see his home. Among the well-wishers greeting them at the dock, Tristan recognized Tavish of Llewellyn the bard of the harp who had plucked him from the sea after his boat sank on the journey to Caladir. He had not seen her since his arrest at the hands of the former High King's personal guards. The rotund minstrel flashed him a beaming smile as he stepped ashore. She embraced him in a crushing hug, and he was surprised to see tears on her cheeks. I came here to get help, to rescue you, she explained, wiping her eyes. But it seems you've handled things pretty well on your own. Tristan heard the rumbling of the crowd to his left, and saw many of the Fafolk surge toward the dock as the longship pulled alongside. Raiders, murderers, thieves! and other invectives emerged from the angry men, and the king forced his way through the crowd to stand before the longship. He looked straight into the faces of the angry farmers and sailors before him, and slowly they backed away. Hold your men, and listen well. These men of the north are here as my guests. We have fought together and bested a monstrous foe. They will feast with us and join our celebration, and no harm will come to them while they are in Corwell. A burly farmer grumbled his discontent, and Tristan fixed him with an icy gaze until the man looked uncomfortably at the ground. One by one, the members of the mob grew silent, their anger replaced by expressions of confusion or doubt. I am your king, the high king of the Fafolk. Tristan spoke softly, and as he had hoped, the mob grew silent to hear his words. This day marks a new beginning for us, for the Fafolk of all the isles. Let this be the sign of a new reign, as the Northmen come to our town and join us at our table. Wise words, hail to the king, someone cried out. Tristan looked around in surprise and saw the beaming face of Friar Nolan, the cleric of the new gods who had worked long and hard trying to convert the Fafolk of Corwell. Though his success had been limited, he was widely regarded as a man of great wisdom and his healing magic had benefited many a resident of Corwell. 
Hail to the king! cried another man, and soon the crowd took up the chant. Several for folk even came forward to help lash the longship to the dock. The pudgy friar, his bald pate bobbing through the group, pushed his way to Tristan's side. Splendid words, sire! You embark upon a wise course. The gods will surely smile upon you. Some of them, anyway, the young king replied with a grin. And thank you for your own words. Most timely remarks, good friar. Welcome home, sire, cried another young man, pushing to his side. Tristan recognized him as Randolph, the young but very capable captain of the guard, whom he had left in charge of the castle upon his departure. Before the king could respond, however, he was swept away, lifted to the shoulders of his countrymen, and carried on a triumphant march to Care Corwell itself. They carried Robin beside him, and his spirits brightened further as he saw her smiling above the tumult. Though she had been moody and depressed the last few days of the voyage, he hoped that their arrival at home— and the fact that they planned to strike out for Mirlock Vale in the morning would improve her spirits. But first, there would be a feast. It would be a celebration of the new king, his homecoming, and his success in the campaign on Caladir. Tristan regained his feet in the castle courtyard and led Robin and Randolph into the great hall of the keep, where they finally left the crowd behind. "'Where's Pont Swain? he asked. "'We must talk before the feast.' "'I'll send a guardsman to find him. "'Lord Pont Swain's tending to the last business of the food and drink. "'We trust you will be pleased, sire.' "'No doubt. "'Now tell me how fares life in Corwell.' "'We have missed you, but farewell.' The Fafolk have been fairly bursting with pride since news of your coronation, sire. Great effort has been expended preparing for your homecoming. And what news? The only excitement was the presence of a band of outlaws raiding Cantrev's Dinat and Coart. We caught and hanged them. They seemed to be Northmen who did not flee with their brethren last year. Randolph went on to describe the state of the kingdom, from the poor harvest and meager catches of food, to the great successes of the huntsmen in the highlands. The food reserves for winter are adequate. It seems that a great deal of wildlife has fled south from Mirlock Vale. Hunting has never been better. And what news of the Vale? asked Robin. Puzzling that. Shepherds say their sheep will not venture near it. The huntsmen who have climbed along the high ridge to look into the vale report vast desolation. Trees have died, and even the lake itself has lost its gleam. It is disturbing news indeed, sire, but the blight does not seem to have reached Corwell. Welcome home, my king! Lord Ponswain burst into the hall, bowing deeply. He was a handsome man, clean-shaven, with a broad mane of elegantly curled brown hair that was the envy of many a maid. I trust your voyage was comfortable. Indeed. Please be seated. Ponswain had been Tristan's chief rival for the throne of Corwell before the high kingship had made that rivalry moot. Now he seemed to devote all of his energies to the welfare of his king. The transition had been so sudden and so dramatic that Tristan still didn't quite trust him. I will have to leave the kingdom in the capable hands of you both for a little while longer, he explained. Tomorrow morning, Robin and I journey to Mirlock Vale. This devastation is caused by an evil cleric of great power, and we shall confront and destroy him. As you wish, sire. Randolph asked several more questions about the governance of the realm, 
while Pontswain sat quietly, a distant look upon his features. Shortly the two men departed, and Robin and Tristan were left alone in the great hall. The whole vale devastated, she whispered, horrified. What manner of man is this? A man who can be killed by my sword or your spells. And he will be, I promise you. He put his arms around her, and she leaned into him, comforted by his confidence. Will you join me in our celebration tonight? He asked. We can do nothing more until the morning. We should enjoy our homecoming. She forced a smile. You're right. I have thought of little else than the Moonwell and the Druids since our victory on Caladir. You deserve greater rewards than I have given you, and I'm sorry for that. Tonight, we shall celebrate. And tomorrow, I promise, we'll start for the Vale. He looked at her somberly. Yes. Robin's voice grew more animated. The scrolls that Grunark gave me, I've been looking them over. I think one of them offers a real hope, a chance to return the druids to their mortal forms. You mean the statues? Bring them back to flesh? Exactly. And with the druids of the isles gathered around, mustering all of our combined power, this foul cleric must certainly be defeated. Besides, this time we'll have your sword on our side. But tonight, Tristan interrupted, we feast. He kissed her, and she met his lips with the full force of her own embrace. For a minute, they relished the touch, the holding of each other. Tonight, as we celebrate, Tristan began slowly, hesitantly. May I announce to our people the naming of their queen? Will you be my wife? She smiled softly and kissed him again. He realized in surprise that her cheeks were wet. Then she pulled away to look him full in the face, and the love shining from her eyes brought a fiery warmth to his heart. I do want to marry you. And I shall, I hope. But I cannot make this promise now. But why not? I can't make that commitment until we have rid the veil of its scourge. You see, I believe I am the only druid left now. I hope that, with the help of the goddess, we can free Jenna and the others from their stone prisons, and then I can marry you. I will tell Jenna that I cannot take her place as great druid. But if we do not succeed, then I shall be the only hope of the continuance of my order. Tristan, I love you, but that would be a calling I could not refuse. But could we not still marry? I'm certain I could help you with. She silenced him with a finger to his lips. The great druid, and such I must then become, must be chaste. She cannot marry. Tristan was silent, understanding her calling. The knowledge only fueled his determination to succeed. I shall love you either way. And I you, my king. This time their kiss was longer, lingering until the maids entered the hall to begin preparing for the feast. Perhaps we should bathe, he said with a smile, and prepare for the feast. They returned to their separate quarters, relishing the familiarity of their surroundings, and each of them dressed in linens unstained by travel for the first time in many ten days. Ponswain had acquitted himself well in preparing for the celebration. In anticipation of the king's arrival, the lord had ordered pigs and a cow slaughtered, kegs of ale iced, 
Tristan, in defiance of local custom, enjoyed his beer cold, and a multitude of cakes and pies baked. Tristan quickly found himself seated at the head of a huge banquet table in the great hall of Care Corwell. Also at the table sat Dareth, Robin, Paldo, Ponswain, Fire Nolan, Captain Dansforth, Tavish, and Randolph. Robin sat to his right, and at his left hand sat Grunark the Red. A score of other tables filled the hall, each with benches and chairs for a dozen or more for folk. This, the largest room in the castle, was warmed by four great fireplaces, one on each wall, and illuminated by innumerable torches set in sconces along the walls. It felt good, Tristan decided, to dress in a fine tunic and sit at the head of such a grand table. The aromas of pork and meat puddings mixed with the smoke of the fires, causing his stomach to rumble eagerly. When do we eat? Newt demanded indignantly, suddenly popping into view on Tristan's plate. I've been waiting for hours. The king laughed, even as the kitchen doors burst open and kitchen maids, carrying heaping platters of food and foaming pitchers of ale, emerged. Newt buzzed delightedly into the air and disappeared again. Yazili Click presumably was resting somewhere. Sprites are notoriously nervous among crowds. Tristan took no notice at the time of the young woman in a peasant garb who took the last seat at the king's table. No one seemed to know who she was, but her appearance was stunning, and since most of the occupants of the table were male, no objection was raised. With a toss of her red hair, she sat among them. Soon Randolph laughed at some humorous remark she made, and shortly thereafter Tristan forgot about her. Robin looked up suddenly, disturbed by a vague disquiet. She looked around the table uneasily, though her gaze passed by the strange woman without noticing her, as if the woman were invisible. Events were moving too quickly for the king to fully accept that his long voyage had finally ended. Everyone talked at once. His mug seemed to fill of its own accord whenever the level of foam dipped more than an inch below the brim. It felt wonderful to be home, and he basked in the admiration of his people as Dareth, Paldo, and even Ponswain described their adventures. The crowd fell gradually silent at Paldo's account of the battle against the monstrous forces of High King Carathal and the Black Wizard Sindri. The halfling's voice fell to a dramatic hush as he described the rage of the Earth Mother, telling in vivid detail of the roaring torrent of sea that washed onto shore, carrying away not only great chunks of the island of Caladir, but also the army of the former high king as well. Ever the showman, Paldo paused a beat. Don't leave us hanging, fella. What happens next? Tavish demanded. That's the good part, the king said, laughing. A few hours later, a fisherman sailed from shore to our island. He wanted to know what had happened to his bay. All we could tell him was that it had gotten a lot bigger. And he brought you home to Corwell? Oh, it wasn't that simple, interjected Paldo again. First, we had to go to Llewellyn. The lord there had a feast for us all and summoned all the lords of Caladir to attend the official coronation. He looked at Tristan with pride, as if he personally was responsible for his old friend's ascent to the throne. The celebration went on for a ten-day. Of course, Ponswain took the first ship out to bring word to Corwell. But those Caladirians, Caladites, couldn't get enough of our hero. 
Tristan stole a guilty look at Robin as Paldo continued, and she smiled back at him. Newt swooped back onto Tristan's plate, lighting among clean-picked bones, and looked around for a snack. Here, Tristan joked, tilting his mug toward the dragon. To his surprise, Newt stuck his muzzle into the foamy ale and slurped loudly, smacking his lips as Paldo continued the tale. Finolin and the dwarves decided to walk home, though how you walk from one island to another, I'm sure I don't know. Then the storm hit, and we had to stay in Llewellyn even longer. Not that we minded, of course. But finally, Captain Dansforth and the Defiant were ready to sail, and here we are. This black wizard, asked Grunark, as the guests turned again to their own conversations. Is he an aspect of the evil you spoke of? I am certain of it. Tristan frowned at the memory. The beast that corrupted your own leader and the foul sorcerer at his command both conspired to destroy the peoples of the Isles. But did they serve the same master? The wizard was but a pawn like we are, stated Robin bluntly. Tristan looked at her in surprise as she continued. The true nature of the threat we face is a chaotic force of evil, far greater than magic, and even greater than the beast. How do you know? asked the Northman. I have seen the corruption strike at the very soul of the land. My teacher, and the druids who fought beside her, with all the faith of the balance and the land behind them, were not enough to stop it. Neither Robin nor anyone else noticed the bright gleam in the eyes of the red-headed woman as she leaned forward to catch every word of the young druid's explanation. The power behind this evil is greater than could be wielded by any man, even a sorcerer such as Sindri. The power is served by a cleric of incalculable evil, but even that cleric is but a pawn. There is only one answer. Our islands are threatened by one of the dark gods. Robin spoke softly, but all of those at the table looked furtively toward her as she spoke. All except Newt, that is, who took the opportunity to seal another and then a third sip from Tristan's mug. The red-haired woman licked her lips while the others stared with expressions of apprehension or disbelief. Grunark frowned. Why should one of the dark gods desire the moonshades when there are rich empires? Kalimshan, Thay, Waterdeep, all across the realms. What do we have here? Robin bit her tongue, holding back an angry reply. She realized that he really did not understand. These islands have a life of their own. Perhaps that is one reason our people make war on each other with such regularity. The Fafolk have always felt that the men of the North do not treat our land with the reverence it deserves. She suddenly leaned against the table, wincing in discomfort, and Tristan took hold of her arm. Unnoticed by them all, the red-haired woman smiled and stared intently at the druid. "'What is it?' Tristan asked. "'Are you all right?' Quickly she shook off his hand, sat upright, and continued. "'The moonwells are the proof. Jenna told me that when her grandmother was a girl, there was a moonwell in every village of the Isles.' Druids by the hundreds patrolled the wild places, working the will of the goddess. Indeed, agreed Friar Nolan. These isles have a peculiarly sacred nature, obvious to those of us who worship the new gods as well as to the druids. Remember, not all of these gods are of the same vein as the master of this evil. Many of these clerics, as you, 
regard the moon wells as benign and sanctified places. But there are no moon wells on Norland, protested the Red King. And then he looked thoughtful. Precisely. And as the faith of the people wanes, as more of the lands are taken from the Fafolk, the power of the goddess grows weaker. Suddenly Robin shook her head violently, and the color drained from her face. But the enchantment of the land remains? Yes, and becomes more susceptible to corruption with each passing year, each new blow against the Fafolk. Robin was trying hard not to state her points accusingly, but she was only partially succeeding. She had trouble speaking the words clearly, and an acute nausea grew within her. All the while, the stranger woman stared at her, piercing the druid skin with those cold black eyes. But the land is here, like all other lands, for the using, argued Grunark. The using, yes, but not the abuse or destruction. It is when humans destroy that which supports them that the goddess suffers most keenly. You, like your king, are wise beyond your years, mused the Northman. I do not like the thought that my people are responsible for bringing this evil to the land. Perhaps... You can help us to remove it. Tristan spoke earnestly, staring his guest in the face. I owe you my life. Ask what you will. If it is in my power to give, you shall have it. For now, I'll be happy to have your friendship, Tristan said warmly. Let's toast to peace between us and between our children. Both kings raised their mugs and drank deeply, thumping them back to the tabletop at the same instant. Tristan realized, suppressing a belch, that he had had a lot to drink. Time for some dancing, proclaimed Tavish suddenly. She rose and unstrapped her lute, checking the tunings of a few errant strings. Eager for folk, pushed some of the tables aside, and Tristan turned to Robin, ready to kick up his feet. She shook her head in confusion, and he leaned over toward her, again concerned. I'm sorry, she said weakly. I'm not feeling well at all. I think I'd better go to bed. He offered to walk her to her room, but she declined. Well, Wake me at first light, he offered. We'll ride at dawn. She looked at him skeptically. I'll wake you then, she said with a laugh. But you'll surprise me if we leave before mid-morning. With a forced smile, she left the hall. Tristan turned back to the table and bumped someone who had not been there a moment earlier. With surprise... He saw the red-haired woman wiping the contents of a spilled mug from her apron. Excuse me, he said. Let me... That's all right, she interrupted. She smiled at him, a rich glowing look that caused his blood to race. He had not noticed earlier just how attractive she was. Satir he said, not knowing why he offered the seat Robin had just vacated. Move, Newt. He pushed the fairy dragon aside, and Newt, with an indignant humph, disappeared. The woman handed him another mug as he sat heavily beside her. He stared at her mutely as the folk throughout the hall rose to dance to the strains of Tavish's lute. Something very appealing and a little wicked gleamed at him from her eyes. You are a very handsome king, she said quietly. Her voice was soft and husky. 
His head swirled and lust rose unbidden within him. Her hand fell softly on his leg, and the pressure of her fingers burned into his flesh. Who are you? He realized as he asked the question that her answer would mean nothing to him. It didn't matter who she was. He didn't know that he wanted her with a physical yearning beyond anything he had ever felt. Tristan was unaware, or chose to ignore, the uncomfortable looks of Paldo and Randolph as his two friends cast sideways glances at their king. He took no note of Ponswain's sneer, nor even of the hot anger burning in Dareth's eyes. The Kalashite glowered at the girl, but she squeezed the king's thigh more tightly. Abruptly she stood and swirled away from the table, her loose gown flowing around the full contours of her body. Tristan stumbled to his feet as she slipped away. A desperate fear rose within him. He mustn't let her get away. Sire! came the call from behind him in Dareth's strained voice. Friar Nolan stood and laid a restraining hand upon Tristan's arm, but the king angrily shook it off. The cleric shrank back into his chair under the intensity of Tristan's blazing stare. But then the king had eyes only for the luscious creature that slid sinuously across the great room. She passed through the door into a darkened hallway. He followed behind, eagerly hurrying to her side, but she twisted away and dashed up the stairs to the royal living quarters. Tripping on the first step, he regained his balance and followed her. Somehow she found his bedchamber, and he followed her inside, pulling the door shut with a slam behind him. Her robe fell away, and the sight of her nakedness took his breath from him. He lunged toward her, and they fell across the huge bed, his own tunic falling unnoticed around his ankles. Desire took hold of his brain, giving him clear focus and strong purpose. Nothing could be more important than this warm, wanton woman beneath him. Newt looked blearily at Tristan and Robin from his invisible position next to a recently full pitcher of ale. Suppressing a belch, he squinted. What was wrong? That wasn't Robin. Sitting up in shock, the little dragon watched the woman, that floozy, lead the unfortunate Tristan toward the door. This wasn't right, wasn't right at all. Where did Robin go? What did that awful creature have in mind for his friend? I'll save him, he vowed, blinking again. Already his mind whirled with illusions he could use, perhaps a nest of snakes in her hair, or a great fat wart right on her. But he couldn't let them get away. Already the door was closing behind them. Newt sprang into the air, wings humming, but wait! His head was spinning uncontrollably from the effects of the ale. And what was wrong with his wings? Why were they flying him in this direction? And where had that great looming pillar come from? The one right in front of his nose. No one in the hall heard the tiny thunk as the dragon crashed, and Newt knew only blackness as he fell lightly to the floor. Once behind the solid oaken door to her room, Robin began to feel better almost immediately. The sudden queasiness passed, and she decided it must have been a combination of excitement and too much food and wine. She lay on her familiar down mattress and dwelled for a moment on her glowing pride in Tristan. He made a splendid figure of a king. She had always sensed a great destiny before him, but now she began to see it take form. Would that he could end the centuries of strife between Northmen and Fafolk. 
and after that accomplishment, where would he go next? She hoped very deeply that she would be able to share that pride and progress with him, that they could have children and grandchildren who would see that legacy live on after them. And with him at her side, she felt confident that they could conquer the evil cleric and his legions in Mirlock Vale. Suddenly she sat up, thinking of the celebration in the hall below. Her illness had passed. There was no reason she shouldn't go back and enjoy herself. And Tristan had been disappointed, she could tell, when she had left. She felt a twinge of guilt, knowing how important this homecoming was to him. There was no reason why they shouldn't have a night of enjoyment before embarking upon their quest. And she really did enjoy dancing. She went downstairs and saw with surprise that Tristan was not there. Dareth left the party, too, as soon as he saw her come through the door. She thought he looked angry. Paldo and Randolph didn't seem to know where the king had gone, though their answers when she questioned them seemed force. Perhaps he had been taken ill also. Could they have shared a piece of spoiled food? Concerned, she started back up the stairs. The first thing to do, she decided, was check his room. Tristan didn't notice the door swing open behind him, but the sudden wash of torchlight broke his concentration. Robin's voice, as if from a great distance away, reached him. Tristan, what's wrong? What... And then he was cold sober as he turned to stare into the druid's shocked face. Robin slowly lowered the torch, her mouth hanging slack in astonishment. The yellow flames reflected vast depths of pain in her green eyes. He tried to sit, but the tunic betrayed him, and he sprawled across the woman, who laughed in delight. And then the door to the room slammed shut with a force that shook the stones of the castle and sent its echoes reverberating through the long, empty passages of his heart. Shapes slipped past overhead, dark green against the purple of the sea. The stream of bodies continued for many minutes, sinuous forms swimming easily through the depths, dark and scaly and silent, always silent. Ysala stared upward all the while, watching the army gather above her. Her mouth gaped slightly and her forked tongue darted, unnoticed by her, back and forth from her maw. The force gathered like a cloud in the sea, blocking the scant sunlight that penetrated this far down and surrounding Ysala with a welcome darkness. The throbbing power of the deep song filled the sea around her and brought a fierce joy to her soul. Below her, along the floor of the vast undersea canyon, another army gathered. This was a plodding, methodical force, lacking the speed and grace of the swimming Sahujin. But it offered its own terrors to any foe. For the second army was a force made up entirely of death. The shambling corpses animated by the dark power of her faith dumbly awaited a command. Her command. Yasala was a cleric of Bahal, in her own way as powerful as Hobarth. However, while the human Hobarth presided over a domain of air and land and light, Yasala practiced her craft in the dark, chill regions below the surface of the sea. As keeper of the eggs, she ruled her scaly congregation together with Sithisal, the king. Her priestesses, yellow, sleek creatures, as opposed to the sturdy green warriors that made up most of her kind, enforced the will of Bahal, as that will was made known to their mistress. Now, Yasala and Sithisal had assembled an army more vast than any in the memory of the Deep Dwellers. 
Beside the legions of fierce Sahuajin warriors at their command fought the dead of the sea, sailors who had drowned in the oceans of the Munche, and had been animated by the power of Bahal to serve as mindless servants of evil. And now, too, they had the remnants of the army of the Black Wizard. These troops, humans mostly, but also the dead remnants of the Ogre Brigade, marched beside the dead of the sea in answer to Yasala's command. And over them all swam the sleek legions of Sahuajin, ready to burst forth from the surf to lay waste to the lands of Northmen and for folk alike. They awaited, but the command, to march. Summoned by the thrumming cadence of the deep song, the army massed in the city of Cresselac, deep beneath the narrow realm of men. They huddled among the towers and domes of the vast city on the bottom of the sea, gathering force and ferocity from the song. To the east, they had suffered rebuff and loss, against the skill of the new king and the might of the Earth Mother. Yasala sensed that the goddess was not the threat she had been, and the new king was now a hated enemy. The king gave focus to Bahal's hatred, in a new direction, and so he directed his priestess toward the west, toward Corwell. Yasala keened sharply from her temple, high on the canyon wall of Cresselac, summoning her priestesses to the sword. Sithisal called his legions together, and they started on the march to the west. Propelled by the command of Bahal, they would march to land and lay waste to all the settlements of man they found there. Northmen of the folk, it mattered not. The claws of the deep would slay regardless. The god of murder dangled a tempting prize before them. Should they slay the humans along the shore and destroy the ports of Gwyneth? Bahal would reward them in a way Yasala could only dream about. For if they emerged victorious, Bahal had promised to sink the island. Gwyneth and the kingdom of Corwell itself would fall beneath the waves to become the permanent realm of the Sahuajin. The Earth Mother had reigned over the Moonshe Islands far longer than any of the men who had made their homes there. Even the graceful Luir, the elves who had once claimed the islands as their own, had come to a land where the goddess already ruled unchallenged. In those decades and centuries, she had witnessed the birth of creatures misformed by genetic accident. She had beheld the cruel ravages of disease, often deforming and crippling the animals that roamed her lands. All too often, she had been forced to bear the scars of war, the cruelest of such crimes, for it was the most avoidable. Her forests had burned. Whole villages had fallen to the sword or the axe or the fiery magic of evil sorcery but never had she witnessed a greater blasphemy than the children of Behal. Their very existence was a challenge to the balance, and their birth, wrought by the magic of the dark well, was a challenge to her soul. She looked upon all the creatures of the Isles as her offspring, and this compounded the outrage. Perhaps her heart bled most bitterly for the fate of the great brown bear. Grunt had been a faithful servant and protector of Jenna Moonsinger for a very long time, measured in human terms, and the destruction of the bear and his subsequent perversion into a thing of evil were the cruelest cuts of all. But all her knowledge, awareness and outrage, slowly faded as her weakness grew. A blackness, the expanding void of death, surrounded her. And then she knew no more. Chapter 4 On Wings of Wind 
recoiling in shock and grief. Anger would not come until later. Robin stumbled back to her room. There she took refuge in the scrolls of Arcanus. Burying herself in these talismans of faith, she sought an answer that did not exist. A tiny voice cried within her, Why? Why would he betray me thus? And then the plaintive voice vanished beneath the din of cold anger. Her rage swelled inside of her like an unnatural poison, hurting her, but also directing a fiery scorn toward the young king who, hours earlier, had claimed her love. Robin's door thumped beneath a persistent pounding, and she vaguely realized that Tristan stood without, calling her name. She made no reply, and after a while he went away, allowing her to return to the scrolls. Each was a sheet of frail parchment, inscribed at the top with a stylized rune depicting a blossoming rose within the circle of a blazing sun. The parchment, curled of its own will, shaped by long storage within the tube, each was covered with strange runes, symbols Robin had never seen before. All of the scrolls bore a similar border. Inscribed in green ink, faded to a dull brown. Delicate tracings outlined the thorny stems of roses, framing each page. The stems encircled a vivid image of the sun in each corner, then came together in an involved depiction of the rose blossom itself at the top center of the parchment. The druid dropped her eyes to the writing on the page. The rune seemed to dance and waver before her gaze. Her vision blurred, and a dull ache throbbed in her forehead, but she held to her scrutiny. The pounding in her head grew to a roar, and the rune seemed to twist all over the page, as if attempting to evade her. Gradually, by the force of her will, she began to bend the text to her understanding. The shivering of the runes ceased, and each lay flat and motionless on the page, like a normal inscription. The pounding in her head diminished, and as it did, the runes became visible as symbols, and then the meaning of those symbols became clear. As she read, she learned secrets deeper than any she had imagined. The scrolls were exquisitely preserved, but incredibly ancient. She was certain they predated even the age of Simmer Q, before the very earliest era of the Fafolk. I believed that you, Tristan Kendrick, would be a leader as great as Simmer Q. You would unite the Fafolk, I thought. You would be the light that would drive evil from our lands. How could you fail me so? The first of the scrolls told her of the gods of the plains and the delicate harmony of power that ebbed and waned between good and evil, law and chaos. She saw her own druidic doctrine of the balance reflected in this struggle and sensed that the message of the new gods was not so very different from her own faith in the goddess Earth Mother. Where she had long known of the four elements, water, earth, fire, and air, the scrolls promised secrets of wind and stone, ocean and flame. The writing on the scrolls was clerical in nature, strange to her eyes. Some of the symbols, those in which she sensed the greatest power, still hurt her eyes as she beheld them. Some mighty enchantment lurked within these runes. But she forced herself to overcome the pain and discomfort. If she had been weaker... The symbols might have blinded her or driven her mad. But her discipline was such that she bent the power of the scrolls to her will and mastered them. Instead of a threat, the scrolls became a source of spiritual nourishment and growth. How I wanted to bear your child. Our child. He would have been so strong. He would have been so wise. We could have done so much together, you and I, 
how could you betray me? The next of the scrolls held the tale of the elements and told how the gods had used them in the creation of the realms. Prime among them rolled the great mass of the sea. Eternal, imperturbable, unchanging, the sea had marked the boundaries of the world since the dawn of time. Holding fast to the slender page of the scroll, Robin came to know the gods as beings of and from the sea, forces whose original essence was the vastness of the oceans. You, too, could have been a force of primordial power, Tristan. Your mark could have been as vast as the ocean. Your power with me at your side would have run as deep. Your legacy have been as eternal as the sea itself. Then she took up the parchment that told of the secrets of stone. She read of the lands rising, bleak and lifeless yet solid and firm, from the bosom of the sea. Thus were the realms born, and their earth made the foundation for all that would follow. Stone was the flesh of the world, and in this secret, and the mastery of stone promised by the scroll, she began to sense a hope for her fellow druids. You were my foundation, my rock. You were the firmament upon which I rested my hopes, not just for us and ours, but for the land and peoples of the isles. You could have been the unshakable base for generations of growth and peace and progress. The following scroll told the story of fire. Fire, hot to the touch, killing and cleansing in its heat. Fire was the forge of the world, the spark from which emerged all the multitude of life that came to live upon the isles, and the heat of passion that burns within that life. How could that fire consume you so easily? How could you be so weak? And last, she read the tale of wind, the breath that gave life to the world. Vitality came to all things through the wind, she learned. Even the plants breathed, and air was the vessel that brought health to life and carried waste and corruption away. Wind so tenuous and untouchable, yet so pervasive and strong. Without the air that was its medium, nothing could live. Was our love so tenuous, so weak? Could you be so frail that the touch of a strange woman's hand was enough to draw you from me? Is holding you like holding the air? You are here when I breathe. But gone as the breath leaves my body? As dawn colored the eastern sky, her grief dimmed, only to be replaced by the cold fire of anger. She confronted the reality of Tristan's betrayal, and she found she could not forgive him. She did not see the ore that shimmered around her as she stood. Her body thrummed with power. The enchantment of the scrolls possessed her soul. Her flesh became the earth, her blood the water. The fire of anger burned brightly in her soul as she stood before the window, looking eastward toward distant Mirlock Vale. There, awaiting their rescue, stood her druids. She no longer needed the help of a sword at her side, especially one held by so fickle a hand as that of her king. The power burned within her, and she stepped through the window, high above the courtyard, to go to the rescue of her clan. With a puff of air she was gone, her body disappearing even before it began to fall. A gust burst from Care Corwell, racing eastward toward the vale as Robin, druid of Gwyneth, became the wind. Once again the vulture rose above Ker Corwell, this time soaring away from the sea. The bird's bright eyes searched eastward for the darkness upon the land that was its destination. For two days the bird flew, 
never tiring, until it passed above the reaches of desolation and blackness that marked its goal. Jenna the Druid, but also Kazgroth, the minion of Bahal, arrived at her master's lair in the dark well. Her body shifted easily back to that of the Druid, and she quietly informed her master that her task was done. Tristan stormed back to his room. Robin had not acknowledged his knock, and now all his shame, all his frustration, became anger directed at the woman who, he felt, had brought this upon him. He crashed through his door, ready to strike her or kick her. He would drive her from his castle. But she was already gone. He sat numbly upon his bed. The haze of drink had fallen from his brain, and now he thought about the woman. It didn't strike him as odd that he had never seen her before. Even as prince, he had never traveled across all of Corwell. Yet she had seemed to know him, and the effect of her eyes and her body upon him had been like a powerful drug. Slowly, he convinced himself of a lie that she had bewitched him somehow into betraying his beloved. His mind would not accept the reality, that the betrayal occurred because his own will was weak. He thought of the celebration still proceeding in the hall. As midnight approached, the revelry would be reaching its height. The bitter knowledge of his shame held him to a seat. He could not bear the looks that would fall upon him from his friends, his subjects. Dareth's burning look of accusation as he had left the hall came unbidden into his mind's eye. The longer he sat and brooded, the blacker his mood became. He leaped to his feet and paced the length of the large bedroom, raging silently. He would make it up to Robin, he vowed. He would go to Mirlock Vale and confront the evil there with the sword of Simric Hugh. Then she would know the depths of his love for her. Somehow, this made his shame bearable. He walked from the room, passing slowly by Robin's door. Tempted to knock, instead he listened softly for a moment, but heard nothing. Then he went down the wide stairway and re-entered the great hall. Tavish still played her lute, and most of those present sat quietly, enthralled by a ballad of young lovers. Carefully, the king returned to the head table. The others turned as he sat. Paldo quickly avoided his gaze, and he saw the look of disappointment, even anger on Dareth's face. More annoying to him was the leer of amusement with which Ponswain regarded him. Grunark the Red smiled pleasantly, apparently unaware of anything untoward. The king looked boldly at his companions, but he felt the red blush of his shame rise into his face. Never mind. His friends would forgive him when he explained his plan of action, and Tristan cared very little what Ponswain thought. Tavish returned to the table as Tristan leaned forward to speak to his friends gathered at the table. The folk at the other tables paid no attention as they joined again in their own conversations. He saw no sign of the red-headed woman, and for this he felt great relief. In the morning, Robin and I embark for Mirlock Vale. There we will confront this foul cleric and destroy him. And when we return, the celebration can truly begin. Dareth's eyebrows rose in surprise, but his face remained masked by a scowl. Paldo nodded, and Tavish, who arrived at the table as he made his announcement, beamed. This time I'll be there with you, declared the bard. There'll be a song in this that'll last for the ages, to be sure. I, too, shall place my axe at your side, declared Grunark solemnly, surprising the young king. Thank you, Grunark, 
but I cannot, will not, ask you to accompany us on this mission. We will fight a battle for Corwell's heart, but it is a battle that must be waged by the Fafolk. The Red King scowled, and Tristan wondered if he had offended his guest. There is a greater task you can perform, Grunark, if I can ask it of you. He hastened to continue. Can you go to your people and tell them of our peace? Tell them that the time of war between Fafolk and Northman is over. That is no task for a fighting king. Perhaps not. But I ask you, can you do it? The enemies of our islands lie not just in the heartland of Gwyneth. The Sahuagin who attacked our ships are ample proof of that. Carry the word of our alliance to your people, and we can unite in a common strength that will defeat all of our foes. Grunark looked skeptical, but held his peace. I will need to leave the castle's administration in your hands a little longer, Tristan went on, turning to Randolph. I will come with you, announced Dareth, though the black look remained on his face. Someone will have to keep you two alive, grumbled Paldo. As usual, it might as well be me. Tristan felt a burst of relief as his two old comrades declared their intentions. He had not previously realized how much their support meant to him. The memory of his shame fell to the rear of his thoughts now, as planning for the expedition accelerated. But then he noticed the crown of the isles gleaming in its place at the center of the table, where he had placed it at the start of the banquet. Its purity seemed to mock him its brightness causing a physical pain to his eyes. Impulsively, he stood up. As long as the scourge of evil marks our island, my kingship shall not truly begin, he announced to the guests at large, noticing the sudden hush that fell across the room. I shall leave the crown, the symbol of my past victories, here at Corwell, awaiting my triumphant return. Then, and only then, it shall be placed upon my brow in my own castle, and here before you all I shall take my place as High King of the Fafolk. A thunderous volley of applause exploded from the people, warming the king and seeming to wash his guilt away. That would truly be a grand event, he imagined, with Robin at his side, and evil vanquished from the land. In the excitement, he failed to notice Tavish's look of alarm following his announcement. She studied the crown with concern, then looked back to the king. She admired and even loved him, but now she feared he was embarking on an act of folly. Tristan sat again, and planning for the excursion continued. Tavish, he learned, had returned to Corwell upon the king's powerful stallion Avalon from the stable at King's Bay, where Tristan had left him months earlier. His spirits rose still further at the knowledge that this sturdy steed would carry him into the Vale. Finally, the details had all been addressed. The revelers had left the hall. Virtually forgotten was his momentary dalliance with the red-headed woman. Perhaps it had all been a dream. Certainly it seemed logical that Robin would have forgotten about it as well. He had managed to convince himself of this. At dawn, he climbed the stairs to the living quarters. Before retiring, he would tell Robin of their plans. She would be delighted, he knew. But again there was no answer, and a sick feeling of worry gripped him. In panic, he smashed the door with his shoulder and then kicked it aside with his boot. He stumbled into her room, looking frantically around. He saw her window standing open, with its airy view high above the courtyard. But the druid, 
together with her staff and scrolls, was gone. The druid, in fact, currently relished a form of freedom she had never before imagined. As the wind, she gusted and eddied, sailed and then slowed. She felt a great expansiveness, freed from the cloak of flesh. Her senses probed everywhere, pulling in the touch and sight and smell of the world. For a long day and through the following night, she blew, caring little for the passing of time. Fatigue was a thing unimaginable. The moors rolled past, and she dallied and swirled in the foothills below the highlands. She paused at a tiny cantrive, and even the wood smoke of breakfast fires tickled her nostrils with a delightful odor. The white ribbon of Corwell Road meandered below her as she swirled toward the center of Gwyneth Island. Finally, she judged the time had come to turn northward, toward Mirlock Vale. The power of the scroll possessed her completely. The words, runes actually, had been vibrant with power. Now that magic, sanctified by the gods in a time long past, became Robin's tool. She used it with skill and vigor, becoming a new element in pursuit of her goal. She hurled herself at the highlands, storming up a vale, roaring through a narrow defile. Now Robin was a wind of storm, gathering strength as she rose into the chill, barren reaches. The forested hills of Corwell still glowed green, as the fir trees cloaking them retained their foliage even after the approach of winter. She sensed little wildlife, as the deer and badger and rabbit had all migrated to the lower reaches for the cold season. As she rose higher, the trees gave way to rocky, barren slopes. Great patches of snow lay in drifts along many of the ridges. Deep ravines fell into chasms, and then valleys that trailed to the warm, green country behind. She did not sense the waning of her enchantment, but the spell had begun to lose its potency. Though mighty, it could last for but a limited time. Snowflakes pranced around her as she crested the great ridge, the summit that separated the human realms of Corwell from the wilderness of Mirlock Vale. And here the storm broke into chaos. Robin crashed into a barrier of evil so potent, so pervasive, that her soaring momentum vanished into nothingness. Where the land behind her had been clean and healthful, full of nature's vitality, she recoiled now, faced with a vision of death, decay, and corruption. The devastation began at the crest and trailed into the vastness of Mirlock Vale. Even Mirlock itself, a great lake of crystalline azure, in Robin's mind, had succumbed to the rot. Visible in the distance to the north, it was now dark and dull, the water seeming more a stretch of brackish swamp than a vast loch. The forest around it now sprawled lifeless, barren skeletons of trees rising forlornly from blackened ground. The magic that had carried her thus far vanished in the face of a far stronger and more immediate power. In the flash of that instant, Robin's body became flesh. She crashed among the rocks at the crest of the highest peak and lay there stunned, shivering and bleeding. But the worst injury had been inflicted upon her soul. The desecration of so vast an area and the totality of the destruction tore at every fiber of her faith. How could she cope with power such as this? Dimly she realized that her arm lay behind her, twisted at an unnatural angle by jagged rocks. She shifted slightly, and pain knifed through her shoulder. The immediacy of her suffering brought her attention back to her own predicament. She sat up, wincing in pain, 
and knew that her arm was broken, probably in several places. Her lips and mouth were swollen and bleeding. She spat, and several chips of teeth fell onto the rocks. As she looked up, the expanse of the veil again came before her vision, and she moaned with despair. The cold wind, an inanimate thing now, pulled at her torn robe, sucking the heat from her exposed skin. Now flakes of snow swirled around her, stinging the scraped skin along her face and cheeks. Mother, I have failed you, she thought in despair. She did not know if she spoke to her spiritual mother, the goddess, mother of all the isles, or to her true mother, the druid she had never known. It didn't matter, really. I shall die on this rock. My anger has sent me on a fool's quest, but must the punishment be so harsh? Slowly the pain disappeared from most of her body, though her arm and shoulder continued to throb. Was the chill numbing her senses, or had the pain indeed eased? She twisted again among the rocks, trying to avoid a root she felt jabbing into her back, and then her mind began to work. There could be no root where there were no plants. The plainly wooden surface annoying her must be something else. Biting her lip to keep from crying out, she turned to see her staff pinned between two rocks. Awkwardly, with her good hand, she pulled it out and laid it across her lap. She had no strength to call for its magic, but its mere presence comforted her nonetheless. Another unnatural thing caught her eye, and she gasped with relief as she saw the ivory tube containing the scrolls of Arcanus. The container lay below her feet, in a shadowy crack beneath an overhanging boulder. With relief, she confirmed that she had carried her talismans with her. The accoutrements of faith brought hope back once again. Perhaps she would not die here. It would take more than a few bruises to break the will of a druid of the veil. She closed her eyes and slowly, carefully, rehearsed the words to a simple spell. She was weak, and her mouth was wounded. She could not take a chance on misstating the incantation. Matro... Carlius Doniti Arum. She whispered the words to her spell, and the healing magic spread through her shoulder, into the length of her arm. She felt the torn muscles mend, and even sensed the bonding as the shattered ends of bone fused again into one. For precious seconds, the curing spell tingled within her. But then the magic faded dying away in a last flutter of healing. She grew weak and dizzy, finally slumping against her rocky seat. For a moment, her world went black, and then she awakened with a start. She moved her arm experimentally, and pain again lanced through her shoulder. But it was more bearable now, and the arm answered the commands of her brain in its movement, however begrudgingly. The healing spell of a druid was not potent, but it did help. And after a brief period of prayer, she could use it again. Closing her eyes and forcing herself to ignore her pain, Robin relaxed. The familiar sensation of peace came over her, and she called upon the mother to restore her spell to her. She awaited the smooth flow of power that would be the answer to her prayer but there was nothing. Again, and a third time, she prayed for her spell, but she could get no response from her goddess. A chill sensation of fright and loneliness closed about her, and she found it impossible to concentrate any longer on prayer. Grim and afraid, she tried to move. She found that she could stand up and did so, 
Carefully lifting the scrolls, she looked for a pouch or pocket in which to place them. Settling for her apron, Robin carefully wrapped the tube in cloth, binding it against her back. She found that she had on the garments she wore at the time of her casting, robe, apron, belt, and boots, along with her staff and scrolls. But nothing else. She had neither flint to spark a fire, nor dagger to strike it on. Her clothing was woefully inadequate to face a chill night, even when not spent atop a craggy, snow-swept peak. She turned, once, to look at the rolling foothills to the south, falling away to the green moors of central Corwell. The sun still beamed there, dancing among white clouds, to illuminate a low hill, or small copse of brilliant oak, blazing with the colors of late autumn. But overhead roiled heavier, more ominous clouds. The snow became thicker by the minute, and soon began to gather in the cracks among the broken rocks. The clouds lay like a leaden quilt across the breadth of the vale, casting the huge valley in a pall of shadow. Though the snow seemed to be falling only among the highest mountains, Robin could see no sign of encouragement or comfort in the entire brooding vista. Struck by a thought, she looked in the scroll tube for the parchment of wind mastery. But it was not there. She was not surprised, for she knew that a druidic spell written upon a scroll would vanish as soon as it was cast. She suspected that the clerical spells worked the same. But there were other ways to travel, and many of them did not require her to walk down the side of this mountain. Once she had flown from Gwyneth to Caladir in the body of a hawk, and she could certainly cross a narrow band of foothills in the same form. She closed her eyes, calling the bird-like image into her mind, preparing for the familiar shifting of her form. And then a blinding pain flashed behind her eyes, and she sat heavily upon the jagged rocks. Reaching to either side, she balanced herself upon her hands, not wings as she had expected, and opened her eyes. The same weakness that had caused her to faint after casting the healing spell drained her muscles of strength and caused her head to spin. For an awful moment, she felt a horrible surge of panic rising in her stomach. What had happened to her powers? She shook her head, banishing the fear, and sought a logical explanation. It must be fatigue, she told herself, the weakness caused by her wounds and her lack of sleep. Certainly it would pass. Resolutely, she started toward the north on foot, holding her staff in her right hand as an aid to balance among the treacherous rocks she started down the long shoulder of the mountain. For an hour or more, she made steady progress. The walking warmed her body, and all her attention was focused on the placement of the next step. She had no time to brood about her surroundings or her plight. The steep ridge led to a broad shoulder. The air felt noticeably warmer here, and the snow had nearly stopped. She looked into the gray clouds surrounding her and imagined that she saw all manner of hideous, deformed figures there. Suddenly she stopped in shock. Something had moved within those looming clouds. She saw it again. A vague shape that soared through a thinning of the mist, only to disappear again within the folds of the cloud. It could have been a great bird or something else. Whatever its nature, it looked to be nearly the size of a man. Nervously, she tightened her grip on her staff. By instinct, she probed with her feet, finding a broad, flat slab to provide a secure foothold. All the while, her eyes searched the clouds on all sides and above her. For many minutes... She stood alert, 
unmoving except to roll her head to look everywhere. But she saw nothing, nothing except the vastness of suddenly threatening nature. Her feet began to ache from the chill of inaction, and she started to descend again. Robin moved more carefully now, cautiously planting each foot on the broken ground and then searching the skies for the hidden threat. The length of the broad shoulder behind her, she once again confronted a steeply descending ridge. She slid along a knife's edge of stone, ignoring the dizzying drop on either side. She saw two tiny lakes below her, one to the south, lay beneath a white sheet of ice covered by a thin layer of snow. A dusting covered the lake's small basin, only the larger jumbles of rocks poking through as proof of solid firmament below. The other lake lay to the north, just beyond the narrow gap in the crest that marked the border between Corwell and the Vale. Here no ice had formed, and no snow remained on the ground. The rocks of the valley floor were rounded and worn, a dark gray shade. The water itself festered in choking weeds. Patches of scum floated on the surface among the brownish-green tendrils of algae. Robin reached a sharp drop. She looked at a wide ledge twenty feet below and considered jumping. The alternative was to turn and face the rock, working her way carefully down one of the wide cracks in the stone face. At the same time, she would leave herself terribly exposed to any menace from the sky. She looked again at the drop and realized that a slight miscalculation in her jump would plummet her to certain death, off one side of the ridge or the other. The clouds still oppressed her, but her descent had carried her far below the heavy gray mass. She stared intently for minutes, but saw nothing moving among them. Tucking the staff across her belt and lashing it in place with the apron, she turned to face the rock and climbed over the edge. A small fisher gave her a toehold, and she reached down to grab a spur of stone with her hand. She lowered her other foot and wedged it between two outcroppings of rock. And then she felt a presence behind her. Instantly she let go of the rock, dropping free at the first prickling of alarm. Thumping to the ledge, she fell to the side to absorb the force of her fall and then whirl to stare upward. Suddenly a creature crashed into the wall where her back had been. She heard a cracking of bone as the thing, eerily silent, fell beside her. She dared not look at it as she desperately tore her staff from her back and climbed to her feet, scanning the skies for any other attackers. Her timely drop had saved her life, for the thing would have smashed her body brutally if she had remained on the cliff. But what was it? The limp body sprawled beside her, issuing a heavy stench of rot and corruption. She felt her eyes drawn toward the corpse, but then another flash of movement in the sky drew her full attention. She saw another of the things. It looked like a great bird diving from the clouds, with a third plummeting behind it. Now the staff was free, held in both hands before her, as she stared in disbelief and then revulsion at the soaring creature's. They came soundlessly, their mouths gaping. Their heads were skeletal, but unmistakably the skulls of deer. And the broad, menacing antlers spreading above the head of each confirmed the monster's stag-like origins. But the body was feathered and gaunt like some huge vulture, and each of them swooped like a hawk, still making no sound. Robin could now see the sharp, wolfish fangs that filled each hungry maw. 
The things came closer, straight at her face, and she swung the staff with all the force her weary body could gather. The stout shaft cracked against the first monster's head, knocking it aside, but the force of the blow nearly knocked Robin off her feet. Instantly, the second of the things struck her. She brought the staff up and felt the shaft crunch into its feathered body as those awful antlers sliced her face and forced her back against the cliff face. The creature's teeth tore at her breast, and she forced the staff against the thing's throat as blood from a slash on her forehead dripped into her eyes. The creature snapped at her again, but she pushed it away. The monster had black, soulless eyes, or maybe they were just empty sockets, staring from that rotted skull. Robin could not be sure. The teeth snapped again at her left breast. Suddenly, she was acutely conscious of her pounding heart, thumping almost audibly from her exertions. The beast lunged forward again, and this time she crushed its throat with the force of her resistance, and she understood its lust as it died. It hungered for her heart. The body fell lifeless at her feet, and she stumbled back in horror as she saw the beast clearly for the first time. The stag skull, framed by a proud rack of antlers, could have been taken from the body of a deer and transplanted onto the headless corpse of a great eagle for all its gory looks. But the thing had lived, and one other, at least, still did. The first monster, the one she had clubbed aside with her staff, suddenly swept upward from the valley. It had taken a long dive, but now it attacked with undiminished fury. Robin, through a bloody haze, saw it coming and staggered to the edge of the ledge. She could barely raise her staff, and the creature was soaring toward her with savage momentum. In that instant, she realized the futility of further combat. If she stayed to fight this thing, she would die, for she had no more strength. In that same instant, she fell back upon her faith and her skill. If her magic failed her now, she would be dead. The monster raced toward her. Its wicked antlers spread like a score of lances. But Robin no longer stood before the attacker. Instead, she dropped to all four of her feet and scuttled toward a crack in the rock. Her tail whisked out of sight as the creature thumped into the rock wall. Her tiny heart pounded many times a second as she turned to stare anxiously from her sheltered niche. She chittered and chirped nervously, unable to restrain her invective. The monster landed outside and slashed at the crack with its crooked claws. But the fury marmot that was Robin of Gwyneth drew farther back in the cave and chattered an angry challenge. The great unicorn trotted across the wasteland, his white head held high. His ivory horn rose in apparent challenge to any minion of horror that might arise before him. And indeed, Cameron would have relished the death of any of the servants of evil who now defiled his home. For ten days he had lived among the desolation of the Vale, slaying the living carrion that served the cleric of the Darkwell. Once the unicorn had discovered and fought a hideous flying creature, a cross between hawk and stag. The thing was incredibly evil, but it had flown away before Cameron could slay it. Through those ten days, he had wandered around the breadth of Mirlock, watching the great lake die. The desolation had spread quickly, and now he could only feel a hopeless sense of defeat. Cameron was only an animal, but an animal of such intelligence as to make normal human intellect dim in comparison. To him, the fate of the world was now obvious, 
writ upon the face of Mirlock Vale. This blackness and death would claim all. Abruptly, the unicorn halted in his tracks. He lifted his head even higher, flexing his pink nostrils in the fetid air. Though no odor nor sound reached him, he sensed a message. Or was it a cry for help? His broad heart quickened as he felt the gentle tug upon his spirit once again. The mother called him. He could not know that the goddess lay inert within the earth, paralyzed by the blackness, nor that the call came not from her but from a druid of great faith in dire danger. But he recognized the summons and the command. With a mighty bound, he galloped off in a new direction, thundering across the dead ground. A streak of white across a landscape of unbroken black, he raced to answer the call to his soul. Chapter 5 Into the Darkness Tristan opened the chest, and immediately the musty smell washed over him with memories of his father. He inhaled slowly, cherishing those remembrances in a way he had never cherished his father while he lived. Then he shook off his reminiscence and reached into the large trunk. The silver chain mail gleamed untarnished, as if he had put it there yesterday. In reality, the armor had lain here undisturbed since the end of the Darkwalker War more than a year earlier. He lifted the shirt of mail, noticing again the lightness of the metal, the unblemished nature of the craftsmanship. Yet experience had shown him the strength of the armor. It had saved his life more than once. And it would do so again, staying with him as trusted protection. Not like his companions. Damn them. Not like Dareth. The Kalashite had not spoken to him all morning as he went about his own preparations with surely concentration. Even Paldo was subdued. Of course, they all worried about Robin, as did he. But they would find her, rescue her. Tristan knew that they would. He raised the legacy of his father over his shoulders and felt its solid weight come to rest upon his frame. The armor felt good, a solid cloak protecting him from the deadly assaults of his enemies. Would that it offered the same protection from the pain emanating from his own heart? Angrily he shook off the thought. Guilt was for the weaklings. He stalked through the castle, down the stairs and out the doors, then across the courtyard to the stable. There he found Avalon. The great stallion whinnied a soft greeting. The steed had been well cared for. As he threw the heavy saddle across the stallion's back, the king saw that Avalon's snowy white coat gleamed and his nostrils flared with eagerness as if he sensed impending adventure. He pranced anxiously as Tristan cinched the saddle and loaded his few provisions into panniers. He only vaguely noticed Tavish and Paldo preparing their own mounts, a gelding and a small pony elsewhere in the stable. Paldo was well outfitted for travel and adventure, with sturdy leather garments and his trusty sword. Tavish had borrowed a short sword from the castle weapons room. She had it strapped to her saddle so she could carry her loot. Her saddlebags bulged with a variety of foods and several skins of strong wine. Newt and Yazili Click buzzed around anxiously. Both the fairy creatures were eager to return to Mirlock Vale, but the sprite's natural shyness prevented him from talking when everyone else remained silent. Noticing the difficulties Tavish had with packing her ample provisions, however, the sprite offered his aid. The bard finally saddled him with a wineskin. The normally loquacious Newt seemed unusually subdued. 
This morning his scales were a sickly greenish color. He waited on one of the rafters in the stable until the others were ready, then buzzed down to ride on the horn of Tristan's saddle. Dareth already sat astride his chestnut mare, waiting for them in the courtyard with Canthus. His silver scimitar rested easily against his thigh. Dareth looked toward the gate, ignoring the rest of the party as they gathered in the courtyard. Tristan glanced awkwardly at the others when they gathered before the gate. They were all acutely aware of Robin's absence, he felt certain. His embarrassment caused his voice to grow harsh as they started out. Robin's gone. I'm certain she's headed for Mirlock Vale to the Grove of the Great Druid. We will follow and find her. He nudged Avalon with his knees, and the great stallion started into a brisk trot, passing through the gatehouse as the other companions fell in behind. Tristan unwillingly recalled in vivid detail the events of the previous night. How could he have hurt Robin like that? What could have gone through his mind? A part of him still wanted to claim that the woman had bewitched him somehow, used foul enchantment to beguile him with her charms, but he suspected that this was not the truth. Tristan remained constantly aware of Robin's absence, though he tried to ignore his role in her sudden departure. His father's chain-mail armor rested heavily on his shoulders, and he quickly grew saddle-sore. Nevertheless, he would find her. Of that, he was certain. The others could come with him or remain behind. He didn't really care. Now the north wind howled with the threat of approaching winter, but the lone longship of Grunark the Red sliced through each mountainous crest as if it could smell the security of its home port. Manned by thirty brawny northmen, several of whom Grunark had recruited in Corwell's taverns, and one whom he had liberated from the town jail, the sleek vessel raced northward. The sleek vessel raced northward. Hold steady, the king ordered his helmsman, as he made his way into the bow. The grey water rolled on all sides as far as he could see. Dusk settled over the Sea of Moonshay, and the Red King's thoughts turned to the cook fires of home, the great smoky council lodge near the shore, and the welcoming embrace of his woman. It would not be long before those things were his again, and this knowledge brought him a keen pleasure. Truly, homecoming was always sweet, but this one would be sweeter than most. Still his eyes fell, unbidden on the gray swells that slowly turned to black with a vanishing light. He recalled the Sahuagin that had boiled upward from the mysterious depths to claim the lives of so many of his countrymen. The fishmen still lurked down there, he knew. He couldn't be certain, but he suspected that their depredations were not finished. Grunark did not even suspect that the horrors of the Sahuagin had barely begun. The great dog led the way unerringly, selecting the easiest path up the rocky defile. Tristan followed, leading Avalon by the great stallion's bridle. The wind picked up, and he pulled his cloak tightly about him with his free hand. As they climbed through the foothills into the highlands, progress slowed for the first time in the four days of the journey. From his previous venture into Mirlock Vale, Tristan knew that this was the roughest part of the trip. Let's hunt some fur bulgs. The suggestion came from the back of Avalon's saddle, where Newt rested comfortably. Tristan ignored the fairy dragon, but the top popped from one of the saddlebags to reveal Yazili Click. Are you crazy? He stammered, his tiny antenna quivering in agitation. We we've got to find Robin, Robin. 
Well, maybe she's been captured by a furbolg. I mean, that's as likely as anything, if you ask. Shut up! Growled Tristan, whirling to face the dragon. Newt dropped his head and sulked as the king glared at him for a moment. Beyond the dragon, Tristan could see the figures of Tavish and Paldo, each leading a mount up the trail behind him. Dareth's tiny figure, occasionally disappearing around some bend in the trail, brought up the rear to guard against surprise. Or perhaps to avoid my presence, mumbled Tristan. In truth, the Kalashite had avoided his gaze and made no offer to converse with him. As they had made camp each of the last three nights, Dareth had found an excuse to wander away by himself, returning only after Tristan had retired. The bright sunlight of their journey thus far, even with its pale, wintry glow, had seemed to mock the king. The noble purpose of the quest seemed an empty memory now. Dareth should be helping me, offering me friendship and comfort. Damn him! He tried to avoid thinking about his own actions, but his mind was inexorably drawn to the fateful night of their homecoming. Robin's absence had surprised and mystified him, but he had suspected immediately that she had gone on to the Vale alone. How she had left her room without drawing attention he couldn't guess. But now she must certainly be in great danger, and he was equally aware that his own lack of faith had sent her away. He cringed inwardly at this awareness, but there was no other way to look at it. He had betrayed her. She could be killed, he hissed, shaking his head as to, to ward away the fear. He pushed himself harder, looking ahead to Campus. The great dog stood now at a narrow niche in a ridge at the top of this high valley. His sharp nose pointed into the wind. The moorhound gazed majestically into the valley beyond. There, Tristan knew, lay Mirlock Vale. There, too, would be Robin, or so he devoutly hoped. The marmot cowered within its niche, while the great predator, with apparently infinite patience, crouched just outside the crack. For three days it had remained motionless, like a statue of itself. But it still was there, waiting only for the appearance of its prey. The strain of the shape change had exhausted Robin so much that she had slept for a day and a half. Now, as she slowly regained her strength, she listened carefully. Robin's tiny ears, more keen than those of her human body, heard the steady thumping of the monstrous heart. The druid knew that she was trapped. Her ears were not keen enough to hear the distant clopping of hooves upon the rocks below. The monster could hear and see, however. Its vacant eyes stared at the muffled figures, four of them below. The humans led their horses and were preceded by a great dog. The periton watched them make their way through a high pass and descend into the broadening valley beyond. The periton twitched anxiously, shaking its broad antlers. The commands of its maker had been clear. Guard the veil. Attack strangers. Report large groups of intruders. But now it had a dual task, for was it not still engaged in the attacking of the stranger now trapped in the cave? Yet these were intruders below, as well, and didn't their numbers make them the greater threat? But the prey in the trap was an intruder close at hand, and as is the way of stupid beasts to the periton, the thing close at hand was the most important thing. So the monster kept its watch upon the tiny marmot, for sooner or later the creature would need to emerge and eat. And all the while the four intruders, with their horses and dog, grew smaller and smaller in the north. 
Robin's senses had a new aspect now. She was no longer crippled with fear. Her wounds over the past three days of enforced rest had healed. She was hungry and eager to proceed with her mission. Now the fear of the monster that had driven her into the tiny cave was gone, replaced by an angry flame that slowly grew into a crackling rage. She reached a decision easily. Once she had decided to escape, she was satisfied. All that she needed now was a plan. She would attack the thing and drive it from her doorstep. First, though, she would need a new body. She considered the limitations of her cave, with an entrance less than a foot high and little wider. She would have to emerge with a small body, but one that was powerful and tough, equipped with weapons that could slay the hideous creature that lay in wait. She thought of the body of a great wolf, but she immediately discarded it as too large for the cave entrance. Then she considered that of a scaly serpent, but she realized that the cold weather would make her slow and lethargic. And then she thought of the creature she would become, and as quickly as she thought, she shifted. Her body crouched into the rodent's posture, but grew longer and broader. Her back widened, but did not rise much higher than the marmots. Her tiny claws, however, stretched and grew hooked until they rested on the rocky floor, several inches ahead of her four paws. Her muzzle grew until wicked fangs protruded from her curling lip. Her heartbeat slowed as that muscle grew to accommodate the larger body, and her black eyes took on a reddish cast. The growl that rumbled unconsciously from her chest could never have been uttered by a marmot. But the marmot had become a wolverine. Robin flexed her powerful rear legs and slipped through the cave entrance with a single fluid motion. The monster leaped backward, flapping its great wings in surprise. Its ghastly mouth gaped in rage, and it hissed a challenge. The wolverine's forepaws reached out and clutched the thing's body in a steely embrace. Robin's teeth sought its throat, and only the monster's desperate twisting prevented her from administrating a fatal bite. The creature tumbled backward as the wolverine clung tightly to its breast. Her rear legs flexed and kicked as Robin used those sharp claws in an effort to disembowel her opponent. All the while, ignoring the pounding of its wings against her head. All of a sudden, the creature's twisting evasion took them over the ledge. Robin felt them both falling, bouncing against the rocky cliff. But now her animal instincts, instincts among the most savage in the natural world, compelled her to cling to her victim tenaciously. This tenacity saved her life as they suddenly crashed into the ground and she felt the creature's body break beneath her. The frenzy of the wolverine's attack did not abate, however. Robin slashed and bit and growled until the remains of the unnatural monster had been torn into shreds. Feathers covered a circle ten feet wide and bits of cracked bone lay scattered over a similar distance. In the center of the circle, only the stag-like head, lying flat on the ground with its antlers spreading tree-like above, remained as mute evidence of the beast's nature. Finally, her rage faded. Though Robin, still cloaked in the body of the wolverine, paced restlessly around the remains of her foe for some time. Every so often, she paused and glared at the sky, as if challenging another of the creatures to attack. Eventually, she sat up on her haunches and tried to concentrate to call up an image of her own human body. For several minutes, her mind whirled with a confused blur of pictures, none of them familiar. She found her attention wandering to thoughts of food. Instinctively, she growled, and the sound shocked her back to awareness. I must think. I must shift. Now. A deep 
fear began to grow within her. Perhaps she had waited too long. Perhaps her powers had waned too much for her to change back. With a desperate strain, she pictured herself and called upon all the spiritual power gathered in her tiny muscular form. The world spun around her, and she gasped for air, feeling her windpipe contract. A sickening sense of nausea rose in her stomach, and then she lost consciousness. Robin awakened some time later. Dehydration swelled her tongue, and her lips cracked painfully as she struggled to open her mouth. But it was a human mouth, and a human tongue. Still, a great sense of lethargy lay upon her, as if the effort of the shape changing had drained more of her strength than she had to give. She sat weakly on the rocky ground as her world spun madly. Mother, what is happening to me? Where are you? But as before, when she had tried to pray, there was no answer to her question. It took her several minutes to regain her strength. She noticed a gnawing ache in her stomach and realized with chagrin that she had neglected to bring any food with her. Nor had she brought a bedroll or a water skin or any of the other equipment that was necessary to this mission in her human body. Somehow, she had felt that she could reach the well and work her magic in the form of the wind with no mortal accoutrements. Softly, she cursed her lack of foresight. Then she took up her staff and scrolls, which had made the shift with her, and looked around. She had tumbled nearly to the foot of the mountain during the course of the fight. The path before her, to the north, now curved gently along a sloping ridge. She started walking, and the movement swiftly drove the stiffness from her muscles. In an hour, she had entered the low country, following the vestiges of a trail that had once been pastoral. Now it twisted toward the blackened trunks of dead, rotting trees. A fetid odor of decay arose from the land itself, and Robin pulled her apron across her face. Even this could not dampen the pervasive stink. She paused at the edge of the forest, but she knew that this was the path through Mirlock Vale, to the grove of the great druid. She took several deep breaths, as if sensing she breathed the cleanest air she would taste for many days. Then, shouldering her staff, she spoke a quiet prayer to her goddess. Like the others, the prayer went unanswered. Nevertheless, she stepped forward resolutely and entered the dead forest. A padded foot, as broad as a bear's, fell softly on a pile of dried dead moss, yet no sound emerged. Another paw, identical to the first, reached forward to pull the sleek body along. The rear feet, when they moved in turn, fell exactly in the soundless prints of the forefeet. Above all was blackness, except for the yellow slits in the creature's eyes. Should any moonlight have broken through the midnight clouds, an observer could have seen the long, curving teeth exposed by the widespread jaws. One could have marveled at the liquid muscle rippling below the sleek black hide, or shuddered at the ghastly tentacles protruding from the creature's shoulders. Shantu, the displacer beast, moved to the hunt. Shantu did not hunt from hunger, at least not from the desire to fill its belly. Shantu's hunger was of another kind. It was the lust of fresh blood to cool its tongue, for the soothing death cry of a victim to ring musically in its ears. It was spiritual, for Shantu longed for the feel of a warm body growing cold in its mouth, to drive the breath of life from a living creature. Shantu was not hungry for food, but for death. And now, patiently, with complete silence and stealth, 
the displacer beast moved through the deadness of Mirlock Vale. It sought anything alive. Anything that held that spark that would give the beast sustenance in its extinguishing. And so the displacer beast crept through the night, looking for something to kill. We'll stop at the first good camping place, Tristan announced. The party had drawn together as darkness closed in, and now Tavish and Paldo stood beside him as they rested. Dareth stood, almost invisible in the dusk, a few feet away, ostensibly observing the trail behind them. I wish you guys could see in the dark. I'm not tired yet, Newt declared his disappointment loudly. Be quiet hissed the High King, looking into the dead woods around them. They had left the rocky highlands behind, but this forest of rotted trunks seemed even more barren. Start looking for a place to camp, and another thing, there'll be no fire tonight. This is still high country, argued Paldo. We'll freeze without a fire. The halfling huddled on his pony, a picture of discomfort and misery. Tristan ignored him, turning back to the trail. He was riding Avalon now. They had all remounted beyond the high valleys, but he realized the futility of blundering on in the utter darkness that would soon descend. There's a grove of sorts, announced Tavish, pointing to a stand of dead pines as her gelding skittered nervously to the side. The towering skeletal trees offered better shelter and softer bedding than the rocky ground, so they entered the grove and prepared to make camp. Unsaddling Avalon and watching the darkness close upon their camp, Tristan felt a sense of aloneness around him. The nearest community he knew lay beyond the rocky highlands two days hence. Where are you, Robin? His mind voiced the question that possessed him. His throat tightened and he shook his head angrily, but though he struggled to overlook his own role in the druid's flight, guilt soon rode roughshod over his feelings. And following the guilt came self-pity, and then the anger he directed at his companions. Damn! He cursed at the darkness. He tried unsuccessfully to shake off his mood as he joined his companions over their cold bread and cheese. We'll have to send watches. I'll take the mid-watch. Tristan grabbed a large chunk of dark bread and chewed angrily. Have some wine offered the bard, and the king gratefully took the wineskin. I'll take the first watch, Dareth said as he finally entered the camp. And the morning watch for me will let the halfling sleep in, piped the bard, chuckling. I can stand watch too. How come I never get a turn? Newt was indignant. I can see in the dark better than any of you. Take the morning watch with me. I could use the extra pair of eyes. Tavish tried to humor the dragon, and Newt, satisfied, curled up to sleep. I can't b believe this is Mirlock Vale, Vale. Yazili Click looked around nervously. Dark clouds pressed ominously overhead, and the lifeless forest stretched to the horizon on all sides. It's it's all so dead, so dead. Wait till Jenna sees this, till Jenna sees. Tristan took another swig from the wineskin, then turned to Dareth. Let's check the horses before it's too dark to see. The Kalashite shrugged and followed him to the little clearing in which they had staked their mounts. The king tugged on the line that held Avalon, while Dareth checked the other horses. Tristan stared at his companion all the while, but Dareth would not meet his gaze. Look at me, Dareth. Why won't you look at me? 
Gareth turned to stare at the king, but the look was more painful than his avoidance. Tristan saw great depths of accusation in the Kalashite's black eyes. Then wordlessly, Gareth went back to his task. Why this silent invective? You drove Robin away, whispered Gareth, in a voice that thundered in Tristan's mind. She could be dead. And she could be alive. We'll find her, I swear it. And it'll be easier if we work together. When we do find her, she will accept my apology and forgive me. She knows I made a mistake. The king spat his answers, one after the other, before taking another pull of the wine. The liquid cooled the heat of his throat and seemed to calm his pounding heart. By the gods, she will forgive me. You ask too much of her, replied the Kalashite in a voice of silken quiet. Too much? It's asking too much to forgive a simple mistake? You have the love of the finest woman I have ever met. What cause do you have for throwing it away? Stop it. I command you, as your king. You took the oath to serve me, as binding as upon any lord of the Fofolk. And serve you I shall, sire. But you cannot command the feelings inside a man. Until now, I would not have thought you fool enough to try. Tristan's hand went instinctively to his sword, but the bitter edge of truth in Dareth's words held him back. Instead of drawing his weapon, he stared in anger and pain at his friend. I chose to follow you, remember? Dareth continued, his words spilling forth in heat. You spared my life, true, when I would have stolen your purse. Since then, we have fought great enemies side by side, and I have watched your power grow. I have always felt that you were a man with a great destiny before him, and I was pleased to help you reach that destiny. But now, to see you throw that away for a trivial encounter with a maid, I did not throw anything away. I will make it up to Robin. How does that mean I have renounced my destiny? You have proven yourself unworthy of her love. Tristan stepped back, as if he had been struck, but then he stopped and stared at his companion. He studied Dareth carefully and came to a startling realization. You love her too, don't you? Dareth flushed and turned away while the king took another drink. I don't know whether to cry out in rage or in laughter. Laughter? She could be dead right now or in the gravest peril and all because you drove her away and now you talk of laughter? Get out of here, shouted the king. Leave me alone. I don't want your help or your presence. If this is the loyalty you offer. He stopped, jealous heat choking off any further words. Dareth spun on his heel and stalked into the night away from the camp. After two steps, he disappeared from sight and Tristan realized that the twilight had passed. Wait! The king cried out once, softly though he knew Dareth would not stop. In truth, Tristan realized that he was relieved the confrontation was over. Dareth had awakened too much guilt within him, and each of the Kalashite's words had seemed to drive another wicked dagger home. The darkness grew thick, a blanket of night that fell in an almost physical cloak around them. The clouds above and the gaunt trees around them had all vanished, into the utter darkness. Tristan stumbled back to his companions, stifling an angry curse as he tripped over a root. 
He sat against a tree trunk some distance away from Paldo, Tavish, and the two fairies. The king noticed that his hands shook. Tension boiled within him, and he wanted to lash out against something, but he forced himself to remain still, and eventually heard the deep breathing of his companions. Campus came to him, and with a soft whine curled up at his feet. He lifted the half-empty wineskin, but suddenly the wine tasted bitter, nearly gagging him. Spitting it out, he leaned back in disgust. So Dareth loved Robin. How could his friend have kept a secret like that? How painful had it been for him to see Tristan and Robin together? As he reflected, he began to remember a look he had seen on the Kalashite's face, occasionally at unguarded moments. He thought of the attentive way Dareth listened to Robin speak, the way he laughed when she laughed. I could have noticed it any time I wanted. I just never paid attention. And then Canthus growled, very softly, and every fiber of Tristan's being was jolted back to the present. He stood quickly, soundlessly, and listened, trying to project his senses into the surrounding night. Something was out there. Tristan heard a soft, scuffling sound, and he felt Canthus grow tense beside him. The noise came again, from the direction of the trail behind them. For a moment, he wondered if it was Dareth returning but he remembered that the Kalashite had gone to the north in the opposite direction. Even Dareth could not have circled the camp that quickly and soundlessly. Tristan let the sword of Simrakiu rest in its scabbard, safe at his side. The brilliant blade would illuminate their camp if he drew it, but that would only serve to help whatever was out there to spot them. He felt Canthus drop into a fighting crouch and slink forward. Tristan stepped carefully beside the great moorhound, trying to move silently and cursing the rasping of each footstep against the dry ground. The feeling that something approached them grew stronger. Once again, he froze at full attention, desperately seeking any clue from the still dark night. He thought of waking his companions, but for what? He still couldn't be certain there was anything out there. Only his keyed nerves and the suspicious Canthus led him to suspect a threat. But then he heard a clear sound, a footfall, and he knew that something approached their camp. The sword, almost of its own will, leaped into his palm, and the clearing stood stark, washed in the magical light of the enchanted blade. With a low bark, Canthus sprang forward. Paldo sat up in his bedroll as Newt darted into the air, buzzing anxiously toward the king. Even Yazili Click popped his head out of the saddlebag he had chosen for a bed. Well, what is it? Is it? Tristan saw the shape emerge from the darkness. He watched Canthus stop in shock, then bound ahead with a yelp of greeting. The great moorhound nearly knocked Robin off her feet as the druid embraced the dog. Robin! The king coughed out the word, his voice choking. She was here, and she was safe. The clearing seemed suddenly a warm and cheery place, and in his relief and joy he stumbled forward to greet her forgetting the thing that had driven her away. But there was no forgetting in the druid's eyes as she looked coolly at him and then at his companions. She stepped past him into the camp, and the night again grew forbidding and chilled. More silent than the faint breeze passing through dead limbs, Shantu slipped through the darkness. His passing seemed to bring even more intense blackness, an increase in the night's oppressive cloak that was not imaginary. Ever southward, the beast hunted, 
Not once had it noticed the spore of a quarry worth its efforts. Most of the animal life had been driven from the Vale, and the few pathetic creatures Shantu detected could not attract the beast's interest, though scarcely a creature that breathed escaped the stalker's keen senses. But the spore of a rabbit, a squirrel, or even a deer did not interest the beast. It hungered for grander game, for prey whose killing would serve the dark purposes of Bahal. At last, Shantu found such a worthy quarry. The scent came faintly from the distance, in the blackest part of the night. The beast did not pause to confirm the spore as a normal hunter would. Instead, Shantu sprang to the south, toward the source of the signal that had triggered the displacer beast's hunt. Now Shantu became a black streak, a tireless shape slipping through the dead forest at startling speed, yet making no more sound than the flight of a night owl. And as the monster ran, its mouth gaped more broadly than ever. The curved fangs seemed to grin in anticipation as Shantu raced toward the kill. Mother, give me the patience and the strength to forgive him. Allow me to welcome his help, to use his strength to fight for your cause. And give me the might that I may work your will and restore your body to you, that I may tend you as my destiny calls. Please, my mother, the earth, answer me. Give me some sign that you live and recognize me. But there was only the awful, lonely silence of the night. Chapter 6 Shantu Bahal relished the concentrated evil of the dark well as he observed the actions of his minions. He sensed Yasala marshalling the Sahuajin and their mindless servants, the dead of the sea. He knew that the cleric, Hobarth, now worked his way north through the wasteland of the Vale on a mission for his master. In a few days, Hobarth would reach the sea, and there an important phase of Bahal's plan would begin. And Baal, too, was aware of his children. He heard the hissed reports of his peritons as they flew to and from the well. They swirled above in sweeping flocks, observing and protecting the periphery of his domain. Savage and dim-witted, the peritons would serve as admirable guards and warriors in the defense of their master's domain. Thorax, the owlbear, lumbered aimlessly through the wilderness. Baal had no worries about this creature. Though stupid, it was equally ferocious. Soon it would find victims, and the legend of its horror would begin. The god of murder sensed, most palpably, the bloodlust of the king of his children, Shantu. The displacer beast had found the spore of a victim, and Baal waited eagerly for the battle and the kill that was sure to follow. For Shantu was the greatest of hunters, made of blood and muscle and senses among the most deadly to be found on this world, and augmented by a spirit and instinct for cruelty that came from plains far below the forgotten realms. Shantu was ultimate stealth, implacable cruelty. No creature of the realms could match its keen instincts for surprise, its utter fearlessness and its arcane, other-dimensional power. And soon, Bahal knew Shantu would kill. Dareth moved softly into the night, anger tearing at his soul. But even the turmoil of his emotions could not still the native caution of his movements, and each step over the broken ground fell with care. The forefront of his mind roiled with thoughts of Tristan. How he had admired his king. He would have served him for life. He would gladly have sacrificed his own life to save that of his king, or the king's lady. 
but even as this knowledge tormented him, the back of his mind counseled caution and alertness. Though the Kalashite walked rapidly over rough ground in inky darkness, most of his steps fell in utter silence. His ears remained alert to any sign of warning from the dark, and his scimitar rested loosely in its sheath at his side. In an instant, the blade could become an extension of his arm, offering sudden death to any threat. His dark figure picked its way carefully along the faint trail, avoiding cracked boulders and rotted, festering trunks. He had no destination in mind, but simply a desire to distance himself from Tristan. Dareth didn't know how long he paced or how far he had come, but eventually he halted, trying to decide what to do next. Should he spend the night here? His pride balked at the idea of returning to camp. Tristan had sent him away. So be it. But should he stay here in the darkness? He immediately discarded that idea and turned his footsteps back toward their darkened camp. He would claim his horse and leave. Angrily, he slipped back along the trail. The route led mostly upward, though he hadn't been particularly aware of walking downhill when he had left the camp. But he was not lost. Even in the blackest night, with a complete lack of landmarks, the Kalashite would have been capable of making a very accurate guess as to his location. Now, though the night was dark, he remembered many landmarks along the trail to confirm his direction. He moved as quickly as he could, while still maintaining silence. Inevitably, his haste drew an occasional scuffing sound as his boot slipped along the side of a rock, or a dull crack as he stepped on a dried twig. These slight sounds concerned him little. However, since all he had seen thus far told him that Mirlock Vale was now completely lifeless, Soon he detected a break in the consuming darkness before him, and in a few more steps he recognized the silvery glow that could only emanate from the sword of Simracu. Tristan, you fool! His thoughts raged. It's not enough that we camp within a few paces of the trail. Now you have to announce our location with that confounded glow. And then... As he came closer, he heard voices, though he saw Paldo and Tavish curled in their bedrolls. Tristan was speaking, and someone else replied. Robin! She was safe! Somehow she had found their camp. Dareth stole closer, suddenly tentative. Where had she come from? How would she treat the king, whose betrayal had sent her away in the first place? The Kalashite reached the bole of a thick tree and peered carefully around it. Tristan's sword leaned against a rock, casting its illumination on the little clearing. The king stood beside it, an expression of anguish on his face. Dareth could not see Robin, but he could hear the ice in her voice. Don't speak of love to me now, or faith. I saw enough of that at Care Corwell. You condemn me for a single mistake. It was the woman. She bewitched me. Any man can. Any man? You are the high king of the Fafolk, Tristan, the man who would have been my husband. Don't talk to me of what any man would do. But I love you. She meant nothing to me. I don't even know who she was or how she... Don't know? Robin was incredulous. You seemed very well acquainted to me. Tristan groaned and turned from Robin. By the goddess, I'd give anything to take back that night. The king stalked away, but then stopped and spoke more softly. Still, we must work together. Don't you see? You had no chance out here by yourself. Perhaps, but I had no desire to be out here with you. However, you're right. 
Our best chance of success is to cooperate. Robin's voice contained no hint of forgiveness. What are you planning to do now that we've reached the Vale? Tristan asked. I will tell you when we reach the well. First, we must negotiate the terrors of this defiled Vale. But... Tristan's attempted argument faded before it even began. Very well, he sighed, defeat resounding in his tone. Dareth whirled away, disgusted by Tristan's voice. He leaned against the tree, breathing heavily. How could you have fallen so, he wondered. He accused Tristan, and then tried him in his mind, and in the verdict found him wanting. Clenching his jaw in suppressed anger, Dareth stumbled blindly away from the camp, back down the trail to the north, his horse forgotten. He could not bear the thought of confronting Tristan or facing Robin now. Perhaps in the morning he would feel differently. But in his heart, he suspected that something very fundamental to his life had changed. Once again this night, Dareth of Kalimshan became a thing of the darkness, slipping cautiously and quietly through the dead forest. Pausing to listen for any sound, he searched the air with his nose, sniffing to see if he could discern any alarming scent among the overpowering odors of rot and decay. Then he moved again, with no destination save distance. He desired only to leave the couple that he loved, to leave them and their pain far behind. Occasionally, he moved more quickly than caution warranted, but he caught himself at such moments. Then he would stand motionless in an open area and for several minutes listen and smell the woods around him. Once he climbed a rounded rock to stand solidly upon its smooth crown, watching and listening with the patience of a stalking predator. It was at this moment that he began to suspect he was not alone in the forest. He stood for nearly five minutes like a frozen statue atop the boulder beside the trail. No scent came to his nostrils. No sound reached his ears. Yet the hair at the nape of his neck slowly prickled upward, and he found himself whirling around to stare into the impenetrable blackness. Something was out there. Dareth touched the haft of his scimitar, reassuring himself with its smooth feel. The keen blade carried its own enchantment, not as potent as the sword of Simmer Q, but still sharp and deadly. He resisted the impulse to draw the weapon. He could have it in his hand the same moment he desired it, so quick were his reflexes. But it would serve him no purpose now, as he tried to discern the nature of the threat. Carefully, silently, the Kalashite lowered himself to the ground and started again along the trail, moving farther into Mirlock Vale. Now he moved with utmost stealth, creeping slowly, not making the slightest whisper of sound. Yet he could not escape the disturbing suspicion, no, the knowledge he corrected himself, that something was out there in the darkness. After a hundred paces, Dareth froze again, but again no signal reached any of his senses to confirm the existence of a threat. Yet he needed no confirmation, so utterly convinced was he that some dire creature lurked in the darkness, and that dire creature was almost certainly stalking him. As he moved farther, the prickling on the back of his neck remained. He hastened his steps, ignoring the faint sounds he made as he broke into a trot, and still the feeling stayed with him. He stopped suddenly and listened, but again he heard no sound from the blackness surrounding him. Dareth made a full circle back on his trail, but he was able to detect no single direction the threat came from. 
Instead, it seemed to be everywhere at once, indefinable in its nature, but awesome in its might. The Kalashite told himself that he was imagining things, that, in fact, there was nothing here to menace him except his own frayed nerves. Indeed, the sudden arrival at camp of Robin, added to his confrontation with the High King, had certainly agitated him to the point of anxiety. Now he was in a strange, admittedly terrifying place in darkest night. It only seemed natural that his nerves would play games. Considerably relieved, he started again down the trail and soon came to a narrow gorge where high rock walls loomed close on either side of the trail. He could not see them in the blackness, but a sudden coolness in the still air around him told him of their presence as surely as if his eyes had confirmed it. In a few minutes, he had passed through the gorge and entered the dead forest again. He noted that the path was more level here, as though it had finally emerged from the foothills and entered the vale proper. The stench of rotten plant life assailed him even more intently, and he thought sadly of the pain Robin would feel as she entered the bleak region. Dareth's temper had calmed, and he began to think of returning to the camp. The others would be asleep, and in the morning he would be able to face them both and still retain his composure. Indeed, this was a plan that offered him some hope, and even promised the chance to get some rest. And then a low growl emerged from the darkness. Instantly, Dareth dropped into a cat-like crouch as his blade sprang into his hand. He held the scimitar before him, horizontal to the ground, so that the keen blade was ready to slice into an unseen attacker. The faint glow of the enchanted weapon barely penetrated the thick darkness. Every sense of his body grew taut as he strained to see and hear. He tried to reconstruct the sound he had heard. It had been faint, but not because of distance. Fear thrummed through him, fear such as he had never known. It became a dread panic that rooted his feet to the ground and clouded the already hazy senses of his eyes and ears. The pounding of his heart echoed through his brain and seemed to reverberate into the forest itself. Whatever was out there growled again, and Dareth could sense it feeding upon his fear. The growl had been soft and deep, not like a bear. Indeed, not like anything he had ever heard. Swiveling, still cat-like on the balls of his feet, he tried to look around. Suddenly, he knew that the thing out there was some kind of cat. It had aspects of a great feline in its growl. But Dareth began to picture a massive cat body crouched to spring. But it was more than this, he knew as well. This threat was not just a cat, but a cat creature of great, all-encompassing evil that defied all laws of animal creation. Slowly, forcefully, Dareth struggled to gain control of his frayed nerves. He recalled the basic lessons he had learned many years ago in the Academy of Stealth. Fear is a state of mind. As such, it can be conquered by a stronger state of mind. The Kalashite suspected that the teacher of this lesson had never felt fear such as he now felt. Nonetheless, he concentrated on the discipline of that lesson and others that had helped him to master his body's more primitive urges. Slowly, he felt the pounding of his heart subside. His hands, mercifully, did not shake. And most important of all, his mind began to free itself from the paralysis of terror. The thing would attack him, Dareth sensed, but it seemed to be in no hurry. 
Perhaps he could improve the odds by the time the assault came. The first order of business was to choose the ground for the fight. Dareth felt the presence of open woods on all sides, not by gaunt, barren trunks to protect his back. Slowly, carefully, he sheathed his weapon and reversed his direction, remembering the rocky walls that had loomed on either side of the trail. The narrow gorge lay close behind him. For several minutes he glided through the night as quickly as caution would allow, until he felt the cool reflection that told him he had entered the narrow gorge. He stopped for a second, and though he heard no sound of pursuit, he had not expected to, the presence of the unseen menace still lurked out there in the blackness. Dareth backed against the wall, taking care to move in complete silence. He forced his breathing into a slow, rhythmic pattern and tried to relax when he at last leaned weakly against the cold granite. Something stroked across his shoulder, and he gasped out loud, whirling instantly and drawing his weapon in the same motion. The blade cast a faint glow across the rocky wall, and he saw that it was a trailing tendril of dead moss that had startled him. Cursing silently, he again turned his back to the wall and stared at the small circle of light around him. Though he knew that the light made him more visible to anything lurking in the darkness, he did not sheathe the blade. It would take too long to regain his night vision, he assured himself. In reality, the dim circle was the only comfort he had in the terrifying night, and he could not bring himself to relinquish it. Calmer now, he tried to take stock of his assets. Besides his blade, he had a coil of sturdy rope around his waist and a small pouch containing various picks, wires, and probes. He wore the smooth gloves he had discovered in Care Allison, which contained wire picks of their own. He knew that lock picks would be of little use to him now. And he had his belt a pouch of drinking water, a small box of tinder, a flint, and a short, sharp dagger. Most of these items rested in a compact pack in the small of his back, though the dagger was concealed in the back of his right boot. Of them all, only the scimitar seemed to offer immediate help. He still held the weapon before him, the blade across the height of his body, the magical light of its enchantment gave him a sense, inflated perhaps, of power. The weapon had been crafted of hardened steel, and sorcelled by some forgotten weaponsmith so that its edge remained keen, its point sharp, and its strength unfailing. He had always intended to name it, Dareth recalled now, something grand and heroic. The proper name had never really occurred to him, and he had decided to wait until it did. Now he saw the weapon gleam and curve before him, and he saw it as a larger version of an animal's claw or fang, a weapon he found himself facing or suspecting that he faced now. Cat's claw, he whispered. The blade seemed to glow with a warmer light, as if the cold steel had been warmed by the naming. Dareth sliced the air in a back-and-forth motion, and Cat's Claw floated like a feather in his hand. Then he saw the eyes. Two great yellow orbs stared at him from the darkness, beyond the protective glow of Cat's Claw. Each seemed as large as a melon slitted with a long, evil pupil. They remained upon Dareth, unblinking, as the Kalashite leaned back against the wall. He imagined the fetid breath of the creature on his face, and it seemed to suck his very spirit away. For a second, Dareth felt his knees grow weak, and he began to sink to the ground. But as quickly as it began... The impulse passed, and he stood firm again. He would not kneel before this vision from hell. 
The eyes continued to bore into him, and he felt the cold bile of terror rising in his throat. Again the growl came from the darkness, pushing him against the cliff with an almost physical force. Still holding Cat's claw before him, Dareth groped at the cracked face of granite with his left hand, discovering several wide ledges. He studied each of these with his fingers, not daring to turn away from the staring eyes until he had completed his exploration. Then he spun sideways and leaped onto the stone wall. By memory, each of his feet and his free hand found purchase in a narrow irregularity in the rock face. The force of his spring lifted him several feet above the ground and allowed him to brandish the scimitar outward with his free hand. Carefully, he raised one leg, then the other, until he could lift himself another foot. Still he held the blade at the ready, while his left hand stretched upward to grab another firm hold. Then, pulling himself up, he repeated the process. The yellow eye still stared from the darkness, but the creature moved no closer. Once Dareth saw the eyes disappear, and he gasped in panic, but they instantly returned, and he realized that the thing had merely blinked. Again and again he pulled himself higher on the wall. Finally he reached a ledge he guessed to be about fifteen feet from the ground, and here he paused to rest. He stood with his back to the cliff, staring outward and down. The predator had disappeared again, whether because it had moved or because he had carried the light source farther away. Dareth couldn't tell. He derived little comfort from the fact that he couldn't see it any more. After his heart ceased its pounding, once again Dareth turned to climb. He began to wonder if he might not avoid the creature by scaling this granite face to the top, where the four-footed predator would be unable to pursue. He felt with his fingers to find a handhold above his head while he stood on the wide ledge. At last he found a grip, and he quickly pulled himself upward. Once again, he held the scimitar away from the rock, ready to strike in the event of any surprise attack. Now came another growl from the darkness, this time deep and heavy. It rumbled off the rock and echoed through the silence with a sinister resonance. Dareth could see nothing below, but he sensed the thing slinking toward the bottom of the cliff. With a detached sense of wonder, he thought it uncanny that the creature always seemed to move in perfect stealth never giving even a whisper of sound at its passage. Turning back to his task, Dareth pulled himself up the rock wall with practiced skill. He concentrated less on silence than on speed, for he sensed safety in the unseen heights above him. Pulling on tiny cracks in the rock, forcing his boots into impossibly narrow wedges, he made steady progress up the wall. And then the awful approach came from behind him, and his heart failed for a moment. With a soft moan of terror, he clung to the rock as he felt the presence immediately below him of death. The creature sprang to the ledge the Kalashite had just left, landing soundlessly on the narrow shelf of rock. Dareth couldn't hear or see the leap, but he knew that the thing once again crouched very near. He forced himself free from the paralysis of his terror and stared below, holding Cat's claw out from the rock so that the blade shed as much light as possible. Those great yellow eyes slanted up at the corners in oriental fashion, gazed hungrily at him from just a few feet below the level of his foot. The light from the scimitar spilled over the ledge where the creature perched, but though the Kalashite could see the rock and patches of fungus and the huge eyes of the thing, he could see nothing else. A black shadow blocked his view of some of the rock, and from this he discerned a long, 
feline shape. He had to guess the creature's shape more from what he couldn't see than what he could. Heavy lids drooped over those terrible eyes in a slow blink, and immediately Dareth hurtled himself up the face. Perhaps, with luck, the ledge below would prove too narrow for the monster to gain footing to spring. His left hand forced into a wedge while his right still held the blade. Dareth kicked and scraped at the rock with his boots, looking for a foothold. One boot caught on a rough spur, and he hoisted himself up with growing desperation. In a frenzy, he probed with his other foot, seeking any support that would hold his weight. A hot wound slashed through the leather heel of his boot into the sole of his right foot. He cried out in pain as he felt a tug. Instinctively, Dareth slashed downward with Cat's claw into the black space below his foot. His other hand began to slip from its hold, but then the keen blade bit into something that twisted angrily beneath the impact, and the tugging ceased. Gasping, he pulled himself up another few feet and wedged himself into a narrow chimney-like crack that stretched vertically above him. Turning his back to the cliff, he held the blade across his lap and stared wide-eyed into the blackness. Even as he struck the thing, he realized, the creature had made no sound. Where was it now? Had it fallen back to the ground or to the ledge below? Or was it even now creeping up the cliff toward his tiny shelter? Was this where he was destined to die? Cursing silently, Dareth attempted to cast off these morbid thoughts. He realized that his hands, his whole body really, were shaking from the close call. Oddly, the first biting pain in his foot had given way to numbness. He twisted his leg awkwardly to try to get a look at the wound. Resting Cat's claw on his lap, he used both hands to pull his foot around, ignoring the pain that again flared with the movement. His eyes widened in shock, and the world began to spin around him. With a moan, he leaned back into the crack, afraid he would faint. Mercifully, after several seconds of dizziness, his senses calmed somewhat. He felt terribly weak, but he forced himself again to look at the wound. His foot was gone, or at least half of it. Numb with disbelief, he saw that some horribly sharp thing had ripped through the bottom of his boot and torn off the forepart of his foot. Nausea rose in his throat at the sight of the white bone, its red mass of flesh glistening, and the blood that dripped freely from the gaping wound. He leaned forward and vomited over the side of the rock, heaving until his stomach was empty. Weakly he leaned again into the crack, not sparing a hand even to wipe his mouth. Then he forced himself again to look at the wound. Though the heel and ankle remained intact, Dareth sensed that the wound had crippled him for life, however long that life might be. The Kalashite decided he would gladly settle for one more sunrise at this point. He would make it to the dawn. With that determination, his thoughts once again focused on his enemy. Where was the creature? The camp seemed very near now. Wasn't that robin stroking his forehead? How gentle! Startled, he snapped to wakefulness. The cold rock poked into his back, and his cramped muscles tormented him. He had lost consciousness. For how long, he wondered. Curiously, the knowledge terrified him more than had any of the events of the night. Death did not cause him great fear, as long as he could die fighting. But to grow weak, to lose consciousness, so that death could creep up silently and claim him while he remained unknowing, this he could not allow. 
He looked down again, and again he saw nothing but vast blackness. Whether he had dozed for seconds or an hour, he couldn't know. How long could it be before dawn? He felt with sickening certainty that night's cloak would last for many more hours. Grunting in pain, he wrapped the wound crudely, using cloth torn from his tunic. The binding quickly soaked through with blood, but it would serve as minimal protection. Next, he tried to lift himself from his awkward seat. Only with great exertion did he finally pull himself free from the crack. His muscles shrieked in protest. Once, his wounded foot thudded into the rock, and the resulting explosion of agony threatened to drive him mad. Gasping and choking, he clung desperately to the rock until the pain subsided. Slowly, inch after pain-racked inch, Dareth reached upward with his left hand. Scraping his blistered fingertips across the rock, he found another of the tiny cracks that had helped him climb this far. Then he discovered another problem. Allowing his injured foot to dangle loosely, he tried to hold the scimitar in his right hand while lifting his other foot higher on the rock. But the tiny handhold, gripped only with his fingertips, didn't afford him enough purchase for the move. Grimacing, he slid Cat's claw back into the scimitar's sheath, reluctantly realizing that he needed both hands for climbing. Gaining a hold with his right hand, he pulled himself up until he could wedge his left boot into another crack. Once again, he repeated the process. This time his right foot crashed into a jagged spur of rock, and he cried out from the pain. Instantly biting his tongue, he clung to the sheer rock face while the world closed in around him. Fiery gouts of pain erupted along his leg, and tears flowed freely from his eyes. Dareth's fingers began to slip from the precarious holds, and he sensed the certainty of death below him. If I let go, I die. He whispered the words aloud over and over, and from somewhere he found the strength to hold on. But even as his grip strengthened, a great well of blackness opened up in his mind as his pain threatened to swell up and swallow him. Don't faint. Don't faint. He chanted the words desperately to himself, struggling to retain consciousness, and finally the haze in his mind began to dissipate. Nevertheless, he held tightly to the rock for several minutes until he finally felt ready to proceed. In this way, he worked himself up the cliff, moving with great deliberation, taking care not to strike his wound on anything. Occasionally, he wouldn't be able to find purchase for his good foot, and at such times, Dareth lifted himself solely by the strength of his arms and shoulders, holding his position with one hand until he reached through the darkness to find another hold. As he climbed, he felt the horror that had cloaked him dissipate. The prickling of his scalp lessened, and finally he was left with a sense of being alone in the night. Not a friendly night, to be sure, but only the night. Did he spend minutes or hours finishing his climb on the wall? The Kalashite had no idea, though the time seemed to drag on for a half a lifetime. He could have climbed fifty feet or five hundred, the whole nightmarish ascent blurred together in a collage of pain, endurance, despair, and determination. But at last he reached the top. He sensed immediately, as he crawled onto the flat surface above a sheer face of granite, that no more cliff lay before him. He felt the wind on his face, and it carried the strong odor of forest rot. Gasping in relief, he pulled himself away from the brink and found the stump of an old tree to lean against. He sat facing outward toward the cliff. 
It took him several minutes to convince himself that even a monster of supernatural ability would not be able to scramble up that face. Only something equipped with hands or wings could make such a climb. He looked toward the sky and saw nothing but vast and inky blackness. How much longer could this night last? Wearily he pulled Cat's claw from its sheath, using the faint illumination of the blade to look around. Isolated trunks of the dead forest stood arrayed around him, as if the wood had crept toward the precipice to look over the edge. Large broken pieces of rock lay upon the ground, and these were covered with a phosphorescence that caught the light of his weapon and amplified it. The patches of reflective fungus gave the tiny clearing a friendly, welcoming aura. And then, between two of the tree trunks, at the limits of his vision but unquestionably atop the precipice with him, he saw the two yellow eyes, still unblinking and coming closer. Where's Dareth? Tristan, standing lonely guard duty over the little camp, spun in surprise as Robin emerged from the darkness. He had assumed she slept. The sword of Simric Hugh still leaned against the rock, casting its light around their small camp. Tristan worried about the possibility of the dim light giving their position away, but somehow this night had seemed too dark, too black to face without some form of illumination. He wondered if it was cowardice that caused him to leave the sword out as a light. He went off into the night. Tristan didn't want to confess that he had sent his companion away. We had an argument. He got angry. Robin didn't look surprised, just concerned. Tristan felt a need to talk to her, but he didn't know what to say. How could he make her understand? We fought about you, he blurted suddenly. Oh? He can't forgive the way I hurt you. I understand that. Believe me, I can't forgive myself. Tristan groped for words to continue, to keep her looking at him, talking to him. Dareth! But he couldn't bring himself to tell her of the Kalashite's love. You fought, and then you sent him away. The words were cool and accusing. No! The denial was instinctive, and he immediately regretted it. Yes, I did. What's become of the man I loved? Robin seemed honestly puzzled. Why do you do such things? You have friends, followers, people who love you and wish to help you, and one by one you drive us away. I didn't wish that. I was bewitched by something, some force I don't understand. I only know that I feared for you when you were gone. If harm had come to you, I could not have lived with myself. Rest assured, sire, that if harm comes to me, it will not be your responsibility to bear. I have control of my own destiny. I have chosen this mission for myself. If I suffer because of that, so be it. The responsibility is mine. Very well, said the king quietly. But will you let me help you? Yes, replied the druid, equally softly. She turned and looked into the night surrounding their camp. I wonder where Dareth is. Tagar, shaman of Norland, threw down his ash-streaked deerskin and paced angrily around the smoky lodge. The signs, he was forced to admit to himself, were all bad. First, the king should have returned by now. Grunark the Red, of course, always pressed his raids late into the season, but winter was about to begin, 
and there were still no signs of the Red King's longships. Second, the storms had roared into Norland from the trackless sea every other day for a fortnight. Every shaman knew that seven storms in fourteen days bespoke great ill. And third most awful of all was the news brought by the abject farmer, who even now stood outside the leather-bound shaman's lodge. The wretch had lost nine sheep in one night. Each of these omens, in its own right, would have forced Tagar to call a prophecy of ill will for the coming winter. But all three together? It was too much to conceive. Indeed, Tempest was mightily displeased and Tagar thought that he knew why. Tempest, brawny god of war, and the deity worshipped by most of the Northmen, relished the clash of battle, the shedding of blood, and the triumph of routing the enemy from the field. In normal circumstances, the Northmen were the perfect tools for furthering the aims of Tempest. They had chosen him as their god, and he favored them with his blessing. But during the last war, the Northmen had crusaded under the auspices of a different god, though the warriors themselves had been ignorant of that fact. Tempest must have been angered by the slight, and the men of the North had done nothing since to gain his favor. Tagar was now convinced, in the absence of his king and of any plunder of battle, that Tempest would call down his anger upon his people when they were most vulnerable during the cruel months of winter. For the god of war was not a patient deity. Chapter 7 Tiger's Tooth and Cat's Claw For a long time Dareth did nothing except meet the cold gaze of the predator with his own unblinking stare. Neither the monster nor the man moved a muscle, though the Kalashite strained to keep his eyes open. He felt it would be disastrous to blink. He wondered how the creature had climbed to the top of the cliff. It had appeared off to one side, not directly behind him, so he deduced that it had gone up or down the gorge for a distance until it found a place where the sides were not so steep. Then it must have climbed the slope and come along the crest to find him. Suddenly the creature moved. Dareth saw the eyes disappear behind the bole of a tree, then appear again, still boring into him. The thing slipped sideways through the woods, marking a semicircle around him, but not moving any closer. Why don't you attack, beast? hissed Dareth feeling a bit giddy from the strain. Are you afraid? Yes, you know my cat's tooth has a sharp bite. The creature did slink a little closer at his words, and Dareth found himself wishing it would leap at him or do anything but this patient stalk. The beast was, he sensed, playing games with him, the way a cat plays with a wounded mouse. The analogy struck him as decidedly unpleasant, if accurate. Gradually, the man became aware of a dull grayness diffusing through the air. It could not yet be called light. It seemed more a slight lifting of the total darkness that had blinded him for so long. A smoky haze drifted among the gaunt tree trunks, reminding him of the scene after a devastating fire. As the light gradually increased, Darth witnessed the advent of a heavily overcast, foggy day. Even the minimal illumination was far preferable to the inky darkness. And he decided something else, changing a decision he had made in the depths of the night. It was no longer enough to simply live until the dawn. He saw the creature take form against the forest a nightmare thing of purest black. He saw the great shoulders and massive soundless paws, the gleaming teeth clearly visible in a widely gaping maw, seemed to hunger for his flesh. 
and he saw the long, sickening tentacles that coiled and twisted from the thing's shoulders. Clearly dispelling any suspicions he might have had that this was simply a great panther. And now, with the coming of daylight, he formed a new goal for himself. He would slay this nightmare creature. He didn't know exactly how, for the monster's physical tools far superseded his own. But that left him a battle of wits, and the Kalashite had always been proud of his wits. Indeed, he resolved to outsmart the creature and bring it to its well-deserved death. But how? Obviously, he told himself, with a trap. The designing of a trap was a thing well taught at the Academy of Stealth, and a tactic at which Dareth excelled. Of course, he had never tried to trap anything like this before, but that was no deterrent. A basic rule of trap design states that no good trap is identical in purpose or execution to any other trap. The very concept of repetition in a trap becomes a weakness. He looked again at the monster. The yellow eyes stared back into his own, but the beast had not moved. It crouched between a tree and a rock, poised as if to spring. The tentacles, which he could see more clearly as dawn progressed, writhed and twitched like disfigured snakes along the cat's back or over its head. His first decision to make was, should it be a killing trap or a capturing trap? Killing, obviously. Or if the trap could not be ultimately fatal, it must at least smash the creature hard enough to allow Dareth to administer the coupe de grace. Next, he must take stock of the tools at hand. He had Cat's Claw, of course, and the dagger and rope fire-starting tools, and trees, lots of trees. And there was the precipice, he reminded himself. He thought about his selection for a moment and realized that the precipice seemed to offer the greatest chance of doing the cat harm. Though, of course, if he could lure it under a large, leaning tree trunk, he could also hope to give it a sound thump. The third consideration, the approach to the trap did not offer ready inspiration. The woods here were open, and the little existing underbrush had withered and rotted away. The cat creature could go between the trees wherever it pleased. Neither did the cliff seem to offer an auspicious location for his trap. Though the rocky lip was sharp, nowhere did the ground slope down toward the precipice. Instead, it marched straight and level right up to the very edge, which meant it would be difficult to get the monster to slide toward the drop. He looked again at the creature, which still held that unblinking gaze. The monster watched the Kalashite almost curiously now, and seemed to be in no hurry to attack. Slowly, Dareth climbed to his feet. He had to determine how mobile he could be. A terrible aching throb exploded from his right foot when he tried to rest even a fraction of his weight on it. Wearily, he leaned against the tree and slumped back to the ground. He would need a crutch for any movement at all. He stretched to his right and reached the end of a stout stick that had fallen from a tree. Pulling it across his lap, he began hacking at it with his dagger, all the while watching the creature as it watched him. Soon he had cut off a short piece of branch, which he lashed across the end of the longer piece for an armrest. Switching Cat's claw to his left hand, he climbed slowly to his feet, leaning his weight on the crutch. With an awkward hobble, he started moving away from the creature, determined to find a location that would provide him with his trap. His foot continued to throb, but the pain had become a fact of life, and he no longer took special note of it. He hopped for several steps, then leaned against a tree as he suddenly grew dizzy. And then the monster made its first audible footfall, directly behind the Kalashite. 
Dareth whirled in shock, dropping his crutch and transferring Cat's claw into his right hand. The creature had bounded a hundred feet or more in mere seconds. Now it snarled savagely, only a few paces away. Dareth firmly anchored his back against the tree, feeling the rotten bark peel away under his weight. He hefted the scimitar in both of his hands and stared the creature full in the face. He felt no fear of the thing, just a cold anger that, like his pain, seemed more a fact of life than a raging emotion. The cat beast came closer, creeping a pace at a time. The shiny black body crouched as if it prepared to spring after each slithering step. With repugnance, Dareth saw the suction cups lining the leathery tentacles. The moist lips of each flexed and pursed as if seeking contact with the flesh of their victim. The Kalashite took no notice of the sun, which at last broke through the morning haze as it crested the ridge across the valley. Though the woods remained shrouded in fog, the small area on top of the cliff stood outlined clearly in yellow sunshine. A deep, Heart-stopping growl rumbled from the creature's cavernous chest, but even this awful sound could no longer bring a tremor to Dareth's hand. He carefully studied the approach of the monster, marshalling his strength, planning his blow. Staring at the center of the monster's forehead, he concentrated on the placement of his weapon. He doubted that he would have a second chance, but if his first blow could somehow puncture the bone there, driving into that wicked brain. Smoothly, he raised the scimitar, but not so high that the creature could slash in under his guard. The cat came on with no apparent fear, creeping almost to within his range without springing. Each breath the beast took now was a prolonged and rumbling growl. Suddenly, Dareth struck. The silver blade sliced downward faster than a mortal eye could follow, straight and true toward its target. All the muscle in the Kalashite's shoulders and arms and all of the skill in his heart and mind poured into that one blow. The blade fell true, striking exactly at the point of aim, but it passed straight through the point and the air beneath it to crash harmlessly into the ground. His already precarious balance gone, Dareth pitched forward and fell on top of the blade. There was nothing there. He whirled into a sitting position and reached out to touch the image of the monster, squatting beside him and glaring balefully. His hand passed right through the sleek black side, and he knew the creature there was nothing but air. Then the monster snarled again, and the sound brought a chill of horror to Dareth's spine. The snarl came from behind him. In an instant, Dareth understood the nature of the beast. This was a creature that appeared to be in one place, but was actually somewhere else. Dareth's blow had been strong and true at the image of the beast, while the beast itself crouched behind his unprotected back. An electric surge of alarm propelled Dareth into a crab-like scramble to the side. Even as he moved, he felt the thump of a great body landing beside him, smelled the pungent scent suggestive of a great panther somehow corrupted. The Kalashite whirled on the ground, ignoring the pain from his wound. His hand came up, cat's claw gleaming, and then the blade bit into something fleshy and muscular. The monster shrieked, an exaggerated feline cry of pain and rage. Its image, now beside Dareth, recoiled several feet at the same time as the man heard the beast retreat before him. The jolt of energy gave him strength to stand, and once more Cat's Claw darted forward. The blade whistled through the air, striking nothing. But on its lightning backstroke, Dareth again found blood. His frenzy continued, unabated as he pressed the battle against the ungodly beast, 
shrewdly estimating its true location before each silver slash. The monster recoiled, stunned by the savage attacks, but it quickly recovered. A lashing tentacle wrapped both Dareth's legs in a snake-like embrace, pulling him to the side as it twirled around him again and again. He raised Cat's claw, taking aim at the thing from Feel, since he could not see the tentacle that imprisoned him. But then the other tentacle wrapped tightly around his neck and his mouth. It jerked his head backward, and he gasped loudly as the air exploded from his lungs. The moist sucking cups fastened themselves to his face, and he couldn't draw a breath. Suffocating, he squirmed fruitlessly in the grasp of the beast. And his heart was gone, torn from his ribs in a single crushing bite. And with it went his life. The North Cape! Home! The cry of the lookout brought Grunark the Red racing to the bow. He stood behind the proud figurehead and let his eyes bathe in the view. The fir forests of coastal Norland gave the strip of land a green and lively cast, especially when compared to the unrelieved grey across the Sea of Moonshay. Always the autumn homecoming was a time of reverence and thanks for the Red King. But this year, the feeling struck him as especially profound. There would be great wailing in the lodges tonight, as the cost of this mission— a ship and a full crew became known. This weight did not bear as heavily on his shoulders as it would have in years past. However, for this year he brought back a thing he had never found on a raid before. Always he returned with plunder, sometimes with slaves, and ever leaving new enemies behind. But now, for the first time, Grunark the Red returned from a raid with an alliance. The news would be greeted with mixed emotions by his people, he knew, but he was enough of a leader to make them understand the properness and usefulness of the move. He watched his steersmen take the sleek vessel around the rocky prominence of North Cape and into the Bay of Norland. His own town lay on the shore, dead ahead, and he could already see the signal fires sending the message of their approach from the Cape to the town. His people, and his woman, would quickly gather and be waiting for him on the docks. Ingra would understand. The Fafolk didn't have to be the enemy, and with her help he could make the rest of his people understand and accept. The longship pulled alongside the stony quay just before dark. As he had suspected, a silent throng had gathered there. Eighty men and two ships had embarked from this same quay seven months earlier. Now only half of those men returned, and many voices from the crowd were raised in grief. The Red King ignored the wailing of the women as he stepped proudly down the plank. Ingra stepped forward to greet him, and he swept her into his arms, relishing again the feel of her softness. She did not weep for it did not befit the wife of a king to display her emotions in public, but he could sense her relief as he held her. And then he set her down and turned to look at the faces of his countrymen and women. They looked back with a mixture of hope and apprehension as he spread his arms to the sides and allowed his voice to boom across the waterfront. Summon the fathers of the tribes! I will meet the chieftains of Norland in my lodge five nights hence. I am calling a council of winter night. We return laden with treasure, and those families that have lost their men shall be cared for. The remainder shall be divided at the council. And with this news, he dispersed his people, planting seeds of hope and curiosity. A council of winter night was a rare meeting for travel over Norland this late in the season, was a hazardous affair. The Northmen understood that a matter of great import would be discussed, and they sensed correctly that their king was not about to tell them what it was. But word went out to the hill villages and to the towns along the coast. 
the fathers of the tribes packed for their journey. And by longship or by horse, they began to make their way to Norland, to the lodge of their king. Four figures moved cautiously forward, leaving the scant shelter of the dead forest. They crept across a field of brown mud toward a black circle of water. Each of them was shrouded beneath a thick fur cloak, though their arms swung easily outside the garments. Two of them carried slender swords, while the others were not visibly armed. One of the figures gestured to another, the smallest of the band, and the latter paused. A strand of blonde hair fell from the fur hood as the slender form gestured angrily. Wide brown eyes glared from the depths of the garment. At last, with obvious reluctance, it turned back to the woods and took shelter among the bleak trunks. The trio approached the dark water, stepping between two white statues. One of them studied the stone image, the likeness of a young woman dressed in sturdy fighting garb. Then it turned back to join the two as they came to the very shore of the water. Come closer. A little closer. Bahal willed the strangers to advance, to touch the water. The god longed to reach forth and strike them down, but he lacked the physical means to push himself beyond the surface of the water. So he must wait for the victims to come to him. Bahal sensed that these were ancient beings of enchantment and peace. Vibrant and very human-like, they were nonetheless not human. Their souls were more lyrical than the rough spirituality of humanity, and the dark god sensed that they would taste very sweet. Finally, one of the figures knelt and reached forward, extending slender fingers to the water's surface. Immediately, the blue light exploded upward, hissing and crackling, as it outlined the suddenly rigid body. The light sizzled through the air to strike the second, then the third. The silver swords blackened, and the fur burned from the hoods and cloaks of the victims. Then the fire faded, and the three figures stood scarred and misshapen, killed but not truly dead. The shells of their bodies shuffled slowly around the rim of the well, taking up stations as Bahal's sentries. He did not hear the fourth figure scream, nor did he see it turn and flee from the well. The god was satisfied for now, but the frustration of waiting for the victim's approach still irritated him. The physical location of the dark well began to seem a closed door rather than an opened window. And as Bahal drained more of the Earth Mother's might, turning that power to his own purposes, he longed to take more of a role in his machinations. He would have to find some way to project himself beyond this watery veil. Tristan awakened with a jolt of alarm. He sprang from his bedroll, the sword of Simmer Q gleaming in his hand, and dropped into a fighting crouch as he looked around for the source of his fear. Before he came fully awake, he would have disemboweled any intruder. But all he saw was the dim gray light of an overcast dawn and the sleepy figures of his companions stirring in their own bedrolls. Tavish, on guard duty, leaned against a tree and regarded him with raised eyebrows. Jumpy this morning, sire. Indeed, you slept poorly. I've seen dancers that moved less and singers more quiet than you were in your sleep. Yes. Jumpy, he agreed ruefully, looking at the ghastly woods and its supernatural cloak of fog. But with good cause, it would seem. Did Dareth ever return? No, sire, said the bard, growing suddenly somber. I'm worried. So am I, muttered the king. A gnawing dread tucked at his subconsciousness. I'll put Canthus on his trail. We'll find him. That forest is no place for a man to be alone. The sight of it is enough to send a shiver down my spine. 
agreed the bard. Though the lonesomeness is relieved, some by your rising. The last hour before dawn, now there was a time I kept a nervous eye over my shoulder. It's not the hour, interjected Robin, stepping into the clearing. She had slept several paces off. It's the place. Mirlock Vale? asked Tristan. Mirlock Vale now, as it has changed. The valley has been taken over by some evil of vast power, more awful than that lone cleric, certainly. Perhaps he is in direct contact with his god. The dark force must be centered in the grove of the great druid, for that is the matrix through which flows control of the entire vale. And that also is where the druids remain entrapped in stone? asked the bard. Yes, I intend to go there and break the power of this god. Tristan immediately wondered how Robin planned to do this, but he dared not ask her. Tavish, too, seemed curious for more details, but she settled for a shrug of her broad shoulders. Well, I'm in till the end this time. I've a hunch I've missed some great ballad material when I left you on Caladir. I'm vanished. Paldo's voice emerged from the depths of his bedroll. I'll have three goose eggs turned oh so very easy. Eggs? There must be bacon, too, and cakes. Let's eat. Newt lifted his head from beneath the saddle that had served as his tent. Cold bread, said the king, suddenly irritated by his companion's good humor. And we'll hit the trail in ten minutes. Tristan stretched his stiff muscles as he slid the chain mail over his shoulders. Even the heavy wool padding did not prevent the chill of the iron links from penetrating to his skin. He saddled Avalon, then lifted Dareth's saddle to the back of the Kalashite's frisky chestnut mare. There he met Robin, as she brought their friend's bedroll to be lashed onto the horse. Dareth went down the trail last night, farther into the vale, he explained. I want to put Canthus on his trail. If he strayed from our path, I'll try to find him. I'll catch up with you later. By all means, she agreed. But we shall all go. She looked at him without anger. Our first priority must be to find him. By the time they had packed their meager camp, Tristan had located the Kalashite's trail and shown it to Canthus. The moorhound immediately grasped his master's meaning and started along the path at an easy lope. His nose held inches off the ground. Tristan, atop Avalon, rode behind the moorhound. Robin, on Dareth's mare, came next. Newt also rode the mare, perched possessively on the saddle horn before the druid, while Yazili Click rode in front of the king on Avalon. Paldo and Tavish brought up the rear. The horses broke into a slow trot, unimpeded by an underbrush in the dead forest. The trees here had once been lofty pines, but now each was a bleak spire prickly with the brittle array of its dead branches, and surrounded by a small heap of rotting needles. Their path, a former game trail, meandered among these trunks, then gradually left the hill country and entered the bottom land of Mirlock Vale itself. Tristan put a hand on Yazili Click's tiny shoulder to steady the sprite as the horse took them over a rough part of the trail. He took care to avoid crushing his companion's frail butterfly wings, but nevertheless he noticed the fairy's body trembling under his touch. "'What is it, Yaz?' he asked, leaning forward and speaking softly. "'It—it's this!' squeaked the fairy, gesturing around them in despair. "'Of all the places in the world, the world, this one here— the Vavail was the closest to Fafairy, and now it's all dead, all dead. Fairy? I've heard it's a magical place, unlike any other realm. Is that so? 
Oh, y yes! Yazili Click brightened perceptibly. It has b beauty and magic and a w wonderful peacefulness. Where is it? I d don't know for sure. You go through a g gate and you're in fairy. It's that easy, easy. There are so many gates, especially to here, to the v Vale. Did you come through one of them? Tristan tried to divert the sprite's attention from his misery. Oh, yes. L long ago, I came here to the Vale, the Vale. It was so beautiful here, just like the fairy. Well, why did they have to kill it all? It's not gone forever. Whatever is causing this must have a weakness. We'll find it. It's all d dead, wept the fairy, unconsoled. Tristan looked at the wasteland through new eyes and wondered at the evil before him. This vale had never been more than a vast wilderness to him. It was well stocked with game, to be sure, but he knew that, to Robin, it was very much more. It was the center of her faith and the heart of her goddess's power. He began to picture, very vaguely perhaps, what its desecration meant to her. Canthus never hesitated for a moment as he trotted through the twists and turns of the path. Somehow, Dareth had followed the trail through the thick of the night, and the king marveled at this evidence of his friend's nocturnal skills. The trail suddenly dropped into a rocky gorge, and here Tristan called Canthus to slow, as the horses made their way carefully down the steep and gravelly path. The moorhound sprinted ahead and then waited impatiently. He pranced in a circle in agitation, then dashed forward as soon as Avalon drew near. Tristan lost sight of the hound as Canthus leaped around a bend in the gorge wall. As always, the moorhound hunted silently, so the king heard no barking to help locate his dog. Spurring Avalon into an easy trot, the fastest gait he dared on this rough ground, he came around the same bend. The stallion reared back in surprise, his nostrils flaring, and Tristan's hand darted instinctively to his blade. But the shock before them was in its tail, not in its terror. Canthus had stopped at the bottom of the sheer granite wall of the gorge. The hound stood up on his hind legs, his forelegs reaching up the wall higher than the height of a man's head. Following the gaze of his dog, the king looked up to see a garish streak of blood across the face of the rock. The stuff had dried to a reddish-brown color, but its nature was unmistakable. Tristan raised his eyes and saw bloodstains running down the entire side of the gorge. Robin came around the bend then, and he saw her face grow pale. She looked first to the right and then to the left. Back up the trail, we can get out of the gorge and come around on top. No sooner had she spoken than she whirled the mare around and sent it racing up the trail. Canthus dashed between Avalon's legs and raced up the gorge past Robin. Dareth had been the dog's trainer and beloved teacher, and Tristan sensed dire urgency in the dog's manner. The gnawing dread he himself had experienced all morning broke into cold terror. Paldo and Tavish, bringing up the rear, turned quickly and led the column out of the gorge. They raced along the rim, dreading what they would find. Hobarth walked among villages of leather-covered huts, huddled in glens among the great fir forests of northern Gwyneth. This land contrasted sharply to Corwell, which lay upon the southern shore of this same island. While Corwell was pastoral and open, a place of farmers and fields, this was a place of hunters and warriors. While the folk of Corwell looked to the land for their sustenance, the Northmen looked to the sea. But they would die just the same, mused the cleric, and their dying would give as much pleasure to his god as would the passing of the more peaceful folk to the south. 
Finally, the cleric reached the shore and saw the work of Bahal in all its glory. The northern shore of Gwyneth was separated from Oman's isle by the Strait of Oman. Upon Oman's isle was the great fortress known as the Iron Keep, former palace of the Northman king Thelgar Ironhand. Oman, and especially Iron Keep, and its sheltered bay, were the focal points of Northman power in the moonshays. But this focus, already dimmed by the catastrophic Darkwalker War, was about to be diffused. Already the waters of the strait lay heavy and dark in the channel. The cleric could see the rocky bulk of Oman's isle, but his attention was drawn instead to the sea itself. Great patches of brown scum and thick foam floated across the water. Hobarth, invisible to man, observed the distress in the Northman villages as sleek hulls began to show signs of early rot, and a putrid odor rose from the waves and wafted ashore. He witnessed the consternation of fishermen as they pulled bloated, rotting fish from the strait. He watched with delight as a swollen, drowned body washed into a quiet cove and frightened a group of women. Soon the northern folk would ignore these trifling inconveniences, as Hobart's god put his plan into action. When that happened, the existence of pollution or poor fishing or foul scent would mean naught to these humans. By then, they would be confronted by the ravaging menace of the Sahuagin. And worse. Cameron galloped through a stench of marshy fen, his broad hooves sucking effortlessly from the muck with each supple bound. Brown water splashed and foamed all around him, streaking his flanks with grime. His thick fetlocks clung to his legs, soaked in a mass of putrid ooze that spattered to his belly. But he held his head high, and his mane floated unblemished behind him. His ivory horn remained proudly upright, a challenge to the desolation all around. Soon he charged up a smooth slope and stopped on dry ground once again. Normally he would have paused to nibble a patch of clover or very young grass, but now there was no food to be found. Every day the unicorn progressed farther in his exploration of the devastated bale. And each day the scene around him grew more miserable, more hopeless. Cameron's ribs now showed clearly through his dirty hide, but his stance remained ever proud and unbowed. And then he was off again, moving with the easy canter he could maintain all day. He loped through a chaotic jumble of hills where all the dead trees had lost their roots in the sandy soil and lay like matchsticks, a nearly impenetrable tangle. The unicorn forged ahead, forcing his way among the trunks and nearly getting stuck before he emerged from the other side. He came into a shallow draw and followed a pebbly stream bed, now dry, down the center. This was free of trees, so he was able to canter again. Finally, the unicorn stopped in his tracks, his nostrils flaring, his great head swiveled as he looked this way, then that, before turning his attention to the ground. A spore lay there, crossing the path that Cameron followed. As a trail, the spore was completely invisible, for the thing that had passed had neither disturbed even one tiny stone, nor broken the most insignificant of twigs. Nevertheless, its passing was written boldly on the land for the eyes of the unicorn. Cameron saw the mark of four huge paws carrying a heavy body of supple grace. But the thing that made the unicorn's ears perk upward and widened his large eyes was the fact that the spore on the ground was written not in trail sign, but in sheer, palpable evil. The god of murder sucked hungrily at the warm life of the moonshays, like a vampire claiming the blood of its victim. And like the vampire's prey, the goddess Earth Mother's strength 
faded toward eternal nothingness. The history of Bahal is a tale of treachery and betrayal, murder and death, on a scope undreamed of by most creatures. Creatures of the lower plains, creatures of the mortal world, all had tasted death at the hands of Bahal and his minions. But his killing had never before claimed a god. Chapter 8 Oath of Blood and Despair Canthus, leading the others along the trail, discovered the body first. The moorhound probed Dareth's corpse mournfully as Tristan dismounted and walked slowly to the remains of his friend. He heard Robin behind him, but he did not turn. He had no doubt that the Kalashite was dead. A ghastly wound had torn away half his chest. The scene lay under a blanket of blood, more blood than Tristan could imagine. Numbly, he watched as Robin knelt beside the body and closed Dareth's eyes. She bowed her head, and he followed her example, too stunned to compose a prayer of his own. The others stood back silently, sharing in their grief. I did this to him. A voice screeched in Tristan's mind. He watched Robin's back, saw her shoulders shake as she wept. At that moment, he dreaded, more than anything he had ever feared, that she would turn to him and accuse him of the very thing he was blaming himself for. If she did that, he knew that his grief and his guilt would surely drive him mad. In a moment, she rose and looked at him with tear-filled eyes. Her gaze held no accusation, only a deep, aching sorrow. I shall find a place to bury him, she said, and walked into the woods. Tristan nodded dumbly and watched her go. As Robin disappeared between the trees, his eyes were drawn unwillingly back to the corpse. Angrily, he tore his cloak from his shoulders and knelt beside Dareth, covering him with the garment. And then he wept. By all the gods, my friend, I know I failed you. He spoke softly to himself only and to Dareth. He hoped devoutly that the Kalashite could know his sorrow. I did not deserve the loyalty of one such as you. And yet you gave it to me. Tristan raised his eyes to the gray sky, staring upward through the blur of his tears. By those same gods, I vow to avenge your death. I know I cannot bring you back, but I can only pray that your memory will grant me forgiveness. He wept for the loss of his friend, and for his own terrible guilt in that loss. He seemed everywhere to be confronted by evidence of his own failure. He felt as if his life was degenerating into chaos. All of his failures seemed to culminate in the lifeless body of his friend, growing cold in the dead forest. No more. He hissed, almost inaudibly. Pressing his fists to his eyes, he willed his tears to stop. He started at the touch of a hand upon his shoulder and looked up to see Tavish beside him. He was a brave man and true, she said, her own eyes moist. And I was the one, Tristan began angrily. Don't say it, warned the bard, an iron edge in her voice. You are the high king of the folk. King of us all. Our destiny is wrapped within yours, and some of us will die before you reach that destiny. The king listened. He wanted to argue, but the tone of her voice compelled him to remain silent. It grieves you to witness the death of those who serve you, and that is good, for you must share our pain. But you cannot carry the blame for those deaths. 
You must have a goal, and that is the goal for all of our people. That goal is the important thing. Tristan wanted to shout at her, to tell her that this was different. This was a death for which he bore special responsibility, for it was brought on by his own selfishness and arrogance. But he said nothing. Instead, he thought about her words. It seemed a long time that he stood there, while Tavish sat beside a tree and began to strum a slow anthem on her lute. The music floated around him, sweet and heartbreaking at the same time. It was full of minor chords, yet it resounded with a triumphant pattern that urged a listener to look up, not down. I always knew he needed me to look after him, said Paldo miserably. The halfling's face was red with grief. Tristan had always suspected that the diminutive adventurer cared for the Kalashite more than he had admitted. Newt and Yaziliklik curled up dejectedly on the ground. The fairy dragon scales had darkened to a deep purple, a hue the others had never seen him take on. Yaziliklik peered into the woods nervously, his antenna twitching in agitation. Robin returned. Having found a suitable grave site, and Tristan carried the body behind her. The others offered to help, but he would have no assistance for this task. They prepared Dareth for burial as best they could, covering his body and its horrible wound with his favorite red cloak. Robin tenderly brushed his hair, and finally Dareth had the look, almost. Of one who rested peacefully. Tristan gently removed the Kalashite's ensorcelled gloves and laid Dareth's hands across his chest. Turning to Paldo, he held the soft leather objects toward the halfling. These came from a place of long ago, he said haltingly. I think he, he would have wanted you to have them. The despondent Paldo said nothing. But he took the gloves reverently and slid them onto his hands, though they had been too large for the halfling. While Tristan held them, they quickly shrunk to a skin-tight fit. They laid Dareth to rest in a small clearing high above the winding gorge. Robin said a quiet prayer over his body, asking the goddess Earth Mother to help his spirit in its search for fulfillment. Tavish strummed another anthem, heartbreakingly beautiful, and they stood for a moment of silence. Tristan stared at the rough ground, the dirt he had piled with his bare hands. He had never felt more forlorn, but all the time he had labored, a grim resolve had begun to crystallize in his mind, a determination that this drifting of his life into chaos must. End. Hobarth decided that the community before him must be the largest on this forsaken shore. He stood on a high, bald hilltop less than a mile inland from the town. From the summit, he could see the wooden and animal skin buildings scattered around the shore of a small cove. Rickety wooden piers jutted into the water. And a number of small boats bobbed at rest. It wasn't much of a town, but the other human settlements he had discovered were even smaller, tiny fishing villages of a score or two buildings. The north coast of Gwynedd seemed a poor place for an attack, if plunder was the object. The plans of Bahal were not obvious to his humble cleric, however. Here Bahal had ordered the attack. And so here it would be. The waters of the strait were devoid of boats, as the filth of pollution now spread thick across the surface. In the far distance, he could vaguely make out the bulk of Oman's Isle, faintly outlined through the haze. The sun had passed into afternoon, but many hours of daylight remained. The cleric spent several minutes exploring the hilltop. 
finding a jumble of rocks that marked its highest point. He walked in a tight circle around this summit, chanting a careful litany and dropping a powder made from finely crushed diamonds. As he cast, a glowing pattern of lines formed across the rocks until he had inscribed a circle of magic around the crest. The lines seemed to have been carved into the rock itself, and they shimmered with a silvery cast, enclosing the cleric in a circle of enchantment. His glyph of warding cast. Hobarth could now prepare his major spell in security. He knew anything trying to interrupt him would be stopped by the glyph. His glyph of warding cast. Hobarth could now prepare his major spell in security or surprised very rudely if it tried to penetrate the magical barrier. Finally, Hobart sat upon the summit and closed his eyes. He called upon all the faith in his black heart and all of the knowledge in his twisted mind. Then began the spell of summoning. For long minutes, he sat as motionless as a statue. His face wrinkled in concentration, his eyes tightly closed. Only the flaring of his wide nostrils gave visual proof that he still lived. But if an observer could have looked beneath the veneer of optical senses, he could have seen the real proof of Hobarth's vitality. Concentrated in the invisible employment of magic, the cleric spirit sent out a call deafening in strength to those who could hear it, and compelling in nature to those same listeners. Beneath the brackish waters of the Strait of Oman swam one listener who heard and immediately moved to obey the summons. Yasala, high priestess of the Sahuajin and devoted cleric of Bahal, had long awaited the call from her human counterpart. Yasala hovered in the upper reaches of the sea, where the sun's illumination penetrated dimly. The water here was shallow, and the smooth bottom was heavily layered with silt, but the priestess took no notice of this. She drifted slowly between the surface and the bottom, waiting. All around her waited the legions of the sea. Standing abreast upon the bottom stood the rank of ogre corpses that had perished in battle, only to be reanimated by her priestesses and the power of Bahal. The fat bodies resembled monstrous maggots, swollen from their immersion. The blue-black water swirled around them, but the stolid corpses remained immobile awaiting the command of the priestess and the black power of her god. Behind the ogres came the dead of the sea, the thousands of drowned sailors, fishermen, and soldiers who had also been animated from death to serve Bahal and his minions. Only after these vast ranks of undead came the Sahuajin themselves, the claws of the deep. They would swarm ashore in the wake of the dead army and complete the annihilation of the foe. Glory to Bahal and his legions, and to his legions across the strait, where King Sithasal and more of the Sahujan warriors massed in similar might. As Yasala sent her charges on to the shores of Gwyneth, Sithasal would send his own fighters, lusting for blood, into the human settlements on Oman's isle. When the coastal communities had been ravaged, the two armies would combine to enter Iron Bay and bring the great keep there to ruin. Now the summons came, and Yasala sensed its source. The great yellow fins along her spine bristled, and the priestesses of her order saw the signal. Their own spines bristled in silent acknowledgment, and the legion surged forward. The dead marched stolidly across the silt, climbing the sloping shelves toward the beach. The Sahuajin swam slowly behind them, the entire mass gliding through the water like great, sinister fish. Then the broad ogre heads broke through the listless surf, and eyeless sockets fastened upon the shore. 
The bloated bodies lumbered from the shallows, their clubs, axes, and great hammers held high. The skin of the lifeless monsters had bleached to milky white during the long immersion, and the waterlogged bodies moved slowly, heavily forward. They were indeed slow, but they could not be stopped. Cole's heart pounded as he left the tiny inn and walked the few steps to the pier. The starling bobbed prettily at dockside, even amid the scum that had coated the water lately. Though small, the little sailboat was the perfect setting for his purpose. And here came his purpose. Gwen walked to the boat with just enough eagerness to excite his hopes and just enough restraint to calm his nerves. For ten days, he had been trying to get her to go off alone together with him. Now she smiled at him, her brown eyes sparkling with a secret promise that inflamed his passion. She was not overly pretty, Gwen, but she had a lively manner that had caught Cole's attention when he had first purchased a shield and jerkin from her father, the leather worker of Cod's Cove. Short and slightly plump, Gwen greeted him with a shy smile. Her red-brown hair was cut short, and Cole liked the way it framed her round, smiling face. Indeed, as he was unusually tall even for a man of the North, they made an oddly matched couple. His soft beard had finally covered his chin the past spring, and now he stroked it self-consciously as she made her way to the dock. He helped her into the boat, enjoying the unsteady moment when she lost her balance and leaned on him. Sit here, he offered, lowering her to the bow seat. The line came easily free from the dock, and he pushed the starling away, as if worried that someone would come along and stop him. The breeze was sluggish at first, but the little craft caught what little wind blew, and they pulled steadily away from shore. For some time they didn't speak. Cole tried to ignore the lifeless brown of the sea without complete success. Indeed, fish were dying in whole schools. Catches were non-existent or diseased. Even these placid Northmen of Gwyneth were once again talking of raiding as a means of survival. Cole tried to banish such thoughts knowing that Gwen was of a family of native for folk, while his ancestors were the plundering Northmen who had claimed these lands as their own a century before. Instead, he concentrated on his passenger's eyes as she demurely looked away. Such pretty eyes they were, shy but not afraid. Gwen had always fascinated him with this air of demure courage, so unlike the women of the Northlands. He finally pulled in the sail and drifted calmly. Cod's Bay was a distant mark on the shoreline, though Cole could still distinguish individual buildings. With the easy grace of the sailor, he moved to the bow seat and took Gwen's hand. She giggled briefly, but she did not turn away as he bent to kiss her. She was warm and soft, her slight plumpness filling his arms as he embraced her. Suddenly, he felt her grow rigid, and he saw her eyes open in shock, staring at something over his shoulder. Gwen screamed as Cole spun around, his own eyes widening. The most horrible creature he had ever seen slithered over the transom, flicking a forked tongue toward him. Its pale eyes bulged, and rows of sharp, wicked teeth gleamed in its widespread mouth. Its vaguely human-like body was completely covered with green scales, and it used clawed hands with webbed fingers to pull itself into the bottom of the boat. In the instant of his turning, the Northman froze in panic. What could he do? He gaped in terror as the man-like form slithered forward. 
Suddenly his fear galvanized into action, and he reached for one of the long oars. He lifted the oar from its lock and brought it crashing down on the creature's head as the monster tried to stand. It slumped to its knees, and he crashed the oar down upon it again, snapping the wooden shaft in two, but dropping the creature senseless into the hull. What, what is it? gasped the maid as Cole slumped weakly to the bench. For a moment he could not speak. Bile rose in his throat, and he feared he would lose his breakfast, but finally his tongue freed itself from the terror. I, I've heard tales of the fishmen, dwellers of the deep. Sometimes they struck ships, but only far at sea. The Northman spoke slowly as he regained his breath. Look! Cod's Bay! cried Gwyneth, pointing to shore. They watched in horror as a wave of huge white bodies plodded menacingly from the surf and entered the town, striking down any humans who did not flee before them. And then another wave of invaders rose from the sea and still more hastened in their wake. Cole pulled the sail taut as they watched, and soon the wind pushed them slowly toward the strait. "'Where are you going?' cried the distraught young woman as she saw his course. "'My family's there. We've got to go back.' Cole nodded at the town. Flames had already begun to flicker upward from the buildings." They've either fled and are safe, or they did not flee. In either case, we will not be able to help them. She turned with a sob to watch the shore, seething in chaos behind them. We'll go to Oman's Isle, he promised. There we can get help and sail home as soon as possible. Of course, he couldn't know that Sithisal and the Sahuagin already swarmed across the length and breadth of Oman's Isle, and that the survivors were already fleeing toward the cramped security of the Iron Keep. They rode steadily toward the dark well, each immersed in private thoughts, but they all shared the common purpose now. Nothing else mattered until they could confront the root of the evils that plagued the land and had slain their friend. Tristan wondered what Robin would do when they reached the well. Some secret with the scrolls, she had indicated. Why had she refused to give him more details? This, he realized, was just another evidence of the depth of the change between them. She no longer confided in him or sought his advice. He realized with sharp clarity just how much he missed her. For the thousandth time, he cursed himself, cursed the red-haired woman, cursed all the circumstances on that fateful night. All he could do now was strive for atonement, and so he would. To start, he would see that the companions all reached the grove of the great druid, and the goal of their quest alive. For a while, they rode in silence, all of them sharing their grim purpose. Even Newt seemed to sense their resolve. He sat forlornly ahead of Robin in the saddle, curled against her stomach, silent for once. Behind her, lashed to the saddle, rested Dareth's silver scimitar. Tristan had offered it to her as they buried their friend, and reluctantly, she had accepted the gift. All the riders looked nervously this way and that, sharing a grim apprehension, yet seeing no visible threat. Tristan took a measure of comfort from the fact that the sharp-eyed halfling rode at the rear of the party. Then a blackness gripped him and he thought of how much more secure they would have felt with Dareth's keen senses protecting their flank. He shook off the thought and looked again toward Canthus. The moorhound led the party as they advanced carefully into the heart of Mirlock Vale. Yazili Click sat before the king on Avalon's broad back. 
The little sprite held his tiny short bow ready, with one of his silvery dart-like arrows knocked in the weapon. His antenna quivered, and the king wondered if they helped him to search the woods for enemies. He hoped that they did. Though the season was autumn, the chill in the air and the low, leaden sky bespoke more of winter. No snow had fallen here yet, but the bleak wind blew off the highlands with an icy bite that penetrated their cloaks and clothes and flesh, cutting right to their bones. Shivering, Tristan pulled his woolen cape more tightly around himself, but even that offered little comfort. They followed a faintly visible trail through the black trunks. Though fallen leaves now rotting covered parts of the path, Canthus seemed to have no doubts as to the trail's location. Their route took them on a gradual decline into the flat basin of the vale. Soon they came to the shore of a bleak and stagnant fen. The vast marsh reeked with an air of death and disease, and Tristan nearly gagged as the trail moved along the fringe of the swamp. This must, very recently, have been a thriving wetland teeming with ducks and otters and other creatures. Now it lay brown and still, a lifeless smear upon the land. A few barren tree trunks jutted from a vast swamp of brown, stagnant water. In other places, patches of thick scum covered the surface. He felt relief as the trail again returned to the woods, climbing gradually away from the fen. The return to the forest was only a slight improvement, for still there was no sign of greenery or animal life, but at least that horrent stink of the swamp grew more faint in the air. Still the whole vale, forest and fen alike, gave him a chilling sense as if they were all cloaked in a blanket of death. The king watched as Canthus stopped and sniffed nervously at the ground. He saw the hackles rise on the great dog's neck, and he quickly dismounted. We'll wait for the others, but be careful, careful, squeaked Yazili Click. Tristan looked back, surprised to see how far the rest of the party had fallen behind. Watch my back, he ordered. I want to see what's bothering Canthus. He saw Robin spur her mare into a fast trot as he turned back to his dog. Canthus stood at a bare spot in the trail, turning his huge head this way and that. Abruptly, he growled and began to back toward the king. The hound's body, stiff with tension, poised like a coiled spring as he bared his great teeth at a threat that remained to Tristan unseen. Suddenly, the ground began to convulse under Tristan's feet, and he crashed to his back. The wind knocked from his lungs. Gasping, he saw Canthus leap backward with a prodigious bound that took the dog clear over his master's body. Then came an awful ripping sound, as of a body being torn asunder, and he felt the ground quiver beneath him again. Suddenly the firmament beneath him fell away. For a sickening split second, he felt himself hang in the air. In that same instant, a stinging wave of gas exploded from the yawning space below him, sending fiery fingers into his chest as he gasped for air. Great roots dangled from the broken ground, hanging into the hole, and Tristan felt poised, for a moment, at the brink of doom. And then he started to fall. A great fissure had opened in the ground along the trail, and now the stunned king lay at its lip, sliding into bottomless darkness. Noxious fumes rushed upward from the chasm, again biting into his lungs, and then the blackness claimed him. The moorhound rebounded instantly from his leap and sprang forward to seize his master's arm in his jaws. 
As Tristan's body dropped into the pit, the dog tightened his grip and held the king back from certain death. Campus's paws began to slip along the ground, and he growled savagely as he felt himself pulled toward the chasm. Suddenly he tumbled forward, unable to hold the king's weight. But even then he would not let go. The dog still clawed desperately for footing as both of them dropped over the edge. Randolph stepped wearily down the long staircase at the heart of Care Corwell. Once again, another day drew to a close as he left unfinished the great majority of the tasks he had set for himself that day. True, his duties as captain of the guard occupied him for many hours each day. But more significant was the burden of governing the kingdom in the absence of King Kendrick. He would not have believed the petty bickering causing strife among the populace were he not forced to hear the complaints himself. Ponswain, of course, was no help whatsoever. The Lord enjoyed the bounty of Tristan's cellar and pantry and the hospitality of his keep, but he did little to aid Randolph with the daily chores of office. Instead, Ponswain was more likely to sit brooding in the great hall, alone, or with one of his favorite kitchen maids. The Lord would glower at the crown of the aisles, gleaming where Tristan had left it upon the great mantle, and declare to all and sundry that the real honors belonged to him. Randolph passed beneath the wooden arch into the great hall, and saw Ponswain sitting in his usual position. The Lord sprang to his feet as the captain entered. "'What's the meaning of spying on me like this?' demanded Ponswain. "'Don't be ridiculous, my lord. I'm simply going to the kitchen on my way to check the stables. And by what right do you challenge me?' Randolph had grown tired of Ponswain's constant suspicions and accusations. "'By the word of our liege, who left responsibility for his kingdom entrusted to both you and me.' Angrily, the captain stomped through the hall, his appetite gone. He disliked Lord Ponswain heartily, and the man's every word seemed designed to irritate him further. He hated to place personal prejudice above his professional caution, but a conclusion was inescapable. Lord Ponswain would bear watching. Robin absently stroked the back of the fairy dragon. Her mind dwelled on thoughts of Dareth, despite her attempts to remain alert to the possibility of danger around them. The devastation of the forest weighed heavily on her spirit, and she found it difficult to look at the black terrain. Thus, she strayed easily into reminiscence. She thought of her first meeting with Dareth, when he had just stolen her prince's coin purse, and Tristan had caught the thief after a long chase. She remembered the flashing humor in his black eyes, and the even match between the Kalashite's skills and Tristan's. Though even then, as the two men had formed their friendship, the prince had stood out clearly as the leader. Tristan! How her anger flared whenever she thought of him! She did not blame him for Dareth's death, though it occurred to her that she could. But whenever the picture of Tristan's infidelity came again into her mind, the bitter ache of anger flared brightly within her. Coupled with the rage, and there was no other word for it, came a bleak sense of utter confusion. It seemed that all the things upon which the foundations of her life rested had begun to fall apart around her. Desperately, she sought an explanation for the absence of the goddess, for her deity's silence when the druid prayed. All the possible answers loomed as too frightful for contemplation. Had the goddess perished forever from the earth? Had Robin unknowingly enraged her spiritual mother and thus cut herself off from her comfort and power? And Tristan, had the woman in Care Corwell bewitched him? Or was his love so frail that he could be drawn from Robin by a simple flirtation? 
She desperately hoped that the former explanation represented the truth. But even if it did, she wondered if she would ever be able to forgive him. She whispered a soft prayer, but the words seemed to echo hollowly through the dead woods. Never had she felt so alone, so separated from her goddess. It was as if a great void had opened up, and neither her faith nor the mother's might was great enough to bridge it. With a start, she came back to her surroundings, surprised as Newt jumped to his feet before her. The fairy dragon arched his back like an angry cat and stared around the mare's neck, straight at Tristan. Something woke me up, he complained. Hey, what's the matter with Canthus? Robin saw the dog leap, felt the ground shake as the fisher exploded below the king, and instantly kicked her mare into a gallop. She saw Tristan fall to the ground. Yellow and red clouds of gas burst from the hole, seething through the woods. Her heart rose into her throat as she saw the king, apparently unconscious, slip into the crevasse. Newt buzzed into the air, his gossamer wings invisible with the speed of their flapping. Like an arrow, he darted toward the fissure. A fear like none she had known gripped her as she saw Tristan disappear from sight. The struggling Canthus slipped closer to the edge, and then his forefeet dropped away. She was too far away to reach them, and she could see that even Newt would not get there until they had plummeted to whatever fate awaited them. Glorus Vitali Asatha! Robin cried the words to a desperate spell an enchantment that offered minimal hope of arresting their fall, but it was the only action she could think of that might help. She cast her spell of plant growth. The casting of a druid spell summons the power of the Earth Mother directly, using that might for the working of the magic. But the power for this spell came from Robin's heart, and for a moment she felt dizzy and weakened. Even as her vision blurred, and she swayed in the saddle. She saw the roots and brush at the fringe of the fissure begin to spurt upward. Canthus disappeared from her view as the growing tangle of vegetation sprouted around him. The thicket continuing to grow, writhing constantly along the edge of the fissure. She could not see whether its tendrils extended down the inside of the pit. In another moment, she had reached the gap. Quickly, she leaped to the ground, though she staggered unsteadily, and had to grip the reins of the mare for support. The awful terror she felt held her back, and she could not bring herself to look into the fissure. Newt, appearing and disappearing rapidly in his agitation, buzzed around the fissure. They're here! You saved them! Come on, you guys, get out of there. Hey, Tristan, wake up. Weakly, she stumbled to the lip of the gaping pit, gagging on the stench of the gas that rose from the wound in the earth. Though the tangle created a web-like mass of branches, she slipped among them with the druid's natural ease. Then she saw the king clutched firmly in the grip of the young branches, held motionless against the dirt wall. Panthus was caught in the bushes as well, but the moorhound skirmed his way upward as Robin reached down for the king. Newt continued to buzz overhead until a whiff of gas swirled around him. The dragon turned instantly from green to orange, sneezing loudly. With a sudden bolt, he darted to the side of the pit and landed, coughing and gasping. Tristan's face was blue. Though the gas had thinned out somewhat, Robin suspected that he had breathed it heavily. Had it already killed him? She banished the thought, somewhere finding the energy to heave upward on his limp body. It wouldn't bulge. I've got you, honey. Let's pull. She heard Tavish's voice as she felt the bard grab her waist. But even pulling together, the two could not free the king. 
Horrified, Robin watched Tristan's lips grow black. Glorus dissator ihei, cried the druid, once again summoning a spell. She felt herself grow dizzy, but she forced herself to retain her grip on the king. All around her, she could feel the plant growth recoiling, twisting free and pulling away from her. And from Tristan. The king fell free from the plants, with Robin barely managing to keep a grip on his arms. Then Tavish heaved mightily, and they pulled Tristan's limp form onto the lip of the fissure. Weakly, she pressed her mouth to his, forcing air from her lungs into the king's. She pressed downward against his chest to force out the bad air, then blew inward again. Over and over she repeated the process, with Tavish taking over when the druid collapsed from exhaustion. Desperately, she watched the king's face, begging for a sign of life, but his color remained that awful blue. It, it's the p poison, stammered Yazili Click, slumping mournfully beside the druid. He gets the air, the air, but the poison takes his l life. Robin sat up weakly. Of course, the poison of the gas. Why hadn't she realized that? She leaned over the limp form and pushed Tavish aside. Ban lay, finale. She gasped frantically, pressing her hands firmly to his lips. Once more, she felt the magic flow from her body as she called upon a potent spell of druidic healing. It would work only to relieve the effects of venom. Devoutly, she prayed that the poison was the real menace to Tristan's life. And then the dizziness rose within her again, as once more the power of her spell was drawn directly from her soul. The void between herself and the goddess remained vast, so she could only draw upon her own suddenly depleted reserves of magic. Her vision blurred, but she saw Tristan's eyes flicker open and heard his lungs gasp great, sweet breaths of air before she lost consciousness and slumped motionless across him. Tavish lifted the druid gently and laid her beside the king, checking to see that her heart still beat and her breathing remained regular. Paldo had galloped to the fissure and dismounted. Now he knelt beside Tristan, taking the king's large hand in both of his own. Tristan coughed and gagged, drawing deep and raspy breaths. The halfling's eyes, however, never ceased darting about the woods as he watched for an attack from that quarter at any moment. But the scene remained, for the moment, quiet. A great oval had been ripped in the earth beside them. The bottom lurked in the invisible depths, where seethed a riotous mixture of yellow, green, and orange gases. A powerful odor, sulfurous in nature, with a stinging bite of even more sinister and unnatural substances, rose from the pit and filled the air around them. Tristan sat up, still groggy and his eyes widened with alarm at the sight of Robin's motionless body. She'll be all right, said the bard softly. She used her magic to save you. It seemed to take a lot out of her. I'm getting lightheaded, said Paldo suddenly. Let's get away from this hole. Good idea, said Tavish, lifting Robin easily in her broad arms. Tristan climbed awkwardly to his feet, while Newt and Yazili Click darted into the air, ready to look for a suitable resting place. Paldo, aided by Canthus, gathered the mounts that had drifted away from the noxious site. The cloud drifted toward the fen in the lowlands, observed the bard. Let's make our way upslope. By the time they reached the crest of a low hill beside the trail, Robin had regained enough strength to walk slowly, aided by Tavish. 
they collapsed on the first level patch of ground they could find. And Robin looked at them all with a tentative, fearful gaze. What is it? asked Tristan, reaching for the druid's hand. She let him take it, but she looked past him as she replied. They're gone, she whispered, frightened. The spells I cast, they come to me through prayer. And when I cast, the power of the enchantment is the power of the goddess herself. But the goddess gave me no more power for the spells I cast today. It's as if each was torn from my memory whole. There's nothing left. But can't you pray to the goddess to get them back again? Asked Tristan. I can no longer hear her. I don't know if she speaks or even lives. It's as if we've entered another place or a different plane. One where my goddess has no presence. You must conserve your strength, said Tavish. Use your magic only if it's absolutely necessary. They were all aware, but none mentioned it, of how necessary her magic had already proven that day. I'm ready to go now, the druid announced. We must keep moving. I'll take the lead this time, offered the bard. And me, piped Newt. Yes, and I will bring up the rear, added Paldo. This left Tristan and Robin riding in the center of the group. For a time, the king followed the druid, riding in silence. But when they reached a place where the woods opened into broad clearings, he pushed Avalon gently forward to her side. Tavish told me what you did. He started out awkwardly. I owe you my life. He trailed off, unable to express his gratitude and his love. She turned and for a moment she smiled at him like the maiden he had fallen in love with. Only her eyes, dark and somber, betrayed her maturity and purposefulness. The land of Corwell needs you, she said simply. And what of the druid Robin? asked Tristan, his heart pounding. Does she need me? I need to serve my goddess to the whole of my being. Robin's voice carried firm resolve. That is the most important thing in all the realms to me. A door slammed shut before the king, and he was left shivering in the cold. Hey, you guys, get up here! Newt darted from the trees to hover before them. His tiny mouth split in a toothy grin. You've never seen anything like it before, I'll bet. Come on, hurry! The fairy dragon dashed away, dodging like a hummingbird among the tree trunks. The pair called to Paldo and urged their horses into a run. In moments, they broke from the woods to gaze upon the bleak shore of something the like of which, to be sure, neither of them had ever seen before. It was the size of a small lake, with a smooth surface of glistening black. Tavish says it's a tar pit, though how she knows that, I'm sure I can't tell you. The dragon darted across the flat surface before them, pausing in mid-air to sniff at a bubble. He flew back to them and lighted upon the stuff. No! cried Tavish, too late. The dragon's four feet touched the sticky surface, and though he tried to spring back into the air, he found himself stuck fast. Tristan laughed, in spite of himself, and drew the sword of Simra Q with a flourish. To the rescue, worm! he announced, leaning forward to slip the blade, flat side up, under Newt's belly. He lifted with a smooth motion, and the dragon popped free of the tar. Newt flew off in a huff to rest upon a tree limb and try to clean his sticky paws. There was never anything like this in Mirlock Vale before, observed Robin solemnly. 
Tristan sensed that this was yet another example of the blasphemy that had fallen upon this sacred ground. Suddenly, he heard Canthus bark from the shore of the pit, and he saw the halfling, still mounted, galloping toward the dog. Just then, Yazili Click popped into sight. Over the there is a fur bulg, a fur bulg. A fur bulg, cried Tavish. Now that's more like it. At least there's a monster I can understand. Tristan and Robin ran along the shore of the tar pit, with Tavish close behind. The king still held his sword and Robin her staff. The bard brandished her lute, keeping the borrowed short sword in its scabbard at her waist. In moments, they reached Paldo's side. The halfling stood with an arrow knocked in his short bow, but he didn't shoot. Canthus stood before him, growling at something lying on the very shore of the tar pit. The creature was indeed of the race of the misshapen, hunchbacked giants known as Furbolgs. His black, beady eyes glittered at them over a great bulbous nose, and his face split into a gap-toothed snarl that revealed only a few yellowed crooked teeth. He lunged suddenly at them but fell short, and Tristan saw why the creature's attack had been frustrated. Why, he's stuck in the tar, said the bard in amazement. I've always wanted to see one of these things up close, what an opportunity! Be careful, warned the king. Suddenly, he grabbed Tavish and pulled the bard backward as the furbolg lunged a second time, a bit farther than he had at first. He's shrewd enough to fake us into coming closer. They saw that the furbolg had somehow embedded both feet to mid-calf in the edge of the tar pit. He had managed to fall backward onto solid ground, but his feet were firmly anchored and he could not break free. Instead, he snarled and snapped at them, then jabbered something in his crude, brutish tongue. I feel sorry for the poor thing, said Robin. Tristan, to his great surprise, found himself in full agreement, perhaps only because the furbolg represented a familiar thing. Though an enemy, the furbolg was a natural element of the Vale, the first such they had encountered in this bleak place. He leaned forward to get a closer look at the furbolg's plight, and was rewarded with a swinging club of a fist that would have crushed his skull had he not skipped out of the way. I'd be inclined to help him, he declared ruefully, but I don't think he'll let us. Maybe I can help. In a swift motion, the bard lifted her lute from her shoulder and strummed a pleasant chord. She followed it with a trill of light notes, then several more rich and gentle chords. Tristan saw the furbolg look at her in amazement, and the belligerent look on his face faded to an almost trance-like glaze. The king moved closer, and the creature started to turn toward him. But Tavish strummed vigorously, and the furbolg turned back to the music. We'll have to use one of the horses to get him out, whispered Tristan. He whistled to Avalon. The furbolg turned suddenly at the note of dissonance, but the thing had been pacified again by the time the stallion trotted over. Tristan unwound coils of his long rope, and approached the giant, while Robin lashed the other end to his saddle. Keep playing, Tristan thought, concentrating on the music as he reached around the waist of the monster, and looped the rope as far up on his chest as he could. The furbolg remained entranced by the music, a look of utter placidness on his face, as the king backed away and fastened the other end of the rope to the stallion. We're taking an awful chance, whispered the concerned halfling, a nervous observer of the preparations. What if he gets free and suddenly changes his taste in music? Smiling with more confidence than he left, 
Tristan turned to the stallion. Go, he cried, slapping the steed on the rump. In an instant, Avalon sprang forward. The rope came taut around the furbolg, and the monster gave a thunderous bellow of surprise. Scarcely pausing, the stallion lunged farther, and the giant toppled to the ground. With an additional grunt, Avalon pulled him free of the clutching tar. The monster leaped to his feet with an even louder bellow and turned toward Tavish, the nearest of the companions. The bard smiled broadly and stroked the lute, a softer, slower rhythm than she had played before. The rage fell from the creature's face as the music again held him in thrall. The furbolg cocked his head to the side as if to hear better. When Tavish stepped away from the tar pit, the furbolg followed mutely. What do I do now? asked the bard, slowly growing concerned. And then the horror exploded from the woods. Cameron loped tirelessly along the spore of evil that lay like a broad stripe across the land. He followed it for a day and a night, never resting. A sense of urgency gripped him, as if he knew that here, among all the evil and corruption around him, was the focus for his vengeance. Here was an enemy he could fight. The unicorn came upon a scene of battle, where the beast had attacked a man. Cameron paused in surprise, for the spore of the man was unusual in the dead vale. He saw that the man had been driven to a cliff by the approach of the monster, and that he had suffered a bloody wound as he had climbed away from the danger. Then the unicorn followed the spore once more to where the creature had raced along the base of the cliff to a gap where the slope was more gradual. Here it had bounded easily to the top, though the climb was still precipitous. It was only with great difficulty that Cameron struggled up the same slope. And then he came upon the scene of blood and death. The man had died, and other humans had come. Cameron froze, his nostrils widely dilated as he sniffed at the footsteps of these other humans. His heart quivered with hope, but the scent was so faint. He found the place where they had buried the man, and here his hopes were confirmed, where the one he hoped for had knelt beside the grave and left a strong scent for his nose. The druid had returned. She was in the veil. Eagerly he explored the area, finding with a chill that the great beast had lurked in the woods close by while the humans had buried their dead companion. The unicorn's chill turned to black terror as he saw that the creature had come out of hiding to follow the path of his beloved friend, stalking her and her companions as surely as the cat stalks the mouse. A great sigh arose from the land as the Earth Mother's spirit fled the drained corpse. Bahal leered hungrily over her flesh, and all of nature paused a moment to sense the historic passing. Across the land, raging storms died. Windy skies became still, and the rolling swells of the seas flattened into utter calm. The lands themselves did not look so very different. Crops still thrived, animals bred, and the Fofolk and the Northmen went about their business with scant notice of the change. But to those of keen eye and sensitive soul, the change was apparent. The land had lost a certain luster, a quality of aliveness that was unique to these insignificant isles. Thus ended the long reign of the goddess Earth Mother. Chapter 9 The Trap Hobarth watched the attack on Cod's Cove with rapt fascination once his own part of the mission had been accomplished. 
He had felt the priestess's response to Bahal's command, and he knew that the legions were ready. Now the fat cleric had not to do but enjoy the carnage. Of carnage there was plenty. The ogre corpses lumbered through the town, smashing doors, attacking the few humans who tried to oppose them. Hobarth chortled at the sight of a brawny Northman who lurched from an inn, wielding a massive axe. The warrior bellowed in berserker frenzy, striking the arm from one of the ogre corpses. But another undead stepped in and crushed the man's skull with a blow from a heavy club. The armless one stepped over the body and smashed in the door of the inn, lumbering inside. From the hilltop, the cleric observed other patrons leap from windows or bolt from the back door. He saw the dead of the sea shuffling in the wake of the ogres, seizing fiery brands and flinging them atop the thatched buildings. These dead moved slowly, but occasionally a victim fell into their clutches, such as one woman who hurried back to retrieve her toddling child. The cleric saw the zombies fall upon the pair, seizing the babe and tearing it from the screaming mother's arms. More and more of the monsters joined the slaughter, forming a lurching, frenzied mob that completely buried the doomed humans. The final wave of the attack struck with the most savagery, for though the undead killed unhesitatingly upon command, they did so without emotion. The Sahuagin, coming on the heels of the animated corpses, slayed with relish. Hobarth saw the fishmen search through the rubble for survivors, dragging these unfortunates from concealment. The monsters dispatched them with carefully placed stabs of their tridents or cruel, deliberate slashes with Sahuagin claws. Always the death was lingering and painful. Finally, the pace of battle slackened, and the huge cleric rose from his rocky vantage to lumber down the hill. The undead had shambled inland in pursuit of the fleeing populace, and the Sahuagin were left in control of the town. Before he entered the ruined settlement, Hobarth mumbled a quick spell, one that enabled him to speak to these monsters and be understood. He had no doubt that his message would guarantee him free passage. A trio of Sahuagin spotted him as he stepped between the ruins of two buildings. Hissing, they turned their tridents toward him and advanced. Take me to your mistress, the High Priestess Yasala, commanded the cleric, his voice a booming human command. But the words registered clearly in their dim brains. They paused in surprise, hissing among themselves, clearly taken aback by the appearance of this human who could speak their tongue. We will do as you say, announced one, finally stepping forward. His sibilant speech was clearly understandable by Hobarth. You are wise. The thing led Hobarth to a gory scene at the shore where torn human bodies formed a massive pile. Hundreds of the Sahuagin were gathered around, reveling in a feeding frenzy. Many of them turned and hissed or started toward the cleric, only to be turned away by a command from Hobarth's escort. A huge Sahuagin suddenly reared before him. It bristled with a headdress of sharp spines, its color bright yellow, in contrast to the green of most of its companions. Hobarth sensed immediately that this was Yasala. Greetings in the name of Behal. You have won a mighty victory, he began. You are the human cleric. The creature looked at him with pale eyes devoid of emotion. Suppressing a shudder, he sensed that the high priestess would as soon eat him as speak with him. Only their obeisance to a shared master restrained her. What are the commands of our lord? We are to await his order here. 
he will send us either against the Iron Keep or Care Corwell. When he does, the might of Bahal will be revealed to the humans in all their folly. Yasala's sibilant voice did nothing to quell Hobarth's unease. He felt as though he spoke with a snake. The Sahuagin cleric loomed over him, her sleek body displaying lines of tough, wiry sinew. Her yellow scales glistened, streaked as they were with red human blood. Why are there two targets? The Iron Keep is close by, and sits astride your route from Cresselac to Gwyneth. Corwell is more significant, as it rests upon Gwyneth itself. I know this Iron Keep. Many of the longships rest there, or return there after they cross the sea. It is a good target. The humans there have displeased our god? They are in the way. Hobarth found the concept of the attack difficult to explain. He himself had doubts about assaulting a target not directly useful to the defense of Gwyneth. But his god had commanded the attack. He explained to Ysala the words of Bahal. The humans will then have no place to flee to when we complete the destruction of this island Gwyneth. The hall will claim as his domain the lands in the heart of the isle. You and your king are free to claim the coast. Yasala hissed, which Hobarth understood was an expression of eagerness or perhaps bloodlust. And you will swim with us to Iron Keep? I shall walk my own paths, said the cleric, looking at the water with a shudder. How he hated the sea! But fear not, I shall be there when you arrive. What is fear? asked the high priestess, puzzled. And then she turned back to her bloody feast, and the cleric slipped quietly away. Thorax the owlbear grew more and more angry with the passing of each day. Though it stalked the veil tirelessly, pressing ever outward, away from the dark well, it could find no trace of prey. Like Shantu, Thorax desired blood for the joy of the kill, not for any need for sustenance. But the owlbear lacked the displacer beast's cold, cunning, and shrewd sense of stealth. Thorax was a creature of stupid nature and brute strength. And so the malformed brute lumbered along, it turned its feathered head around on its broad shoulders, looking behind itself like an owl. The owl bear walked sometimes on all four of its massive paws, and other times it walked upright. But it remained always hungry, always seeking prey. Finally, its search was rewarded. A cracking in the dried brush provided the first alarm though Tristan didn't hear it. He stood still, wearily watching the furbolg as the creature gazed blissfully at Tavish and her loot. Canthus, however, whirled with a sharp bark, the first to notice the attacker bursting from the woods. Tristan turned at the sound of alarm, shouting a warning to his companions. Then he raced forward, sword at the ready, prepared to face... What in all the realms is that? He heard Robin's gasp behind him, and Paldo shouted in surprise. But his attention remained riveted on the thing that bore down upon him with frightening speed. The horses shrieked and whinnied in terror, turning to bolt along the shore of the tar pit. At first, he thought it to be a huge bear. Indeed, the broad shape, shaggy coat, and lumbering gait all came from an unmistakably ursine body. But that head! The thing uttered a screeching shriek, like some monstrous bird, and lunged for him with a widespread beak. Its eyes glittered amid a face covered with brown feathers, like the beady orbs of a bloodthirsty hawk. Canthus lunged past him and bit the creature. 
whirling away before the owlish bear could land a return blow. The moorhound dived and ducked, barking and snarling, but the creature continued to advance on the companions with deadly purpose. The king's astonishment slowed his hand a bit, or perhaps he underestimated the tremendous speed of the monster. He slashed his blade at the last minute and felt the steel bite into the thing's shoulder. His sword tingled in his hands, joyously cutting into the obscene flesh. But then a massive paw struck him full on the chest. The silver chain mail absorbed the force of the blow, but he still flew twenty feet through the air before landing in a stunned heap. The sword of Simracu fell, still gleaming some distance away. The monster spun with another screech and leaped toward the king. Suddenly, it turned to the side as Tavish darted forward. She brandished her short sword, awkwardly, as if she wielded a giant fork. Tristan groaned and tried to sit up, fearing desperately for Tavish. But the monster again moved too quickly. It reared onto its hind feet, towering over the bard, and lunged toward her. The furbolg, growling and grunting in his crude tongue, sprinted with amazing agility to the bard's side. The giant bashed one ham-like fist into the monster's snout, momentarily knocking it backward, and Tavish dodged out of the way. The bear returned the blow, and the furbolg fell, kicking a huge foot into the monster's belly, even as he crashed to the ground. The creature dropped to all fours and prepared to spring upon the prone giant. Once again, Canthus closed, sinking his fangs into the owlbear's haunch. The dog sprang away in the split second before the blow that would have crushed his body struck. Shaking his head, his vision still blurred. Tristan sprang to his feet and scrambled to retrieve his sword. Hey, over here, he cried, and the monster turned to regard him with those wickedly gleaming eyes. At the same time, the owl bear swiveled quickly, swiping at something in the air behind him. For a moment, Newt popped into sight, darting at the monster's rear end. But in the next instant, the fairy dragon again disappeared, and the monster turned back toward Tristan. This time, the king was ready. He dropped into a fighting crouch and approached the beast, relieved to see it turn its attention back to him. He noticed several tiny arrows bristling from its shoulders. Obviously, Paldo and Yazili Click had found the range, though the tiny weapons could do little to slow the monster. He fainted a thrust, and the owl bear reared back. Good. It had learned to fear the blade. Then it lunged forward. Tristan stabbed desperately, feeling the sword sink into the creature's massive chest, and then another powerful blow from a paw sent him reeling. The king did not fall but he felt hot streaks of blood flowing down his left arm. Robin watched helplessly. Her staff offered little hope of harming the beast, and Dareth's scimitar remained lashed to her saddle on the fleeing mare. Unlike a sorcerer, the druid knew no spell that would smite the thing with a ball of fire or singeing magical arrow. Suddenly, however, she had an idea. Newt, come here, quickly, she called, and the fairy dragon instantly popped into sight before her. What is it? I was having a great time chewing on his tail. Can I do it some more, please? This is important. Remember those wonderful illusions you showed us when we fought the fur bulgs in the fens? Can you show us some more? Now? Newt disappointed, looked back at the fight. The king was giving ground steadily to the rushes of the beast. I suppose, but 
The battle looks like a lot more fun to me. Not just any illusion. This must be a very special one, she said conspiratorially. Oh, good. That's more like it. The dragon hovered beside Robin as she explained her plan, then giggled in delight as he darted away, ready to work his magic. Tristan, over here. Robin called to the king, whose dance against death grew increasingly desperate. He backed away from the owl bear, dodging another lightning blow, and dashed toward Robin. Now, Newt, she cried, and to Tristan added, "Follow me." The druid sprinted along the shore of the tar pit. Tristan followed, trusting that she had some kind of plan, while Canthus remained behind. Snapping and barking at the monster, Canthus, come! He called, and the dog sprang obediently after him. Tristan stopped, amazed at the sudden appearance of two brawny swordsmen. The fighter seemed to spring from the ground in front of the monster, both heavily armored and carrying great spears. Each wore a headdress of ridiculous yellow feathers. They fell back slowly, an illusion so real that the king could not distinguish them from truth. Neither could the owl bear. One of the fighters appeared to stumble, while the other seemed to turn and run directly away from the monster. The beast crouched, screeched, and sprang, landing on the illusion that had stumbled. The magic dissipated with the monster's touch. Revealing only an expanse of black, sticky tar, all four of the owl bear's feet landed in the stuff as its leap carried it well beyond the pit's edge. Twisting and turning in a desperate effort to break free, it only succeeded in wrapping itself entirely in tar. Squawking in rage, it turned hate-filled eyes upon the companions until finally its screeches drowned in a gag of sticky, deadly goo. The waters of the dark well seethed in a black tumult of rage. Bahal greeted the death of Thorax not with sorrow, but with an explosion of boiling hatred. The god thrashed within his oily medium, cursing his lack of physical form. Bahal desired to smash objects, to strike solid blows, but his watery form denied him that power. As he raged, his will crystallized into actions. The peritons, gliding in eerie silence, flew from throughout the vale to gather at the dark well. His clerics Hobarth and Yasala paused briefly in their own plotting as the stuff of their faith shook from the deep disturbance. Each recoiled before the rage of his deity, and each likewise felt immense relief that the rage was directed elsewhere. Instead, Bahal's rage brought them a command imperious and irresistible: level the iron keep. Bahal's intense anger needed slaying before it would cool, and at that fortress there would certainly be many humans gathered, seeking the imagined safety of its high walls. But those within were not reckoning on the mighty power of the god of murder and his minions. His clerics instantly set to work upon the plan, and then Bahal gave another command: this to his flock of peritons. The monsters had gathered at the well and circled, a great cloud of corruption above the center of their master's power, and they heard his command. Bahal sent them soaring across the vale, silently gliding above the wasteland of death. He ordered them to find those who had slain Thorax and kill them. Their wings scarcely flapped. As the hawk-like bodies sliced gracefully through the air, their ghastly antlered heads stood proudly upright, their eyeless sockets scouring the land. Like the clerics, the peritons hastened to obey the command of Bahal. The starling sailed on into the long dark night. 
Gwen cried herself to sleep on the bow seat, as Cole stayed at the tiller, torn by an agony of doubt. Had he done the right thing? His action in fleeing the massacre at Cods Bay had been too instinctive to question at the time. But now uncertainty writhed within him. The vilest of afflictions that could strike a man of the North was cowardice, and he feared that it was cowardice that had spurred his flight. Rationally, he knew that his presence in the doomed village would have made no difference to the outcome of the fight. The monsters that had swarmed from the sea would have, in all likelihood, dragged the starling under the waves before he even reached shore. But should that have been his only concern? He looked at the maid before him, her tear-streaked face finally peaceful in sleep. Cole had no family in Cod's Cove, but the village had been Gwen's lifelong home. She couldn't know if her parents even lived. Yet they could not have saved them even if they had made it to the village. The thought was only slight consolation. He looked at the wicked dagger he had tucked into his belt, the prize from the fishman that had climbed into their boat. The creature must have been some kind of scout for the army, Cole had decided, since they had seen no more of the monsters near them. He had dumped the body overboard but kept its weapon. They had no food and very little water in the boat, but this did not concern him greatly. The crossing of the Strait of Oman was a voyage he had made many times and required but a single day, or night, as the case may be. By dawn, they would be in sight of Ramshorn, the village on Oman's isle closest to Cod's Cove. There they would recruit, help, and spread the alarm. Certainly the hot-tempered Northmen would flock to the rescue of their kin on Gwyneth. His certainty died as the dawn's light showed more than that he had been true to his course. The village of Ramshorn lay directly before him, visible from far out at sea. The visibility killed his hopes, for the village was marked by a tall, oily column of black smoke. "'What's that?' asked Gwen sleepily, staring before them. Cole hadn't realized that she had awakened. "'Ram's horn. It's been raised as well. The attack is far more broad than I feared. "'What can we do?' she asked anxiously, turning to him. The pleading look in her eyes banished all thoughts of cowardice. Cole had a responsibility, he realized, to keep this woman alive and safe, as safe as they could be on the surface of an ocean teeming with enemies. We can sail to Iron Keep. There will be a gathering of warriors there, I'm certain, and then we'll be safe from this scourge. Dareth always told me that a trap could often be more effective than a weapon, explained Robin. And since I didn't have a weapon that would be of any use against that abomination, I tried to think of a way we could trap it. She stopped speaking suddenly as a shadow fell across her face. Closing her eyes, she turned away from the others. Tristan took her hand gently, understanding her pain. The mention of Dareth had brought his grief to the forefront as well. As a trap... It was well done, very well done, exclaimed Tavish, hastily strumming another chord as the firbolg stirred restlessly. I don't mind telling you that the beast had me a little worried. Worried? Newt scoffed. It was a great fight. I haven't had so much fun since we burned down the firbolg lair. But, but, Tristan, Tavish... They could have been killed, killed. Yazili Click glared at the fairy dragon. Our arrows were helpless against it. But now my magic, that was the best illusion I ever thought of, I'm sure. Who thought of it? The bard grinned mischievously at the dragon. Well, maybe it was Robin's idea. 
but I added the yellow feathers. That was my idea. They sat at rest, finally watching the descent of another inky night. The gray clouds had dropped even lower as the day progressed, and would certainly block out any trace of moonlight or starlight. Robin had discovered a small grotto surrounded with high limestone walls, where they could take shelter from the wind. The companions had climbed across a stretch of low, barren hills to reach the hollow. The walls towered close to them on all sides except for the wide, sloping entrance. A narrow crack split the walls behind them, where a steep, winding gully dropped toward a bleak stretch of swampland. Once again, they dared light no fire to drive back the darkness. They all felt the presence of some sinister, nameless aura in the veil, and they did not want to call attention to themselves. Tristan looked uneasily at the Firbolg, wondering if it had been a mistake to bring him along. During the Darkwalker War, the Firbolgs had been among their most implacable and hated foes. For all his life, he had known them as the natural enemies of humans, dwarves, and the weir. But now there seemed an unspoken bond that had developed between this monster and themselves. Perhaps it was because they all belonged here on the Isles. They were a natural part of this world. As such, they made natural allies in the fight against a supernatural foe. The creature had shuffled along with them for the entire afternoon, occasionally calmed by a trill of the lute. After its courage in the fight against the owlbear, none of them wanted to send it away. You know, speaking of the furball glare, this isn't far from where we first met Newt. "'remarked the king. "'Tristan and Paldo had made a brief reconnaissance of the area before dark. "'The gulch out in back of our shelter drops directly into a swamp, "'and I think it's the fens of the Fallon. "'The Firbolg looked up, blinking his oddly small eyes. "'Fallon?' he grunted. "'And where you found the sword of Simric Hugh. That's what it says in the Song of Karen. Tavish strummed a few chords of the ballad as if to remind them. Tristan nodded. Yes, in the stronghold of the Firbolgs. I wonder what's left of that place, mused Paldo. It was quite a fortress, but then we burned most of it down before we left. The halfling's eye suddenly glinted at a secret memory and he turned his face away from the others to hide his sly smile. "'I'm sure there's quite a mass of ruins remaining,' mused the king. "'After all, most of the place was made out of stone.' "'Fallon!' grunted the Firbolg again, pointing at himself. "'Firbolg!' the bard pointed at the giant. "'Fallon Firbolg!' The creature was obviously pleased with himself. Human, offered the bard, pointing to herself, then Tristan and Robin. Human, verb, bug. He's smarter than I thought. Tavish began to enjoy the lesson. She taught him more words, and he absorbed lute, sword, hand, head, and fist in rapid succession. Tavish. She offered, pointing to herself. Human? No. I mean, yes, but humans, that's all of us. Me, I'm Tavish. Tavish? The giant blinked, and then his face brightened. Tavish, he said, pointing at her and then at himself. Yak. Your yak? That's wonderful. She proceeded to teach him the names of the others, and soon Tristan, Robin, Paldu, and Nut had been formally introduced to their new companion. The Firbolg stumbled on Yazlik, Yusuluk, Yiz Ir, and finally settled on Yuz, much to Nut's amusement and the sprite's discomfiture. 
They chatted idly for a time, trying to avoid the pain lurking very near the surface of their awareness. All of them keenly felt the loss of Dareth. Tristan's own guilt tore ruthlessly at him, though he tried quite unsuccessfully to bury it. The Kalashite was dead, in large part because of Tristan's own stupidity in sending him out of their camp. It was an act performed in anger, resulting in tragedy. All he could offer, and it was very little solace, was a prayer for Dareth's soul and a silent plea for his forgiveness. And he had his own determination to succeed, and by doing so, atone for his mistake. Tavish once again pulled one of her wineskins from her pack, though the king declined the proffered drink. The others took small sips, but the sack remained mostly full. The bard offered to take the first watch and continue the language lesson, so the others retired, each taking a shift in turn. The night, like the previous eve, was pitch black. At least the high walls of the grotto kept the worst of the wind from their camp, but even so, the temperature fell below freezing. None of them slept well. Tristan and Robin spent the night in lonely grief, each mourning the loss of their close friend. For the others, too, the combination of death among them and the universal death around them made for miserable rest. Even so, dawn found them ready to move on again, if only to alleviate the stiffness and chills of a night spent sleeping on a bed of stones. They wasted little energy in conversation, as they wrapped their meager bedrolls and started to load the horses. Tristan, looking nervously around the chill grotto, wondered what new horrors the day could offer. Once again it was Canthus who saw the first sign of attack. With a sharp bark, the hound called their attention to the sky. "'Look out!' cried the king. "'Look to the sky!' His sword came instantly to his hand, as if moved by a will of its own, and he raised it to meet the diving-winged creatures above them. A flock of bird-like forms swirled downward from the clouds, numbering two score or more. Many veered away from the narrow hollow, but several continued to dive right toward the party. They made no sound as they swooped into the attack. What? are those things? wondered Paldo aloud, swiftly knocking and drawing an arrow. One of the creatures swished over Tristan's head, and he thrust at its belly but missed. He stared, amazed at the stag-like head of the creature and its black, cold eye sockets. Its pointed, misshapen antlers appeared deadly, as did the sharp claws on the monster's feet. Paldo loosed an arrow that darted through the wing of one of the creatures. The thing made no sound but settled awkwardly to earth, where Canthus sat upon it with a growl and a flash of white fangs. The two creatures rolled across the ground in a blur of feathers, fur, antlers, claws, and teeth, until finally the moorhound stood with the monster's neck in its mouth. With one final shake, the dog cast the corpse aside. Many of the winged creatures landed at the lip of the little grotto, perching like vultures waiting for the kill. Others swooped in aggressively to the attack. Yazili, Click, and Paldo sent arrows after these intruders, but the missiles whizzed harmlessly past their intended victims. Finally, in order to conserve arrows, they held their fire. Tristan ducked as one monstrous bird flew over his head. Then he slashed savagely upward and sliced off its wing, killing the beast with one quick thrust as it flopped to the ground. Once again, the sword of Simric Hugh sang joyously in his hand. Rock! Yak grunted from somewhere nearby. Yes, rock! Tristan panted too distracted by the fight to pay attention to the furbolg. Rock! Kill! 
Suddenly the giant pitched a stone the size of a man's head at one of the monsters perched on the rim of the grotto. The missile struck the creature in the chest, and it disappeared in a cloud of feathers. Newt buzzed into the air and sank his teeth into the tail feathers of one of the creatures, but the monster twisted and raked at him with its claws. Several more of the bird things swarmed around the little dragon, and Newt disappeared with a shriek. He did not become visible again until he was safely on the ground, watching the battle from a vantage point between Robin's ankles. A shrill whinny of terror jerked Tristan's attention to the horses. Horrified, he saw Paldo's pony pitching and rearing while three of the bird things clung to its back. Their talons tore through the pony's skin, and then another of the monsters landed and drove its ghastly antlers into the poor steed's chest. With a squeal, the little horse fell heavily to the ground, where the beasts attacked with their sharp teeth. The king raced toward the scene with an inarticulate cry of rage. Before he reached the dying pony, he saw one of the creatures tear through the animal's breast with its razor-like teeth. It pulled forth a pulsing, bloody chunk of flesh. The pony's heart. Immediately, the other horses whinnied in terror, rearing and kicking frantically. Avalon sprang high, and a sharp kick of his forelegs knocked one of the monsters from the air. The stallion leaped upon the thing and pounded it to a pulp with his hooves. At the same time, half a dozen of the beasts swarmed around the chestnut mare. In seconds, she joined the pony on the ground, screaming as cruel teeth Claws and antlers tore into her body. Tristan reached the steeds and drove the monsters away with sharp swipes of his sword, but the mare kicked weakly and could not rise. All four of her legs were ripped badly, and one of her eyes had been poked out. Crying in pain, she lay upon the rocks, breathing quickly and heavily. With a sob, Robin stepped forward and cut the mortally wounded horse's throat with a swift strike of her scimitar. They looked around and saw that the entire flock had finally settled to the ground around the rim of their little shelter. Perched in sinister silence, the creatures chose vantage points beyond the range of Yak's rocks or the arrows of the halfling and the sprite. Now they resembled vultures more than hawks, with the hunched and patient appearance of carrion eaters. Their skeletal heads and sharp antlers added a surreal touch to the scene. Why don't they make some noise? Groused Paldo. At least they could screech or something. And why did they stop attacking? Not that I'm complaining, of course. The bard looked up in puzzlement. I suspect because they can't maneuver well in here, suggested the king. The hollow is too small for them to attack from all directions. W what are they? Are they? Corruption. Robin's voice was bitter but certain. They are a living, breathing desecration of life itself, like that bear with the head of an owl. The god that is killing the veil is not content with the mere destruction of life. He must twist and pervert it to his own ends. And then her voice rose to a scream. He must be destroyed! The flock shifted nervously, several monsters flapping their wings or stepping awkwardly to a new perch, but they quickly settled back to their vigil. So they can't maneuver in here. That makes me wonder how we're going to get out. Paldo reflected. The gully you mentioned last night, Robin said to Tristan. Could we get down it? And is it narrow and deep enough to keep these death birds from following us? It's possible, but the horses could never make it. Even Canthus might have a hard time. What about waiting right here until they go away? asked Tavish. That won't work. Robin answered quickly, then told them about her experience with the death bird 
that had waited three days for her to emerge. Can we cross the open ground out the front and fight our way to the woods? The king wondered aloud. The answer was obvious to all of them. Though the confines of the grotto provided them temporary shelter, they would be torn to bits if they gave the flock ample room to attack. The gully began to look like the only solution. Perhaps we can try the descent and get the things to follow us. One of us can wait behind and spook the horses. The steeds might have a chance to get away at least. Tavish offered the only real possibility. Let's try it, agreed the king, trying to ignore the ache in his heart. I'll stay back with the horses. No, let me do that. You lead the way down the gully. Paldo argued hastily, albeit reluctantly. They all knew that the last one down would be in grave danger. Thanks, old friend. But no, I will do this myself. Now get ready to go. Tristan felt some small measure of pride in his role. Perhaps this was a way for him to begin his atonement. The white stallion stood silently, watching them, and Tristan had the eerie feeling that Avalon had understood. He went to his steadfast mount and wrapped his arms around the horse's solid neck leaning sadly into his broad flank. Run for me, boy. Run like you've never run before. You can make it. They unsaddled the mounts and loaded food, water, tinder boxes, and an assortment of supplies into their own packs. Tristan and Tavish each took a length of sturdy rope after they tried and failed to convince Yak to coil the strands around himself. The giant snarled and backed away, and only the soothing strains of Tavish's loot kept the Firbolg from bolting from the camp. After he saw the companions lifting their backpacks, he tried to mimic them, however, and eventually they succeeded in loading a heavy saddlebag onto the Firbolg. The gully is back here. It's more of a narrow chute, really. Tristan led them through a crack in the rock walls to the head of the gully. They saw a narrow, rock-filled slide dropping steeply for several hundred feet. Far below them, the black waters and gaunt trees of the fens of the Fallon stretched into the distance. To the far north, they could barely see Mirlock, covered with a thin haze and lying flat and lifeless in the valley. The one consolation of the route was the steep, high sides of the chute. Its twisting floor would make attack by the flying predators very difficult. I'll lead, Paldo offered. My king, stay back until all of us have gotten a good start. Then scatter the horses and come after us. Good luck, sire. And to you. Tristan stood as Paldo started down the chute, followed by Tavish. The hefty bard immediately lost her footing and started to slide toward Paldo, but Yak reached down with one brawny paw and grabbed her by the collar. Thus steadied, the bard worked her way carefully over the loose rubble with the sure-footed furbolg beside her. Newt and Yaziliklik used their wings, flying slowly down the chute and staying near the ground. Finally, Robin came to the edge of the gully. She looked back at the horses. Do you think they have a chance? Yes, a chance, no more than that. She reached forward as if to embrace him, but hesitated and then placed a hand on his shoulder. Now go, and good luck to you, she whispered, then started down the chute. Already he could hear Paldo and Tavish shouting, trying to attract the death birds. Several of the creatures soared like vultures overhead, observing the party's progress, as Tristan stole back to the horses. He waited while several more of the creatures took to the air. Finally, the whole flock, still silent, took off and circled toward the chute. If the horses had a chance to escape, this was it. Now, 
while the deathbirds couldn't see them. Go, he hissed, slapping the gelding on the rump. The black horse bolted toward the wide entrance to the grotto. You too, off with you. He stared at Avalon but did not strike him. The stallion looked at him quizzically, then suddenly turned. With a kick of his hooves, the great white steed blazed after the gelding. The king raced through the cut and started down the chute, slipping and sliding on the stones in his haste. He ignored the cuts on his hands, desperate to join his companions and lead the death birds away from the horses. Then he looked up and jerked to a horrified stop. The creatures, as a flock, soared over his head back toward the hollow. In moments they drifted out of sight behind the rocky shoulder of the hill, back toward the camp and the courageous steeds. The screaming of the horses followed the companions all the way to the bottom. The fabric of the myriad planes of existence is a material of many parts. When a single panel grows weak, the whole grows weak as well. When a portion tears away, a void is created and chaos reigns. The stuff of the fabric is the stuff of the gods. And now a tear in the fabric began to open in the realms, where the Moonshay Island served as a tiny portion of the whole. The death of the goddess sent a soft ripple through the ether that connects the myriad planes. The gods of chaos greeted the news with delight, the gods of law with concern. The former would try to rip the fabric asunder, the latter to patch it. The gods of neutrality cared little about the opening of the void. They would seek to prevent it from growing, but would not strive to close it. But Bahal, dark god of chaos and evil, the most base of aspects had claimed a place in this void before the other gods could act. Now Bahal tore the fabric wider. Other deities sought to stem the disaster, led by Chanti, benign goddess of health and nature. But the force of Bahal's black evil drove them away. Other gods, led by Tempest, stormy god of war, and favorite of the Northmen of the Moonshays, strove to contain the hurt so that it would not spread to the rest of the realms or the plains beyond. They built and strained, creating barriers of strong magic to cast in the murderous god's path. 